You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and the Theory of Art, Foundations of a New Aesthetics. There are four essays written between 1890 and 1898, and eight lectures held between 1909 and 1921. The translation is by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. From a Notebook, 1888. All thinking seeks spirit in nature. For science, the world of reality is something transitory, a crossing point through which it must pass to reach the essence of things. This essence can only be grasped as idea. That which holds the world together at its innermost core will be revealed only when the human spirit transcends this reality by destroying the husk and penetrating to the seed. We will never again be satisfied by the individual natural event, but only by the law, not by the individual, but only by the universal. Inwardly, the human being creates a world that relates to his spiritual needs that harmonizes with what his spirit demands, that resides within the strict logic for which he strives. Outer nature, as it appears to us directly, will never be able to fulfill this for us. Only the penetrating gaze of the sun-like eye, E-Y-E, sees the spiritual sun that lives and reigns behind the appearances of things. The direct appearance seems robbed of divinity. That is why ages with a predominantly theological tendency could never establish an aesthetic science. Aesthetics can only be the offspring of an age in which the cultivation of art is seen as a noble task in which art becomes the noble daughter of heaven, who must fulfill a divine mission. If we perceive the divine in its full intensity reigning in every single phenomenon of nature, what then can the task of art be? The divine in its most sublime form would have to be recognized as an idea so that the appearance of the particular could also be given its rightful place in the system of our world view. An intuitive spirit sees in the detail the general, in the individual thing the idea, but only because while looking at what is real he sees more in this reality than what the mere senses can see. He looks at the particular phenomenon and grasps the idea because he does not get stuck at the individual event. The artist transforms the individual element, bestowing on it a universal character. He changes it from something that is merely happenstance into a necessity, from something earthly into something divine. The task of the artist is not to give the idea a physical appearance, but rather to allow reality to appear in its ideal light. Significant is not the what, which is derived from reality, but the how which is the province of the creative power of genius. When, 
the individual element appears severed from the fabric of the world and thus able to develop its own free ideal nature, it appears to us to be essentially different than in reality. And although it appears to us in its truth, this truth is illusion from the perspective of the laws of nature. In drama, natural necessity becomes a matter of ethics, because human activity must be deemed historical, not ethical. Beauty is not a microcosm, and if it were, it would not be beautiful. For it is precisely when the individual element surpasses its own characteristics and greatness that beauty arises. We experience this as a perfection, which cannot lift us beyond the world because it is simply self-evident there. End of notebook entry. Next essay entry. Goethe as father of a new aesthetics. Vienna, November 9th, 1888. Author's summary. Introduction to the second edition. This lecture, which here appears in its second edition, was held more than twenty years ago at the Goethe Society of Vienna. The following words are occasioned by this new edition. It has been found that during my time as a writer my views have changed. Where is the law stating that something I wrote twenty years ago must appear today without the need to change a single sentence? And if, especially in my spiritual, scientific, anthroposophical activity, someone were to note a change in my ideas, I would respond that in reviewing this lecture I find the ideas developed in it to be a healthy foundation for anthroposophy. Indeed, I even find that what is essential for a clear grasp of my ideas is specifically the anthroposophical way of thinking. A different way of thinking will hamper a conscious realization of the most important ideas. I have developed what stood behind my worldview twenty years ago in various directions. That is the significant matter at hand, not a change in my worldview. A few remarks which will be added for clarity as an appendage could just as well have been written twenty years ago. The question could now be raised as to whether the content of the lecture is still relevant today with regard to aesthetics. For in the last two decades, various contributions have been made in this field. I do believe that it is even more relevant than it was twenty years ago. In relation to the development of aesthetics, the following grotesque sentence may be risked. The thoughts in this lecture have become even more true than when they first appeared, even though they have not changed at all. Rudolf Steiner, Basel, September 15, 1909 An overwhelming number of papers and essays have appeared in our time with the object of determining Goethe's relationship to the various branches of modern science and contemporary spiritual life. A mere listing of titles would likely amount to an impressive volume. This phenomenon stems from our increasing awareness of the fact that in Goethe we encounter a cultural factor with which we must reckon if we wish to participate in contemporary spiritual life. Ignoring this fact would, in this case, mean a rejection of the foundations of our culture, a stumbling about in the depths, without the will to raise ourselves up to the radiant height from which all the light of our education emanates. Only one who is able to connect at some point with Goethe and his time can achieve clarity about the path our civilization takes, can become conscious of the goals that contemporary humanity must set. Whoever does not find this relationship to the greatest spirit of our age is simply pulled along blindly by contemporaries. All things will appear in a new light 
if we observe them from the perspective that has been refined by this cultural source. As heartening as we may find the aforementioned striving of contemporaries to connect somehow with Goethe, it cannot be said that the manner in which this happens is favorable. All too often we find a lack of the impartiality that is necessary for a full immersion into Goethe's genius before settling into a stance of criticism. Goethe is considered outdated in many areas, only because his full significance is not recognized. We think we have far surpassed Goethe, but on the whole it would be more appropriate to apply his comprehensive principles, his magnificent way of seeing things, to our current, more comprehensive scientific resources and facts. With Goethe it is never a question of whether the results of his research are more or less in agreement with contemporary science, but of how he approached things. His results bear the stamp of his time. That is, they go as far as the scientific methods and experience of his time could reach. But his way of thinking, of formulating the problems, this is a lasting achievement to which we do the greatest disservice by treating it with condescension. And yet it is characteristic of our own age that the productive spiritual power of the genius seems almost meaningless. What else could be expected in an age that scorns any transcendence of physical experience, whether in the sciences or the arts? Mere sensory observation requires nothing more than healthy senses, and therefore genius is completely unnecessary. But true progress in both the sciences and the arts is never achieved through observation of this kind or the slavish imitation of nature. Thousands upon thousands pay no heed to an observation until one person discovers through the same observation an amazing scientific law. No doubt many people observed a swinging church lamp before G Galileo, but this genius had to come along and discover the laws of pendular motion that are of such significance for physics. Quote, Were the eye, E-Y-E, -E, not sun-like, how could we glimpse the light? Close quote, exclaims Goethe. By this he means that only those who can see into the depths of nature have the necessary disposition and the productive strength to see in what exists more than mere outer fact. But we fail to recognize this. We should not confuse the enormous achievements we owe to Goethe's genius with the shortcomings inherent in his research as a consequence of the limited scope of experience in his day. Goethe himself characterized the relationship between his scientific results and the progress of science in a fitting image. He designated these results as pieces of a board game, with which he may have dared to go too far on the board, but from which the plan of the player ought to be recognized. If we take these words to heart, then in the realm of Goethe research the following lofty task arises. The research must always be traced back to Goethe's own tendencies. Whatever he himself provides as result may be taken as a mere example of how he sought to solve his great tasks with limited means. We must attempt to solve them in his spirit, but with greater means at our disposal and on the basis of our richer experiences. In this way it will be possible to fructify all branches of research that interested Goethe. Moreover, these branches of research will all bear a unified character will all be aspects of a great and unified worldview. Purely philological and critical research, which would be foolish to dismiss, must find its continuation in this way. We must master the wealth of thoughts and ideas that exist in Goethe, and taking them as our starting point, 
we must develop them scientifically. My task here is to show how the developed principles can be applied to one of the youngest and most controversial sciences, namely aesthetics. Aesthetics, the science that concerns itself with art and artistic creations, is barely 100 years old. Fully conscious of the desire to inaugurate a new field of science, Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten first appeared in 1750. This is the same time period that saw the efforts of Winkelmann and Lessing to arrive at a thorough judgment on the basic questions of art. Everything that had so far been attempted in this field cannot be deemed even the most elementary beginning to this science. Even the great Aristotle himself, that spiritual giant who had such an authoritative influence on all branches of science, remained unproductive in the field of aesthetics. He excluded the visual arts from the sphere of his considerations, showing thereby that he did not at all possess a concept of art. And furthermore, he knows of no other principle than the imitation of nature, which again shows us that he never grasped the task of the human spirit when it comes to artistic creation. The fact that the science of beauty arose so late is not a coincidence. It was not possible in earlier times for the simple reason that the preconditions were absent. What are these preconditions? The need for art is as old as humanity, but this need could not arise until very late, after humanity had grasped its task. The Greek spirit, which by virtue of its favorable organization, derived satisfaction from the reality that immediately surrounded it, brought forth an epoch of art of the highest significance. But it did so in original naivete without the need to create through art a world that can offer us a satisfaction that cannot be found any other way. Everything the Greek sought he found in reality. Nature abundantly provided everything for which his heart longed, for which his spirit thirsted. His heart never longed for anything that could not be found in the surrounding world. The Greek did not grow beyond nature, and therefore all his needs were satisfied through it. He is indivisibly united in his whole being with nature, which creates in him and knows quite well what to create for him to satisfy his needs. Thus among these naive peoples art merely formed a continuation of life and of the drives within nature. It grew directly out of nature. Art satisfied the same needs as its mother, only to a higher degree. That is why Aristotle knew of no higher artistic principle than the imitation of nature. It was not necessary to reach beyond nature, because the source of all satisfaction was already present in nature. Mere imitation, which to us seems empty and meaningless, was fully sufficient. We have forgotten how to see in pure nature the highest for which our spirit longs. Therefore, mere realism, which offers us that pure, higher reality, could never satisfy us. Such a time had to come. It was a necessity for the attainment of humanity's progressive development toward ever higher levels of perfection. It was possible for the human being to maintain himself entirely within nature as long as he was not conscious of it. The moment that he recognized himself in full clarity, that he perceived within himself a realm at least equal to that of the outer world, at that moment he had to free himself from the fetters of nature. Now he could no longer give himself over to her entirely and let her do with him what she pleased. Let her give rise to his needs and then satisfy them. Now he had to confront her. And in doing so he had, in fact, separated himself from her. He had created a new world within himself. And out of this world streamed his longing. From it came his desires. Whether these desires generated apart from Mother Nature, can be satisfied by her remains, of course, a matter of chance. In any case, the human being is now separated from reality by a deep abyss. 
and he must first establish the harmony that existed earlier in original perfection. Thus there arose the conflict between the ideal and the real, between what is wanted and what is achieved. In short, all that leads the human soul into a veritable spiritual labyrinth. Nature then stands opposite us, devoid of soul, devoid of all that announces itself within us as divine. The immediate consequence is the turning away from all that is nature, the flight from direct reality. That is the very opposite of Greece. Just as Greece found everything in nature, so this worldview finds nothing at all in her. That is the light in which the Christian Middle Ages must appear to us. Just as Greece was unable to recognize the being of art because it could not grasp its transcendence over nature, its creation of a higher nature, in contrast to the immediate reality, so too was the Christian knowledge of the Middle Ages unable to produce a theory of art. For art, after all, could only work with the means offered by nature, and erudition could not grasp how to create, within the profane reality, works that could satisfy the spirits striving for the divine. Here, too, the helplessness of science did not prevent the development of art. Although the former did not know what to make of it, the most beautiful works of Christian art arose. Philosophy, which at that time trailed theology, knew as little about how to evaluate art and cultural development as did the great Greek idealist, the divine Plato. Plato, after all, simply declared the visual arts and drama to be harmful. His concept of the independent mission of art was so meager that he attributed to music some measure of justification only because it promoted bravery in war. It was not possible for the science of aesthetics to arise in a time when spirit and nature were so intimately connected. Nor was it possible in a time when unreconciled polarities confronted each other. Aesthetics could arise only in the time when the human being, freely and independently of the fetters of nature, saw with unclouded clarity that spirit which makes possible a reuniting with nature. It was for good reason that humanity raised itself above the standpoint of ancient Greece. For within the totality of coincidences that comprise the world, we feel ourselves placed into, we can never find the divine, the necessary. After all, we see nothing around us but realities that could just as easily be different. We see nothing but individual things, while our spirit strives for the archetypes. We see nothing but the finite, the transitory, while our spirit strives for the infinite, the permanent, the eternal. If then the human spirit, estranged from nature, is to return to nature, it must return to something other than that totality of coincidences. And Goethe calls this return a return to nature with the entire wealth of the developed spirit, with the cultural height of modern times. Goethe's view does not conform to the fundamental separation between nature and spirit. He wants to see in the world only a great whole, a unitary, developmental chain of beings within which the human being is a member, albeit the highest member. Quote, Nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate further into her. Unasked and unwarned, she takes us into the cycle of her dance and hurries on with us until we tire and fall from her arms. And in the book about Winkelmann, quote, when the healthy nature of the human being works as a whole, when the human being feels himself as a grand, beautiful, worthwhile, and valuable whole, when harmonious comfort grants him a pure, free delight, then the entire world, could it but perceive itself, 
would jubilate upon arriving at its goal and admire the summit of its own becoming and being. Close quote. Herein lies the truly Goethean capacity to go far beyond the immediacy of nature without distancing himself at all from that which constitutes the being of nature. What he finds among many especially talented people is foreign to him, namely, quote, the peculiarity of feeling a kind of shyness in the face of true life, of retreating, of creating one's own world within oneself, and thus of achieving the most excellent accomplishments in relation to the inner life, close quote. Goethe does not flee reality to create an abstract world of thought that has nothing in common with it. No, he penetrates more deeply into reality to discover its unchanging laws in its eternal transformations, in its becoming and movement. He confronts the particular in order to perceive the archetype in it. In this way, the archetypal plant, the archetypal animal, which are nothing other than the idea of the animal and the plant, arose in his spirit. These are not empty generalizations belonging to some gray theory. These are the essential foundations of organisms with a rich concrete content, vivid and full of life. Not vivid for the outer senses, certainly, but for that elevated capacity of observation which Goethe discusses in his article on, quote, the intuitive power of judgment, close quote. Ideas in the Goethean sense are just as objective as the colors and shapes of things, but they are perceptible only for those whose capacity for understanding is organized to that end, just as colors and forms are present for the sighted and not for the blind. If we approach what is objective without a receptive spirit, it will not reveal itself to us. Without the instinctive capacity to perceive ideas, they will remain a field that is closed off to us. It was Schiller who gazed more deeply than anyone else into the structure of Goethe's genius. On August 23, 1794, he enlightened Goethe, about the underlying nature of Goethe's own spirit, with the following words, quote, You gather the entirety of nature to receive illumination concerning the particular. You seek in the totality of its phenomena for the fundamental explanation of the individual element. You stride step by step from the simple organization to the more complex in order finally to construct genetically the most complex of all, the human being, from the materials of the entire edifice of nature. Because you create the human being according to nature, you seek to penetrate into his hidden workings. Herein lies a key for the understanding of Goethe. If we really want to rise up to the archetype of things, to the unchangeable, within the eternally changing, then we ought not to consider what is finished, for this no longer corresponds entirely to the idea it expresses. We must go back to the becoming. We must eavesdrop on nature in its creativity. This is the meaning of Goethe's words in his essay, quote, The Intuitive Power of Judgment, close quote, quote, If in the moral sphere we raise ourselves through belief in God, virtue, and immortality to a higher region and thus approach the first primal being. So in the intellectual sphere it should also be the case that we may make ourselves worthy of spiritual participation in the creations of nature by observing its continual creativity. This remains true even though at first I insisted unconsciously and out of an inner urge on the archetype and the typical. Close quote. Thus the Goethean archetypes are not empty schemes, but rather the driving forces behind the phenomena. This is the, in quotes, higher nature, within nature, which Goethe wants to master. From this we see that a human being of higher cultural standing 
can in no instance come to a standstill before reality as it lies spread out before our senses. What binds the world together in its innermost core will be revealed to the human being only when the human spirit transcends reality, breaks the shell, and penetrates to the kernel. Never again can we find satisfaction in individual events, only in the laws of nature, never again in the single individual, only in the universal. In Goethe this fact arises in the most complete form possible. Where he, too, leaves off is the, with the fact that reality, the single individual element, does not offer satisfaction to the modern spirit. For it is not in it, but beyond it, that we find what we recognize as the highest, what we revere as divine, what we call in science an idea. Whereas, on the one hand, mere experience cannot arrive at the reconciliation of these opposites, because it contains the reality but not the idea, on the other hand, Science cannot achieve this reconciliation because it includes the idea but no longer contains the reality. Between these two, the human being requires a new realm, a realm in which the individual element, not the whole, represents the idea, a realm in which the individual element manifests itself in such a way that the character of what is universal and necessary already lives within it. In reality, however, such a world does not exist. Such a world must first be achieved by human beings. And it is this world that is art, a necessary third realm next to that of the senses and that of reason. Understanding art as this third realm is the task that aesthetics must set for itself. The divine which natural things lack, must be implanted in them by the human being himself, and herein lies the high task that arises for artists. They must, in a manner of speaking, bring God's realm onto the earth. In his book about Winkelmann, Goethe describes this religious task of art, as it may well be called, in the following glorious words, quote, in that the human being is placed upon the pinnacle of nature, he regards himself as yet another complete nature that must in turn bring forth another pinnacle. Therefore he heightens his powers by imbuing himself with all perfections and virtues, calling upon choice, order, harmony, and meaning to raise himself finally to the production of a work of art. This then compares splendidly with his other actions and works. Once it has been created, once it stands before the world in its ideal reality, it has a permanent effect. It brings forth the highest. For in as much as it develops spiritually from the totality of forces, it takes up in itself all that is glorious and worthy of devotion and love. By ensouling the human form, it uplifts the human being beyond himself completes the circle of his life and activity, and deifies him for the present, in which the past and the future are contained. Such were the feelings that gripped those who beheld the Olympian Jupiter, as we can conclude from the descriptions, tidings, and testimonies of the ancients. God had become human in order to raise the human up to God. They beheld the highest dignity and were enthused for the highest beauty. Close quote. Thus the high significance of art for the cultural progress of humanity was recognized, and it is characteristic of the mighty ethos of the German people that it was the first to realize this, characteristic that for the past century all German philosophers have struggled to find the most suitable scientific form for the peculiar way in which spiritual and natural, ideal and real, have melted together in works of art. This, after all, is the task of aesthetics, to comprehend the essence of this inter interpenetration and to work through the individual forms as they present themselves in the various realms of art. 
the problem which we have first broached here, thereby precipitating all the central questions of aesthetics, led to the publication in 1790 of Kant's title Critique of Pure Reason. Its analysis immediately touched Goethe sympathetically. But despite all of the serious work that has been expended on this matter, we have to admit today that we have not achieved a completely satisfying solution to the task of aesthetics. The old master of our aesthetics, the keen thinker and critic Friedrich Theodor Fischer, was convinced to the end of his days that, quote, aesthetics is still in its beginnings, close quote. He thereby admitted that all strivings in this realm, including his own five volumes on aesthetics, denote paths that are more or less false. And indeed, that is the case. This can, if I may here express my own convictions, be traced back to the circumstance that Goethe's fruitful seeds in this realm remain unnoticed because he was considered unscientific. Had one noticed them, One would simply have developed the ideas that arose in Schiller when he considered Goethe's genius and that appeared in his work titled On the Aesthetic Education of Man. These letters, too, are not considered scientific enough by the systematizing aestheticians, and yet they are among the highest achievements ever attained by aesthetics. Schiller builds on Kant. Kant was the philosopher who determined the nature of beauty from many perspectives. He first examines the reason for the pleasure we feel in the presence of beautiful works of art. This particular feeling of pleasure differs from all others. Let us compare it to the feeling of pleasure we feel when concerned with a utilitarian object. This is quite a different kind of pleasure. It is closely connected with our desire for the existence of the object. The desire for something useful disappears when that useful object is no longer present. The pleasure we experience through beauty is different. This pleasure has nothing to do with ownership or the existence of the object. It does not adhere to the object, but only to the idea of the object. That is why Kant calls the pleasure we feel in the presence of beauty something entirely uninfluenced by reality, something, quote, disinterested in pleasure, close quote. But the point of view that would therefore exclude utility from beauty would be false. That occurs only outwardly. And this raises the second explanation for beauty. Quote, it is formed from within, according to a purpose, but does not serve an outer purpose. Close quote. When we perceive some other thing in nature or some other product of human technology, then our intellect comes and demands usefulness and purpose. Nor will our intellect be satisfied before the question, quote, what for, close quote, is answered. In the beautiful, the, in quotes, what for, lies in the thing itself, and the intellect need not go beyond it. From here, Schiller continues. He does so by weaving the idea of freedom into the train of thought in such a way that the highest honor is paid to human nature. To begin with, Schiller sets up the polarity of two ceaselessly assertive human drives. The first is the so-called sense drive, German Stofftrieb, or the desire to keep our senses open to the in-pouring outer world. A wealth of content enters us without our being able to influence its nature. In this case, everything occurs with unconditional necessity. Whatever we perceive is determined from without. We are unfree, subjugated, and must simply obey the command of natural necessity. The second is the form drive, German formtrieb. This is nothing other than reason which brings order and lawfulness into the confusing chaos of sense perceptions. Through its work, systematization joins experience. But here too Schiller finds that we are not free. 
for in this work reason is subjugated by the immutable laws of logic. Nature's necessity rules us in the former case, reason's necessity in the latter. Freedom seeks sanctuary from both. Schiller assigns freedom to the realm of art by invoking the analogy between art and the play of a child. What characterizes the essence of play? Things are taken from reality only to have their relationships altered arbitrarily. In this transformation of reality, the law of logical necessity is not decisive, as it is when, for example, we build a machine and must subject ourselves to the laws of reason. But instead, it is only a subjective need that is served. The one who plays arranges things according to what pleases him. He disregards all manner of constraint. He pays no attention to natural necessity, for he overcomes its constraints by using the materials he is given completely according to whim. Nor does he depend on the need for reason, for whatever order he imposes on things is his own invention. In this way, the one who plays impresses on reality the stamp of his own subjectivity, in turn endowing it with objective validity. The separated activity of the two drives has ended. They have become one, and thus have become free. Nature has become spirit. Spirit has become nature. Thus Schiller, the poet of freedom, sees in art a higher form of human play, and exclaims enthusiastically, quote, The human being is entirely human only while playing, and he plays only when he is human in the full sense of the word. Close quote. Schiller calls the drive underlying art the play drive, German Spieltrieb. It produces in artists' works that, in their sensory existence, already satisfy our reason and whose intellectual content is simultaneously present as sensory existence. And the being of man works at this level in such a way that his physical nature acts spiritually, and his spiritual nature acts physically. Nature is raised to the spirit. Spirit sinks to nature. The former is thus ennobled, while the latter is moved from its invisible heights into the visible world. Certainly the works that thus arise are not entirely true to nature, for in reality spirit and nature never coincide. Therefore, if we compare the works of art with those of nature, they seem to be mere semblance. But they have to be semblance because otherwise they would not be true works of art. With his concept of semblance in this connection, Schiller is unique amongst aestheticians, unsurpassed and unrivaled. This is where further work should have been carried out, where the hitherto one-sided solution to the problem of beauty, which relies heavily on Goethe's observations of art, should have been expanded. Instead, Schelling appears on the scene with a completely erroneous, fundamental view, and instigates an error from which German aesthetics never again recovered. Schelling, like all of modern philosophy, finds the highest task of human striving to be the grasping of the eternal archetypes of things. The spirit strides past the real world and raises itself to the heights where the divine is enthroned. There all truth and beauty are revealed. Only the eternal is true and also beautiful. Therefore, according to Schelling, real beauty can only be seen by one who has raised himself to the highest truth for truth and beauty are one and the same. All sense-perceptible beauty is, after all, merely a weak reflection of the infinite beauty we can never perceive with our senses. We see where this leads. The work of art is not beautiful for its own sake, by being what it is, but because it depicts the idea of beauty. The consequence of this point of view is that the content of art is considered the same as that of science, since both of them are based on eternal truth, which is at the same time beauty. For Schelling, art is merely science that has become objective. What matters is that 
from which our pleasure is derived, namely the expressed idea. The sensory picture is merely the form in which the supra-sensory content is expressed. In this regard, all aestheticians follow Schelling's idealistic direction. I really cannot agree with Edward von Hartmann, the most recent historian and systematizer of aesthetics, that Hegel essentially surpassed Schelling. I mean as regards this issue, for there are many other areas where Hegel towers above him. Indeed, Hegel says, quote, Beauty is the sense-perceptible semblance of the idea. Close quote. Thus, he too admits that what matters for him in art is what he sees in the expressed idea. This becomes even clearer in the following words, quote, The hard shell of nature and the ordinary world make it more difficult for the spirit to penetrate through them to the idea than works of art do. Close quote. Surely, this very clearly says that the goal of art is the same as that of science, namely to penetrate through to the idea. Art merely seeks to make manifest what science brings to expression directly in thought form. Friedrich Theodor Fischer calls beauty, quote, the appearance of the idea, close quote, and thereby equates the content of art with truth. One can object however one wishes. The fact remains that whoever has seen the essence of beauty in the expressed idea can never again separate beauty from truth then it is no longer apparent that art has a task independent of science. By means of thinking and without the obstructive haze of the senses, we then experience in a pure, unclouded form what art offers us. Only by means of sophistry can we ignore, from the perspective of this aesthetic theory, the actually compromising conclusion that allegory, in the visual arts and didactic poetry in the poetic arts are the highest forms of art. This aesthetic theory cannot comprehend the independent significance of art, and thus it has proven itself to be unproductive. Yet we should not go too far, and in consequence abandon all striving for an aesthetic theory free of contradiction. And those who want to have all of aesthetics subsumed by art history do indeed go too far in that direction. This science, if it does not rely on authentic principles, can then be nothing but a gathering place for collected notes about the artists and their works, which will include more or less intelligent remarks. These, however, will be entirely worthless, as they will originate in a random subjective reasoning. On the other hand, by attributing something like a physiology of taste to aesthetics, one has corporealized it. By examining the simplest, most elementary cases in which we experience pleasure and then rising up to ever more complicated cases, one wants to oppose the, quote, aesthetic from above, close quote, with an, quote, aesthetic from below, close quote. This is the path that Fechner pioneered in his introduction to aesthetics. It is truly beyond comprehension that a work such as this could find adherence among a folk that produced someone like Kant. Aesthetics is to originate in a feeling of pleasure, as if every feeling of pleasure were already aesthetic, and as if the aesthetic nature of an experience of pleasure could be distinguished by anything but the object that caused it. All we know is that pleasure is an aesthetic experience when we recognize the object as beautiful, for psychologically, pleasure does not distinguish itself aesthetically from anything else. It is always a matter of recognizing the object. By what means does an object become beautiful? That is the basic question of all aesthetics. By starting from Goethe, we will come closer to the answer than did the, quote, aestheticians from below. Close quote. Merck once characterized Goethe's work with the following words, quote, Your striving, your undeviating goal, is to give poetic form to reality. Others seek to make real the so-called poetic or imaginative, which results in nothing but nonsense. 
close quote. This more or less echoes Goethe's words in the second part of Faust. Quote, consider what, but even more consider how, close quote. This speaks clearly to what is important in art, not the incarnating of the supersensory, but a transformation of the sensory real. Reality ought not to descend to a mere means of expression. No, it ought to remain fully independent, only it must acquire a new form, a form through which it satisfies us. If we lift any particular detail out of its environment and look at it in its detached position, much will become incomprehensible for us. We cannot harmonize it with the concept, the idea, which we must by necessity regard as its foundation. Its creation in reality is not merely the consequence of its own lawfulness, but the adjoining reality directly co-determines it. Only if the thing were able to develop independently and freely, uninfluenced by other things, would it live according to its own idea. This idea at the foundation of the thing, which is, in reality, hindered in its free development, must be taken up by the artist and developed. He must find the point in the object out of which the thing can develop its most perfect form, a form that it could not develop alone in nature. Indeed, nature holds back from fulfilling its full intention in every individual thing. Next to this plant, it creates a second, a third, and so forth. None of them bring the complete idea to life concretely. In one plant, this aspect emerges in another, a different aspect, as circumstances permit. But the artist must return to what appears to him as nature's tendency. That is what Goethe means when he describes his creativity in the words, quote, I did not rest until I found the incisive point from which much can be derived. Close quote. For the artist, the entire outer aspect of his work must bring to expression the entire inner aspect. In nature, the outer falls short of the inner, and it is up to the investigative human spirit to recognize it. Thus, the laws followed by the artist are none other than the eternal laws of nature, but pure and uninfluenced by any limitations. Therefore, what underlies artistic creations is not what is, but what could be, not the real, but the possible. The artist creates according to the same principles as nature, but he treats what is particular according to these principles, whereas, to put it in Goethean terms, Nature does not make anything of the particular. Quote, it, nature, is always building, always destroying. Close quote. Because it does not want to reach perfection through the particular, but through the whole. The content of a work of art is some sort of sensory reality. This is the what. Through the form that he gives to the what, the artist strives to go beyond nature and its tendencies, to fulfill nature's potential, with its laws and means, to a higher degree than nature itself. The object that the artist places before us is more complete than it would be in nature, but it contains no perfection other than what it contains inherently on its own. Beauty consists of the objects reaching beyond itself, albeit on the basis of what is hidden within it. Beauty is therefore not unnatural, and Goethe is justified in saying, quote, Beauty is a manifestation of the secret laws of nature, which, were they not thus revealed, would remain hidden forever. Close quote. Or expressed differently, quote, When nature begins to disclose her revealed secret, we experience an irresistible yearning for its worthiest interpreter, art. Close quote. Just as one can say that beauty is unreal, untrue, mere semblance, because what it represents can be found nowhere in nature to such perfection, 
One can also say beauty is truer than nature, for it represents what nature wants to but cannot be. Goethe says the following about this question of reality in art. Quote, the poet, close quote, we can easily expand Goethe's words to include all of art, quote, is dependent on representation. Representation reaches its highest aspect when it competes with reality, that is, when its depictions are brought to life through the spirit, so that they have meaning for everyone, close quote. Goethe finds that, quote, there is nothing beautiful in nature that has not been motivated as true according to natural law, close quote. And we find the other side of semblance, the surpassing of the being through itself, expressed as Goethe's view in Title Maximus and Reflections, quote, The law of vegetable growth appears in its highest form in the blossom, and the rose would simply be the pinnacle of this appearance. The fruit can never be beautiful, for there the law of vegetable growth recedes back into itself, into mere law. Close quote. Here we have it in full clarity. Beauty occurs where the idea develops and unfolds, where we immediately perceive the law in the outer phenomenon. On the other hand, where the outer phenomenon appears formless and lumpy, because it does not reveal anything of the law underlying the growth of the plant, that is where nature's capacity for beauty reaches its limit. Therefore the same proverb continues, quote, The law that manifests itself in the phenomenon with the greatest freedom according to its own conditions brings forth objective beauty, which must indeed find subjects worthy of grasping it, close quote. In his Conversations with Eckermann, Goethe expresses his view most decisively in the following utterance. Quote, Certainly, the artist must copy nature's details truly and devotedly, only in the higher regions of artistic activity, where a painting actually becomes a painting, does he have free reign and may here even permit himself the use of fictions. Close quote. Goethe thus designates the highest task of art, quote, to give through semblance the illusion of a higher reality. But it would be erroneous to continue making semblance into reality to such an extent that in the end only common reality remained, close quote. Let us now ask ourselves why artistic objects elicit pleasure. Above all, we have to be clear that pleasure, which is satisfied by beautiful objects, is not wanting when compared with the purely intellectual pleasure we experience through the purely spiritual. Whenever the task of art is sought for in the satisfaction of lower pleasures or in mere amusement, it always signifies a decided decadence of art. Therefore, the reason for pleasure in the objects of art will be no different from the joyful elevation we feel in the world of ideas overall, which lifts the entire human being out of and above himself. What then gives us such satisfaction in the world of ideas? Nothing other than the inner heavenly tranquility and completeness that it bears within itself. No contradiction, no dissonance stirs in the thought world that arises in our own inner being, because the world is infinite. Everything that makes this picture complete is inherent in it. This innate completeness of the world of thought is the reason for our being uplifted when in its presence. If beauty is to offer us a similar elevation, then it has to be fashioned according to the pattern of the idea. And this is something quite different from what the German idealizing aestheticians want. Instead of being the, quote, idea in the form of the sensory appearance, close quote, it is quite the contrary, the, quote, sensory appearance in the form of the idea, close quote. The content of beauty, which always consists of the same fundamental substance, is always something real, something absolutely real, 
and the form of its appearance is what is ideal. We see that the truth is just the opposite of what the German aesthetic says it is. For this aesthetic simply turned things upside down. Beauty is not the divine in a sensory real garment. No, it is the sensory real in a divine garment. The artist does not bring the divine to earth by letting it flow into the world, but by raising the world up to the sphere of the divine. Beauty is semblance because it conjures up before our senses a reality that as such represents an ideal world. Consider what, but even more, consider how. For in the how lies what is important. The what remains in the sense world, but the how of the occurrence becomes something ideal. Wherever this ideal manifestation in the sense world best appears, there too will the dignity of art appear the most. About this, Goethe says, quote, The dignity of art appears perhaps most eminently in music, because it has no substance that must be accounted for. It is entirely form and content, and it exalts and ennobles everything it expresses. Close quote. But the aesthetic theory, based on the definition, quote, Beauty is a sensory reality that appears as though it were an idea, Close quote, does not yet exist. Such an aesthetic theory must still be created. It can absolutely be designated as the quote, aesthetic theory of Goethe's worldview. Close quote. And that is the aesthetic theory of the future. Even Edward von Hartmann, one of the most recent revisers of this aesthetic, who created a truly exceptional work in his title Philosophy of the Beautiful, pays homage to the old error that the content of beauty is the idea. He correctly says that the fundamental concept from which any science of beauty must stem is the concept of the aesthetic semblance. True, but is the semblance of the ideal world as such ever to be considered as semblance? The idea, after all, is the highest truth, Whenever it appears, it appears as the highest truth and not as semblance. But it is truly a semblance when what is natural, individual, appears in the clothing of the eternal and imperishable, fitted with the character of the idea, for reality falls short of this. Taken in this sense, the artist appears to us as the continuator of the world spirit. The former continues with creation there where the latter relinquishes it. The artist appears to us as intimately related to the world spirit, and art appears as the continuation of natural processes. In that way, the artist raises himself up above the common and real aspects of life and raises us up to his level when we deepen our relationship to his work. He does not create for the finite world, but grows beyond it. In his poem, titled The Artist's Apotheosis, Goethe allows his point of view to be uttered by the muse, who addresses these words to the artist. Quote, so doth the hero mightily inspire his equals through the chain of centuries. The heights a noble spirit can attain may not be mastered in life's narrow span. Hence, also, after death, his soul continues, not less creative now than when he lived. The noble deed, the beautiful idea, strives deathless on, as mortally it strove. So thou, the poet, too, livest through unmeasured time, in fields of immortality sublime. Close quote. In this poem, Goethe's thoughts on what I may call the cosmic mission of the artist are brought aptly to expression. Who else besides Goethe ever grasped art so profoundly? Who else ever knew to honor art with such dignity? Quote, the high works of art, brought forth by humans according to true and natural laws, are also the highest works of nature. 
everything arbitrary and imagined disintegrates. There is necessity. There is God. Close quote. So saying, he surely expresses sufficiently the utter depth of his views. An aesthetic theory, in accordance with his spirit, can surely not be a bad thing. And this will no doubt also be the case for many other fields of our modern sciences. When Walter von Goethe, the poet's last heir, died on April 15, 1885, and the treasures of the Goethe house became accessible to the nation. There were probably many who shrugged at the zeal with which the scholars scrutinized the tiniest detail of Goethe's estate, handling it as a relic, which, as far as research was concerned, was not to be disdained. But Goethe's genius is inexhaustible and cannot be taken in with a single glance. We can only come closer to it by approaching it from various perspectives. Even details that seem worthless, when taken individually, gain in meaning when we consider them in relation to the comprehensive worldview of the poet. His being, his tendencies, from which everything in him springs, and which denote a high point for humanity, will appear before our souls only if we survey the full riches of his utterances. Only when this tendency becomes the common property of all those who strive spiritually, when it becomes a general belief that we must not only understand Goethe's worldview, but that we must also live in it as it lives in us, only then will Goethe have fulfilled his mission. This worldview must become a sign for all members of the German people, and far beyond, in which they encounter and recognize each other in a common striving. That's the end of the lecture. I'm going to add these uh, comments from page 4F. Aesthetics as an independent science is meant here. Of course, one can find expositions by leading thinkers of earlier times about the arts. But an historian of aesthetics could discuss all of this only in a manner appropriate to the discussion of the philosophical striving of humanity before the actual beginning of philosophy which starts in Greece with Thales. Page 7 and 8 It might be noticed that in these descriptions the following is said, thinking, in the Middle Ages finds nothing at all in nature. In opposition one could mention the great thinkers and mystics of the Middle Ages. But such an objection rests on a complete misunderstanding. What is said here is not that thinking in the Middle Ages would not have been able to construct concepts about the meaning of perception and so forth, but only that at that time the human spirit was turned toward the spirit as such, in its archetypal form, and felt no inclination to come to terms with any detailed facts of nature. Page 15 Schelling's, quote, mistaken fundamental perspective, close quote, does not refer to a raising of the spirit, quote, to the heights where the divine rules, close quote, but rather to the way Schelling applies this to the observation of art. This must be underscored. So that what is said here in opposition to Schelling does not get confused with the many contemporary critics opposing Schelling and philosophical idealism in general. One can raise Schelling to a very high stature, as the author of this treatise does, and nevertheless have many objections to individual details in his achievements. Pages 17FF The sensory reality of art is transfigured when it appears as if it were spirit. In this respect, creating art is not the imitation of something already in existence, but springing from the human soul, a continuation of the world process. Mere imitation of nature creates just as little that is new as does pictorializing the already present spirit. A strong artist is not one who impresses the viewer with a faithful rendering of reality, but one who compels the viewer to accompany him when his creativity carries on the world process. And that's the complete end of that lecture. 
You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art. And this is the second part. Really, it's an essay. The first part was a lecture. Uh, This is uh, entitled On the Comical and Its Relationship to Art and Life. It's an essay from the Rudolf Steiner Estate from 1890 to 91. And again, the translation is by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. Hardly anything relating to the fundamental idea of aesthetics has suffered from the erroneous requirements of the German science of beauty as much as that of the, in quotes, comical. If, as the German aestheticians did, one explains beauty as the idea, the divine, that appears as sense-perceptible image, then the concepts about the comical offer insuperable difficulties. For in the presence of this requirement, we have to distinguish between two things in the work of art, in the beautiful object. First, the sense-perceptible picture, the material product made of marble, color, tone, word, and so forth. Second, the idea made visible through this picture. Only three situations can occur. Number one, the idea and the visible image can be congruent, so that the idea is not too high, too spiritual, too preeminent to be represented by this picture. And similarly, the picture worthy and meaningful can be commensurate to the idea. In this case, idea and observation, are in complete harmony. Neither exceeds the other, and each is commensurate to the other. Nowhere do we feel a going beyond or a lagging behind. According to the German aestheticians, when this happens, it is a matter of the, quote, simply beautiful, or beauty as such, close quote. Number two. It is possible that the idea is more meaningful, appears larger than and exceeds the observation. Going beyond it so that the appearance seems too meaningless, small and paltry, to fully grasp the divine, the idea. The vessel is then not large enough to contain the content, the idea. Whereas in relation to the, in quotes, simply beautiful, we experience satisfaction about the harmony between the divine ideal and the earthly real. Here we must stand in awe before the greatness of the idea, which seems so enormous that we cannot find a suitable picture. In this case we are dealing with the sublime. Number three. Now, the opposite case is possible, namely that the picture, the observation, appears as bigger, more meaningful, greater than the idea. Whereas in the second case the idea disturbs the harmony with its greatness, here the disharmony is caused by the predominance of the sense-perceptible picture. The latter pushes itself forward, rears up against the idea, rages against the divine. Therefore, one can find only what is ugly here. If one now also considers that tragedy is only a special case of the sublime, then the four concepts, beauty, sublimity, tragedy, ugliness, exhaust the aesthetic inventory, and there is no room for the comical. For it is easily recognized that a fourth case, in addition to the three cited, is not possible. The matter is completely different on the basis of my established idea of beauty, quote, Goethe as father of a new aesthetics, close quote, namely, that art can never have the task of representing the idea, for this is the task of science. 
If the basic thoughts of German aesthetic theory were correct, then as far as content were concerned, there would be absolutely no difference between science and art. The latter would merely have to represent in visible form what the former expresses through words, thoughts. This simple consideration demonstrates that art must have an entirely different task. And it is precisely the opposite of the task of science. If science is to represent the divine in the form of immediate thinking, as it hovers above what is sense-perceptible in a purely ideal form, then art must raise the sense-perceptible, visible, pictorial up to the sphere of the divine. When we face nature or reality directly, we find them to be neither divine nor ungodly, neither filled with ideas nor empty of ideas. Instead, we find them to be indifferent to the divine or the idea. The thinker peers through this sheath of indifference and sees the idea in the form of thought. But to achieve this purpose, the thinker must skip over the immediate reality, must see through and beyond it. Whoever stops at the bare reality cannot arrive at the idea. The artist approaches reality differently. He does not step beyond reality, but accepts it lovingly. Indeed, he lives and breathes in the sense world, in matter, in reality. What he presents are the objects of immediate nature, of real existence. In the content, the what, of the creations of art, we meet nothing that we could not also meet in nature. The artist changes only the form, the how. He represents objects of reality, but differently than how we find them in the world. He represents them as though they were necessarily as lawful and divine as the idea. With respect to content, art is concerned with what is sense perceptible. With respect to form, it is concerned with the ideal. If science represents the idea in content and form, and nature also represents the sense perceptible in form and content, then a new realm appears in art, the realm of the sense perceptible in the garment of the divine. If someone now declares that it is also possible to represent the divine in the garment of the sense perceptible, This can be refuted by pointing out that no one can have any interest in such a task. For it is possible to have the wish to raise what is lower, of less value, into the realm of what is loftier and of more value, but not the contrary. The longing to deify comes from the very lack of satisfaction derived from reality in its original form. Why, then, would one want to change the divine, which in and of itself grants the greatest satisfaction into a different form? The realm of the non-ideal sensory is reality. The realm of the non-sensory ideal is science. And the realm of the sensory ideal is art. We encounter the first realm when we regard our surroundings with healthy senses. We encounter the second realm when we immerse ourselves in the sphere of our thinking. The third we find nowhere as complete. We must create it ourselves. If the realm of nature consists of sense-perceptible reality and science consists of what is purely spiritual, then the realm of art consists of no reality at all. That is why one calls the sphere of artistic production the realm of semblance. Aesthetic semblance is the sensory element spiritualized by the creative human spirit. Here we must digress into and examine the realm of subjectivity, from which the fundamental tone of personal longing for art and the enjoyment of art derive. All higher striving of the human being is striving for freedom, free to prevail 
over the urges of nature, free to prevail over the laws of the sense perceptible, free to prevail over passions and human institutions. That is the path and goal of the better human being. The spirit is freed when it is less and less subject to what nature demands and increasingly follows what the spirit has recognized as idea. Freedom is the dominion of spirit over nature, of the idea over reality. Whatever I accomplish according to the laws of nature, I must accomplish by necessity, just as a raindrop must fall to earth in accordance with an unalterable law. If I act only in accordance with such natural drives, I am not a true self, not a free personality. For then I do not impel myself, but am impelled. I do not want, but rather must. But the more I kindle the light of the Spirit in myself, the freer I become. Only now can I say, it is I who acts, who accomplishes something. At the same time I experience the certainty of knowing what light it is that I follow and of seeing in pure transparent form in the spirit the object of my action. I follow because of the recognized object, not because of my individual will. Such action is utterly selfless, even though it arises first from the self. For it is accomplished by the self, but not for its own sake. Such an action is a deed of love, that arises out of the self's complete devotion to the object. Therefore, when understood most profoundly, only deeds of love are truly free deeds. The artist's creations are now, among other things, such deeds of love, for he seeks to overcome sensory reality by spiritualizing it. He wants to conjure before our senses a work of art which in all its sense perceptibility is not permeated by natural laws, but by spiritual laws. Whatever part of the object is merely natural is to be stripped away, overcome, and so placed as if it were divine. Art is a continual process of emancipation for the human spirit, and at the same time it teaches humanity to act out of love. Whoever is able to see into the depths of a truly great work of art will feel the sublime draw upward, which, for the duration of our contemplation, allows us to truly forget space and time and our own personality and lose ourselves completely in the perceived object. Only someone who knows full, pure, and unclouded love will fully understand such a self-forgetting beholding. Whoever does not know what true love is will indeed also be distanced from true art. If we must now assume that in a work of art the human spirit spiritualizes substance, then the genre to which the artwork belongs will depend on the spiritual faculties used in the process of its creation. We must keep in mind that what our spirit attains last is first and highest in the world. The ideal unity, the archetypal principle of things, certainly precedes all things in the world. But we, in our spiritual striving, attain this archetypal principle last. What confronts us first in the world is the unending plurality of sense-perceptible things, which, in truth, are the last result of the archetypal principle. The senses grasp the plurality. The intellect orders and compares it and thereby creates concepts. And reason then perceives the inner unity in this manifoldness. Sense perception, the intellect, and reason are, however, three faculties through which we grasp the world. Sensory impressions bring us nature without spirit. Through the intellect we get the plurality of concepts, 
but through reason we attain the divine idea that reigns above all. If we now proceed a step further on the basis of our explanation of beauty, then we must ask ourselves, in what way, given the conditions of the three faculties described above, can the sense-perceptible substance be transformed by the artist? It is clear above all that the senses can carry out no transformation whatsoever, for it is their task to grasp reality as faithfully and as unchanged as possible. The intellect which forms concepts from the individual things is already concerned with spiritual matters. Although it still deals with plurality, this is raised out of the sense-perceptible realm. Therefore, it is indeed possible for the intellect to spiritualize nature. This hardly needs to be mentioned with regard to reason, which grasps the essence of all that is spiritual. The immediate consequence of this is, the artist can transform the immediate reality in such a way that it appears in a form that is permeated by either the intellect or reason itself. Therefore, art deals with the following. First, works that regarding their content are in accordance with reality and regarding their form are in accordance with the ordering of things through the intellect. Second, works that in their content are in accordance with real life but in their form are in accordance with the ordering and unity of the world through reason. When the artist following the direction of reason transforms reality, his works fill us with such a high degree of satisfaction because he places things before us created by his own hand as if they flowed directly out of the archetypal principle itself. The artist brings us closer to the spirit of the world through the divine unity that shines through his work. That is why Goethe, when he saw the Greek works of art, exclaimed, quote, There is necessity. There is God. It is as if these eternal things had been conjured forth by creative nature herself. Close quote. Thus we perceive in the aesthetic semblance that works of art convey no contradiction with the depths of reality, but only with its surface. Indeed, art presents us with a higher reality. What happens, however, when the artist allows not reason but the intellect to rule his transformation of reality? The intellect is the intermediary between the sense-perceptible and reason. The artist therefore distances himself from the former and does not reach the latter. He no longer possesses the superficial truth that lies in the simple copy of sense-perceptible reality, and yet at the same time he does not yet possess the truth that lies in the depths of reason. The concept that reason devises for individual things is altogether the most unreal element in the world. For in the world order, there is no such thing as an individual thing by itself. Everything is necessarily grounded in the connection and flow of things. Whoever does not have the great whole in view and measures only the individual thing can never recognize the truth. I can come up with an understandable concept of the individual thing. Truth is not part of this concept as long as the light of reason does not illuminate it. If I form two concepts, these may exist in the depths of the world order with inner unity. But the intellect possesses only the individual concepts that need not correlate with one another, but simply go around side by side. Now the sense-perceptible things that the human spirit transforms, as if they were permeated by intellect, will thereby stand in glaring contradiction to every form of reality. In the intellect itself, the unconnectedness of its concepts is of course not apparent, because it allows them to remain separate. But when these concepts, in their inner contradiction, appear side by side in an object, 
then this contradiction emerges before our eyes. I can intellectually form a concept of the spirit of human being. I picture this spirit as being exalted, great. At the same time, I also form a concept of this person's outer appearance, which is small, inconspicuous, clumsy, perhaps awkward. I can think both of these concepts side by side quite well. But when united they confront me corporeally in a person on the stage, then I become aware of how they contradict what is possible according to the laws of nature. How large I picture the head of a human being to be is completely inconsequential as long as I do not go beyond the head. But if I put together a large head and a small body and present this coexistence in a real image, then I become aware of how it contradicts what is possible. Becoming aware of such a contradiction between a created object and its inner possibilities gives rise in us to the feeling of the comical. The comical is thus a sense-perceptible reality in the form of an intellectual contradiction. The what is the sensory element. The how is the intellect with its content that is not rooted in the nature of the whole. Wherever we investigate something comical, we discover that what the creative human being makes of his material contradicts the deeper inner nature and fundamental lawfulness of existence. And whoever is able to see through this contradiction experiences it as comical. The release experienced by laughing at a comical object is grounded in the fact that the human being who perceives the contradiction feels himself to be above the object. He believes he understands more about the thing than is revealed by its appearance in front of him. Whoever does not see through the contradiction also does not experience the effect of the comical. Therefore, one and the same object can have a comical effect on one person and not on another. Whoever does not grasp the contradiction also fails to grasp the comedy. Thus it can happen that the perception of such a contradiction confuses us and puts us in a hazy mood. Then we view the situation differently. We no longer look at the intellectual contradiction, but rather at the disharmony in which the specific stands in relationship to the whole. But this indeed has a basis in a rational view, and here comedy ceases. This is namely the case when we perceive something disjointed in nature itself, for example something misshaped or stunted. Here we no longer grasp the specific aspect intellectually, but rather behold a contrast between what has taken shape and what could have and should have taken shape. And this leads us deeper than to a mere view of the intellectual element. This is why there is actually very little that is purely comical in nature itself. The comical is mainly a human creation. In the representation of the comical, the human being can even have the direct goal of attaining, through the pictorial, the visible, what the demonstration of the purely contradictory concept cannot attain, namely to lead to the knowledge of the contradiction. What does not make the necessary impression in thought form can do so through the visible representation. Irony and comical satire have this goal. The parody and the travesty also desire nothing other than to make the paradox of something appear ridiculous by placing it beside its opposite. It lies in the nature of comedy that it enjoys a far wider circle of appreciation than other art forms. For here, one need only grasp the contradictory specifics with the intellect. The perception of the contradiction itself is given through the picture, the representation. One need not rise here to a rational view. Furthermore, it lies in the essence of comedy that it primarily serves to demonstrate human foolishness. Foolishness indeed consists in holding the erroneous, the contradictory, 
to be real. If one were to show the fool his own delusions in an outer sense perceptible representation, then he might perhaps be more easily convinced of his foolishness than he otherwise would be. A serious artist who does not create out of the whole, out of fullness, but pieces his work together out of the individual parts, can easily create something comical involuntarily. Likewise, we show our fellow human beings a comical object when we carry out actions in which nothing but the lived contradiction becomes glaringly obvious to the observer. The effect of this comical always depends, of course, on how high above the comical object the viewer stands. In other words, the extent to which the viewer is capable of grasping the contradiction in its full depth. For example, a wise person will receive a comical impression when he observes how in life so many people value and praise things that do not appear to be at all valuable or worthy of praise. From what has been said above, it follows that he will only dwell on the impression of the comical as long as he dwells with his intellect on the observation of the contradiction. If he penetrates more deeply and considers the amount of energy that humanity expends in the pursuit of empty nothings, then he must, of course, view the situation more seriously. The fool may, on the other hand, receive a comical impression from something that the wise person cannot laugh about at all. When a fool observes something only according to its external aspect and does not see into its depths, then he can indeed laugh about the contradictory nature of what appears on the surface. The actions of gifted individuals are often laughed at precisely because they are not understood. And yet a contradiction is seen between their actions and what is considered normal. Whoever has a sense for detecting the contradictory element in life, for linking the contradictions together, and for bringing things together artificially by means of the intellect, will be particularly suited to the comical. The joke is nothing other than the play of the intellect which seeks out remotely related things that nonetheless bear a certain similarity to one another and through juxtaposition presents them as a manifest contradiction. The comical effect also depends on the degree to which the contradiction outweighs the always present, if slight, agreement between the elements. The completely and utterly strange is excluded from the realm of comedy. We can say, comedy corresponds to the intellect, but it contradicts the sense perceptible as well as reason. Whoever perceives the contradiction, but mistakes the intellect for reason, and instead of laughing is troubled by the disharmony, such a person has no sense for comedy. He will see everywhere only contradictions and hold them to be the, quote, one and only, close quote, aspect of the world. This leads to the mood of soul of the melancholic. Conversely, whoever is convinced that behind the intellect reigns reason, behind the contradiction reigns the inner, higher unity, such a person can laugh with ease at the disharmony. Indeed, he can even advance to the view that wherever there is contradiction, only the intellect is at play. If one contemplates it more deeply with the faculty of reason, one always arrives at harmony. Such a person lives in the belief that a contradiction is always superficial and never deep. He, therefore, always takes it lightly as something that frees life from uniformity and sameness, but that disappears as soon as one penetrates more deeply. This person laughs about the contradictions and is serious in relation to the divine harmonies of things. We find in this person the fundamental mood of humor. A third case is possible. One can have a capacity for perceiving contradiction, but none for perceiving unity, and ideality. Such a person can indeed understand what is erroneous, small, irrational, but this understanding is not supported 
by a sense for the depths. This person can indeed laugh, but he cannot be truly serious and devoted. That is the fundamental mood of frivolity. The melancholic has indeed the need for the deep unity, but he does not have the spiritual strength to grasp this unity. Therefore he lacks the sense that would allow him to laugh about erroneous things. What he should take seriously he lacks, therefore. He takes seriously what cannot be counted as serious. The humorist has no trouble laughing about something erroneous, for he knows that this error does not lie in the depths but on the surface, and he has a sense for the things that rest in the depths of world existence. The frivolous person has only a sense for the superficial, but he also only has need of the superficial. He does not know the depths, nor does he wish to know them. He lives on the surface. We have thus concluded our exploration of this subject. We have demonstrated the idea of the comical as a form of aesthetic appearance, as well as characterized the position that this idea occupies in life. The comical is not merely an arbitrary creation of the human being. It is the way in which one ought to view and present the many contradictory aspects of the external side of life. The End of Part 2 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art. This is the third section, an essay, translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. Essay is given on, was uh, written on 1898. Before me lies a book that awakens lovely memories. Robert Fisher, son of the famous aesthetician Friedrich Theodor Fisher, has begun publishing his father's work. He calls the book, which he compiled with great effort and care, from the literary estate of the deceased titled Beauty and Art. As I read the book, all of the ideas I once developed about the nature of the arts arise in me again. In quotes, once, refers to the period of time some eighteen to twenty years ago. At that time, people my age gleaned explanations about the nature of the arts in the works on aesthetics by Fischer, Weisse, Carrier, Schassler, Lotze, and Zimmermann. These men came from the realm of philosophy, which dominated the development of the first half of our century. Some of them leaned on Hegel, the rest on Herbart. For these men, art was a matter of philosophy. Goethe, Schiller, and Jean-Paul, in their own way, also had their ideas about the nature of art. But they began with art itself. They expressed what the human being is compelled to think when he allows art to work on him. Art itself gave birth to their conce concepts about art. Fischer, Carrier, Weisse, Zimmermann and Schassler did not, at first, start directly with living nature. They contemplated the entirety of phenomena in the world. Artistic productions, too, were part of these world phenomena. Just as they investigated the nature of light, of warmth, and of the evolution of animals, so too did they investigate the nature of art. Their points of departure were those of scientific men, not artistically sensitive souls. Of course, I do not mean to suggest that a man like Friedrich Theodor Fischer lacked artistic sensitivity in the highest and purest sense of the word. On the contrary, his relationship to art is as lively and personal as can be. But when he speaks about art, he speaks as a philosopher. For Fischer, the world was a manifestation of the divine spirit. Therefore, representing the divine spirit in marble, in lines and colors, or in words, is for him art. How does the artist manifest the divine spiritual? 
in sense-perceptible substance? This was Fisher's basic question. An elevated, mature philosophical schooling is the basis of all his expositions. The language he speaks is understood by few today. It could only be understood by those whose education included the philosophical thoughts of Schelling and Hegel. Only such people could be interested in the questions Fisher considered, in the thoughts he communicated. Today very few can read a book by Fisher as his contemporaries read it. The content of the book does not address people of the present time. For Fisher, art was ultimately an impersonal matter. It belonged to the tasks given to the human being by higher powers. True, Fisher did not believe in a personal God, but he believed in a God, a fundamental spiritual essence that comes to life in nature, in history, in art. This fundamental essence stands above the human being. The best among us relinquished this belief. For them the spirit is not independent. For them the spirit exists only in so far as nature has the capacity to bring forth from itself the spiritual. The most elevated spirit is brought forth, according to them, by the human being who gives birth to it out of his own nature. People of today believe what is natural exists within the human being, and what is spiritual is engendered by the human being. Fisher considers the artist to be a human being filled with the divine spirit, which he then manifests in his works of art. For people of today, the artist is someone who has the desire to control things forcefully and to imprint his personality onto them. They do not believe that works of art ought to embody spirit. Instead, they want to create things according to their own ideas, their own fantasy. Fisher says, The sculptor shapes marble into a human form that does not correspond to any actual human being. For the human being carries within himself unconsciously the idea of humanity as a whole, the archetypal image of the human being. And this is what he wants to embody. This archetype is the divine in the human being. Modern people know nothing of such an archetype. All they know is that a form appears before their soul when they consider the human being, and that they want to give this form reality. Next to the natural world, they want to bring forth a world of art that enters into their temperament, their fantasy. This is a world determined by the human being, not a world sprung from divine spirit. Today, people no longer understand when one speaks of art as a realization of the divine. They can only grasp that the human being has the desire to form things according to his temperament, according to his inspiration. Contemporaries want to speak about art as human. They do not want to enter into the religious undercurrent in Fisher's commentaries. The end of part three. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art, translated by Dorit Winter and Clifford Benno. The next two sections I'm going to read together, there are two essays. Uh, This is the first essay, Count Leo Tolstoy, What is Art? from 1898. Count Leo Tolstoy has published an article entitled What is Art? Since becoming a preacher of morality, the Russian novelist has destroyed the sympathies of a large contingent of his former admirers. The content of his moral preaching in no way rises to the heights of his artistic works. The content of his moral preaching is a morality of feeling, based on universal human love and compassion and directed toward the conquest of egotism. The best way to describe it is as watered-down Christianity. 
Tolstoy also answers the question, what is art, on the basis of this moral teaching. First of all, he points out that the creation of a work of art requires an incredible amount of effort. He takes an opera rehearsal he once witnessed as his point of departure. He describes how much time and effort such a rehearsal requires and how indifferently the director deals with the personnel in his charge. Then he asks what the result of all this effort and work is. Quote, For whom does all this happen? Whom can it please? Even if now and then some pleasant themes can be heard in this opera, it would be easier just to sing them without all these stupid costumes, acts, recitatives, and swaying arms. But a ballet in which half-naked women make sensuously provocative movements and wreathe themselves in garlands is nothing other than a morally degrading idea, such that one cannot even grasp for whom it is meant. An educated person has had enough of such stuff, and an ordinary worker simply does not understand it. It can only please those, and I doubt even this, who are not yet sated by so-called societal pleasures, but have adapted to societal requirements and want to demonstrate their education like young lackeys. And this quite ugly stupidity is not rehearsed with goodwill, not simply cheerful, but with wicked barbarity. Close quote. Because art exacts such sacrifices, one has to ask, what is the purpose of art? How does art contribute to the entire cultural development of humanity? To answer this question, Tolstoy surveys the German, French, and English aestheticians who have published their views about the task of art. His conclusion about these aestheticians is unfavorable. He determines that there is no agreement about the concept of art. He says, quote, even apart from the inexact definition of art, which does not even cover the concept of art, whose nature can be found now in usefulness, now in purpose, now in symmetry, now in order, now in proportion, now in sleekness, now in harmony of the parts, now in unity, now in variety, now in the various combinations of these principles, even apart from these insufficient attempts at objective definitions, all aesthetic determinations can be traced back to two fundamental views of beauty. The first is that beauty exists for its own sake, as an appearance of the utterly perfect, of the idea, of the spirit, of the will from God. And the second is that beauty provides us with an enjoyment that does not seek its own personal gain. Close quote. Tolstoy finds both points of view imperfect. The reason for this imperfection is based on a primitive view of human culture. At a primitive stage of perception, people also see the purpose of eating to be the enjoyment that food offers them. A higher level of insight would allow them to recognize that nutrition and thus the fostering of life is the purpose of eating, and that enjoyment is merely a subsidiary byproduct. Similarly, the human being who believes that the purpose of art consists of the enjoyment of beauty also stands on a lower level. Quote, to come to a precise definition of art, one must, above all, stop seeing it as a means for enjoyment. Instead, one ought to see art as one of the conditions of human life. Starting from this point of view, we must admit that art is one of the means of communication among people. Close quote. Tolstoy does not allow art to be valid for its own sake. People should understand, love, and support one another. For him, that is the purpose of all culture. Art should be merely the means for realizing this higher purpose. Through words, human beings share their thoughts and experiences. Through language, each individual lives in and with the entirety of humanity. Whatever cannot be brought about by words alone, toward this goal of coexistence, should be achieved by art. It should transmit the perceptions of feelings from one human being to the other, just as words do with experiences and thoughts. Quote, when the human being becomes aware through ear or eye of another's expression of feelings, then art achieves its goal. Close quote. I believe that Tolstoy failed to see the origin of art. The artist is not concerned with the message. If I see something manifest in nature or in human life, then a primal urge compels me to reproduce this manifestation 
as a picture in spirit. And my imagination urges me to transform and shape this picture according to my own tendencies. To shape this picture I use the means afforded by my capacities. If the means are colors, then I paint, and if they are ideas, then I write poems. I do not do this so as to communicate, but because I have the need to make a picture of the world according to my imagination. I am not satisfied with the form that nature and human life present to me when I consider them merely as a passive observer. I want to create pictures that I myself invent, or that if I absorb them from outside, I replicate in my own way. Human beings do not want to be mere observers or onlookers of world events. They want to contribute something out of themselves to whatever approaches them from without. That is why they become artists. How the created work then works on is an after-effect. Tolstoy may be right about how art affects culture, but the justification for art as such must, independent of its effect, be sought in an inherent need of human nature. And that is the end of the short essay, Count Leo Tolstoy, What is Art? And I'm going to continue with the next essay, again from 1898, titled On Truth and the Illusion of Truth in Works of Art. Goethe has an interesting essay on this theme, which appears in the form of a dialogue. In it, he deals exhaustively with the question, what sort of truth should be asked for in a work of art? What is said there counterbalances recent works written on this topic. Since at present there is as much lively interest as there is confusion regarding this question, it may be relevant to point out the main thoughts of Goethe's dialogue. It takes its departure from the presentation of the, quote, play within the play, close quote. Quote, in a German theater, an oval amphitheater-like building had been set up. Many spectators had been painted into its balcony boxes, as if they were participating in what was happening below them. Some real spectators in the orchestra and in the boxes were unhappy about this and were offended that something so untrue and unlikely was being set before them. This provided an opportunity for a conversation that is here recorded. Close quote. The conversation takes place between an artist's agent, who believes that he has solved his problem with a painted audience, and a member of the audience for whom such painted spectators do not suffice, because he demands naturalistic accuracy. This audience member wants everything, quote, at least to seem to be true and real, close quote. He continues, quote, Why else would the set designer go to the trouble of adhering so precisely to all the laws of perspective, with his lines, and to paint all objects according to the most complete representation? Why should the costumes require so much study? Why put such a value on the authenticity that transports me back into those times? Why laud most the actor who expresses feelings most truly in speech, posture, and gesture, which deceives me into believing that I am not seeing an impersonation, but the thing itself? Close quote. The artist's agent now points out to the spectator how all of this does not justify his claim that he must have people and events in the theatre that seem to be true. On the contrary, he must instead assert that he never has the impression of seeing the truth, but rather an illusion, although admittedly an illusion of truth. At first the spectator believes that the agent is dabbling in semantics. Thereupon, Goethe allows the agent to answer subtly, quote, And I maintain that when we speak of the effects of our spirit, no words are subtle and delicate enough, and that this sort of play on words indicates a need of the spirit, which not being able to express adequately what goes on inside us, tries to work through the antitheses to answer each side of the question, and thus, as it were, to find the middle between them. Close quote. People who are accustomed to living only in the crass and clunky ideas derived from everyday life often see unnecessary quibbling in the delicate conceptual distinctions that have to be made by anyone who wants to grasp the delicate, 
unendingly complicated relationships within reality. Indeed, it is true that one can argue brilliantly with words, can use words to formulate a system, but it is not always the fault of the one formulating the system that no concepts connect with the words. Often the one hearing the words simply cannot connect the concepts to the words that have been heard. It is often comical when people complain that the words of this or that philosopher make no sense. They always believe it is the philosopher's fault. Yet often the fault lies with the readers, who cannot think, whereas the philosopher has thought a great deal. There is a big difference between, quote, seeming to be true, close quote, and, quote, the illusion of truth, close quote. Of course, theatrical presentation is illusion. One can be of the opinion that the illusion ought to have a form in which it pretends to be reality. Or one can be convinced that the illusion ought to honestly show, I am not reality, I am illusion. If the illusion has this honesty, then it cannot take its laws from reality. It must have laws of its own that are not the same as those of reality. Whoever wants an artistic illusion that imitates reality will say, in a theatrical production, everything must proceed as it would proceed in reality if the same event occurred. On the other hand, whoever wants an artistic illusion that honestly presents itself as illusion will say, the laws through which the dramatic events are linked together are different from those through which real events are linked together. Whoever is convinced of this must also admit that in art there are laws for the linking together of facts for which there is no corresponding model in nature. These laws are imparted by imagination. Imagination does not create according to nature, rather parallel to nature. It creates a higher artistic truth. This is the conviction that Goethe lets the, in quotes, artist's agent utter. He maintains that, quote, artistic truth and natural truth are entirely different, and that the artist should neither strive for nor even be allowed to let his work appear as a work of nature. Close quote. Only artists who lack imagination will want to deliver natural truth in their work, and are therefore unable to create anything artistically true, needing instead to borrow from nature if they want to achieve anything at all. And only those spectators will demand natural truth who do not have sufficient aesthetic culture to raise themselves to the demands of a particular artistic truth besides the natural truth. They know only the truth they experience on a daily basis. And when confronted with art, they ask, does this artistic work agree with what we know about reality? The aesthetically cultured person recognizes a truth other than that of common reality. He seeks this other truth in art. In a very crude but fitting example, Goethe has his artist's agent clarify this difference between a person with aesthetic culture and one without. Quote, a renowned naturalist possessed, among other domesticated animals, a monkey, which he lost one day, and after a long search found again in the library. There sat the beast on the ground with the plates of an unbound work of natural history scattered about him. Astonished by this fervent research on the part of his familiar, the gentleman approached and discovered to his wonder and vexation that the sweet-toothed monkey had been devouring the beetles that were pictured on the plates. Close quote. The monkey knows only natural beetles, and the way he relates to such natural beetles in ordinary life is that he devours them. In the reproductions, it was not reality he encountered, but illusion. He does not take the illusion for illusion. For he could not establish a relationship to an illusion. He takes the illusion for reality and relates to it as if it were real. People who take an artistic illusion for reality are like this monkey. If they see a depiction of a robbery or a love scene on stage, they want to experience it just as they would the corresponding scene in reality. The, in quotes, spectator, in Goethe's dialogue, 
is brought to a purer view of artistic appreciation through the example of the monkey and says, quote, Does not the uncultivated amateur, for this very reason, want a work to be natural so that he may be able to enjoy it in a natural way, which is often vulgar and common? Close quote. The work of art desires to be appreciated in a higher way than does the natural work. And whoever has not implanted this higher means of appreciation in himself through aesthetic culture is like the monkey who devours the painted beetles instead of observing them in order to gain natural scientific knowledge. The agent describes it like this, quote, A perfect work of art is a work of the human spirit and in this sense also a work of nature. But because it unites scattered objects, which it includes even in their most common meaning and value, it is above nature. It is comprehensible only by a mind that is harmoniously formed and developed, and such a mind discovers that the perfect, the complete, is also in harmony with its own nature. The common spectator, on the contrary, has no idea of this. He treats a work of art as he would any object he encounters in the marketplace. But the true connoisseur sees not only the truth of the imitation, but also the excellence of the selection, the refinement of the composition, the superiority of the little world of art. He feels that he must rise to the level of the artist in order to enjoy the work. He feels that he must collect himself out of his scattered life, must live with the work of art, see it again and again, and thereby receive a higher existence. Close quote. Art that seeks mere natural accuracy, aping common daily reality, is refuted the moment one feels the possibility of achieving the higher existence alluded to above. This possibility can actually only be felt by each person individually. That is why there can be no universally convincing refutation of naturalism. Whoever knows only common daily reality will always remain stuck in naturalism. Whoever discovers in himself the capacity to see beyond the natural to a special essence of art will perceive naturalism as the aesthetic worldview of narrow-minded people. Once this becomes apparent, one will not fight naturalism with logic or other weapons. For such a battle would be like wanting to convince the monkey that painted beetles are not for devouring, but for observing. And even if it were possible to make it clear to the monkey that painted beetles are not edible, there would be one thing he would not understand, namely, why there should be painted beetles that cannot be devoured. That is also how it goes with the aesthetically undeveloped person. He might be brought to the point of view that a work of art should not be dealt with like an object you can find in the marketplace. But he will not see why a work of art should exist at all. This is more or less the content of the aforementioned dialogue by Goethe. One sees how it deals in a refined manner with questions that are being scrutinized again today. Such scrutiny as with many other things would not be necessary if one were to take the trouble to immerse oneself in the thoughts of those who approached these matters in the context of a singularly developed culture. That's the end of uh, part four, which consists of two small essays. It is also the end of, actually, uh, in the larger sense, part one of the book, and the second part is uh, composed of lectures. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art translated by Dorit Winter and Clifford Benno. This is the beginning of the set of eight lectures at the end. I am entitling these uh, 
This first lecture is lecture 5.1. The one is that that's the first lecture, and the five stands for the fact that it's the fifth section in these audio files. So let's uh, let call it lecture 5.1. And it, it is entitled The Being of the Arts, and it was given in Berlin on October 28, 1909. Before us lies a broad, snow-covered plain, dotted here and there with frozen rivers and lakes. Farther on, an adjoining coastline, almost entirely frozen, where mighty blocks of ice float, and here and there stand low trees and groves, completely covered with snow and icicles. It is evening. The sun is already set, leaving a golden afterglow. Within this region stand two female figures, out of the afterglow, a messenger is born, a messenger from higher worlds, is, as it were, sent forth, placing himself before the two women, and listening intently to what they say about their innermost feelings, their innermost experiences. One of the women presses her limbs to her body, holds herself tightly together, and says, I'm freezing. The other woman gazes out over the snow-covered plain, the frozen water, the trees hung with icicles utterly oblivious to her own feelings and whatever she can feel of the frosty outer physical landscape, and these words escape her lips, how beautiful is the landscape all around me. She feels warmth stream into her heart, for she forgets everything she might feel through physical frost or physical influence. She is inwardly completely overwhelmed by the immense beauty of this frosty landscape. And the sun sinks lower, and the afterglow dims, and both women fall into a deep sleep. Into a sleep that might mean sheer death for her, sinks the one who had earlier felt the frost so strongly in her own body. While the other sinks into a sleep that shows the after-effect of the impression that caused her to exclaim, Oh, how beautiful! Her limbs are warm through and through and inwardly she remains full of life in her sleep. From the youth who was born out of the sunset's afterglow, she hears the words, quote, You are art, close quote. Then she sleeps. And into her sleep she brought all the results and impressions she experienced through the landscape. And into her sleep there entered something that was like a dream, though it was not really a dream for in a certain way it was reality, a reality of a very special kind, dreamlike only in its form, the revelation of a reality that the soul of this woman could not easily have predicted earlier. For what she experienced was not a dream, but only had the appearance of a dream. What she experienced was something that can be designated as an astral imagination, and if we are to express what she experienced, we can only clothe it in words that provide pictures in which imaginative knowledge speaks. For in that moment the soul of the woman knew that what was indicated to her by the youth with the words, You are art, can only be spoken about intimately when one clothes the experience of imaginative knowledge in words. And so, let us clothe in words the impressions made by imaginative knowledge on the soul of this woman. When her inner sense awoke and she began to discern things, she perceived a remarkable figure, a figure that looked very different from how one might imagine a spiritual figure with one's merely physical cognition. The figure was lacking in physical sensory attributes. The spiritual figure was reminiscent of the physical sensory world, only in that it displayed something like three interwoven circles, three circles that stood perpendicularly upon one another, as though one circle stood horizontally, the other vertically, and the third from right to left. And what flowed through these circles, what could be perceived, was not anything reminiscent of a physical sensory impression, but rather of something purely of a soul nature something we can only compare to the sensations and feelings of the soul. Yet something streamed out of this figure, 
that could be designated in no other way than by saying, what streamed out was something like a deep, restrained, intimate grief, grief about something. And when the soul of the woman saw this, she decided to ask, quote, what is the cause of your grief? Close quote. The spirit-like figure then responded to the woman, quote, Oh, I have real reason for showing this mood, for I come from spiritual heights. I appear to you now, as a human soul also appears, but to discover my origin, you must rise to great heights in the realm of the hierarchies. I descended this far from the higher hierarchies of existence. But human beings on the other side of life, in the physical world, in which we are not standing at present, have torn from me my last remaining offspring, the last who descended from me. Have they torn from me and took for themselves and chained him to a rock formation, after first making him as small as possible? Close quote. Steiner again. Thereupon the soul of the woman raised itself up to ask, quote, Who exactly are you? I now can designate things only with words that are in my memory from life in the physical realm. How will you make me grasp your being and the being of your offspring that humans have chained? Close quote. Steiner again. And the spirit-like figure said, quote, Yonder in the physical world, human beings describe me as a sense, a very small sense. They describe me as the sense they call the sense of balance, which became small, comprising three not quite complete circles linked together in the ear. That is my last offspring. They tore him into the other world and took from him what he had here so that they could be free in all directions. They tore each of these circles and fastened each on every side to a ground. Here, as you see me here, I am not attached. Here I consist of complete circles in all directions. Here I am enclosed in all directions. Thus you come to see my true form. Close quote, Steiner again. Thereupon the soul of the woman raised itself up to ask, quote, How can I help you? Close quote. And the spirit like figure said, quote, You can only help me by merging your soul with mine, by conveying to me all that the people over yonder in life experience through their sense of balance. Then you yourself will grow into me. Then you will become as large as I am. Then you will liberate your sense of balance and raise yourself spiritually freed above the earthly fetters. Close quote. Steiner again. And the soul of the woman did this. She became one with the spirit-like figure from above. And in becoming one with it, she noticed that she needed to do something. And she put one foot in front of the other, transformed stasis into movement, transformed movement into a round dance, and completed the round dance in the form. Quote, Now you have transformed me, close quote said the spirit-like figure. Quote, now I have become what I could become only through you when you carry yourself as you just did. Now I have become a part of you. I have become this so that in this way people can have a presentiment of me. Now I have become the art of dance. Because you wanted to remain soul and did not merge with physical matter, you were able to free me. And at the same time, by stepping as you did, you led me up to the spiritual hierarchies to which I belong, to the spirits of motion. And by completing the round dance, you led me to the spirits of form. You led my very self to the spirits of form. But now you may not go further. For if you were to take only one more step than you did for me, all you accomplished would be in vain. For the spirits of form are those that had to bring everything about in the course of earthly time. If you were to step into that which is the task of the spirits of form, you would destroy everything you just accomplished. For you would have to fall into the region that is called burning desire, 
in the description of astral worlds, by those on the other side who speak to you out of spiritual realms. Your spiritual dance would be transformed into that which springs from wild desires when human beings practice nearly the only thing they know of me today when they practice their dance. But if you remain with what you did just now, then in the round dance, and in the completion of your round dance, you would be imitating the form of the mighty dance that was performed by the planets and sun in the regions of heaven to first make the physical sensory world possible. Close quote. Steiner again. The soul of the woman continued to live in this condition, and another spiritual figure approached her, again very, very different from what human beings, with their physical sensory perceptions, usually imagine the figure of spiritual beings to be. Something appeared before her, which was actually like a figure that is contained in a plane lacking three dimensions. But this figure had something very unusual about it. Although it was contained in this plane, the soul of the woman could always see it in its imaginative state from two sides, and it showed itself in two very different ways, now from this side, now from that. Again, the soul of the woman asked, Who then are you? And this figure said, quote, Oh, I hail from higher realms. I descended to the realm which is known by you as the realm of the spirit, and which here is called the realm of the archangels. I descended to this level. And I needed to descend in order to come into contact with the physical sensory realm of the earth. But human beings have torn the last of my offspring away from me, have taken him away, and over there they have chained him to their own physical sensory form, and over there they call him one of their senses, designating him as the sense of self-movement, as what lives in them when they move their limbs or parts of their organism. Close quote. And the soul of the woman asked, What can I do for you? Then this figure also said, quote, Unite your own being with mine, so that your being merges with mine. Close quote. The soul of the woman did so, and became one with the spiritual figure, slipping entirely into this spiritual figure. Again she grew, and again did the soul of the woman become lofty and beautiful, and that spiritual figure said to her, quote, You see, by doing this you have given yourself the possibility of drawing down a capacity into human souls, a capacity that comes to life in part of what the youth said to you, for thereby you have become what one designates as the art of mime, the art of expression through mime. Close quote. And because she still retained the memory of her earthly form, the soul of the woman, which had only recently fallen asleep, was able to pour into the form all that was in this spiritual figure. Thus she became the model of the mime artist. Quote, you may, however, go only so far, close quote, said the spirit-like fig figure. Quote, you may now pour into the form only what you carry out as movement. If you were to pour in your own desires, in that very moment you would distort the form into a grimace, and that would be the end of the destiny of this art. That is what happened to the human beings over yonder. Their wishes and desires were mingled with their expression of mime, so that they themselves could come to expression in it. But you are to let only selflessness come to expression. Then you are the model for the art of mime. Close quote, Steiner again. And the soul of the woman continued to live in this state, and another spiritual figure approached, which in essence manifested itself as a line, moved only in a line. And when the soul of the woman noticed that this spiritual figure which moved in a line was also sorrowful, she asked, What can I do for you? And the figure said, quote, Oh, I hail from higher regions, from higher spheres. But I descended to the realms of the hierarchies, to that realm which you designate in spiritual science as the region of the spirits of personality, 
which human beings possess only as an after-image. Close quote. Steiner again. And this figure also had to confess that it had lost its last offspring when it made contact with human beings. And it continued, quote, There, on earth, human beings designate the last of my offspring as their sense of vitality, their sense of life, that through which they feel their own personality, that which pervades them as their immediate mood and their immediate contentment, and what they feel in themselves as the strengthening and establishing of their own form. But human beings have chained this sense within themselves. Close quote. Quote, what can I do for you? Close quote, asked the soul of the woman. And then again the spiritual figure requested, merge with my own being. Leave outside all that humans have of their own selfhood and merge with my own form. Flow together with me and become one with me. This the soul of the woman did. Then she noticed that although the figure was but stretched out in a line, she herself was filled with strength in all directions. She herself now filled out that form which she had on earth, which she now remembered, and which now appeared to her here as newly sparkling, as newly beautiful. Then the spiritual figure said, quote, You have achieved something through this, your deed. It makes you singular in the great realm after which you were named. In this moment, you have become what human beings on earth also have a possibility of becoming. You have become the archetype of sculpture. Close quote, Steiner again. The soul of the woman became the archetype of sculpture, and the archetype of sculpture could now pour a capacity into the souls of human beings because of what she had absorbed. Through that spirit of personality, she was now able to pour it into the souls of human beings. She had this as a capacity, and she thereby gave sculptural imagination to human beings on the earth the possibility of working in sculptural images. Quote, but you must not take another step. You must stay entirely within the form. For that which is within you may be carried up only as far as the spirits of form and their regions. Were you to go beyond that, you would have the effect of arousing human desire. If you do not remain as the noble form, then in your realm nothing good can appear. But if you remain in the noble framework of the form, then you may pour into that form what will become possible only in the far distant future. And then, although human beings are far from having achieved that form through which they can bring to life what today is controlled by quite different powers within them, then you may show them what humanity will one day be allowed to experience in a purified condition in the future planetary incarnation of Venus, when their form will have become a very different one. Then you may indicate that the human form of today will in future be pure and chaste. Close quote. Steiner again. And out of the ever changing ocean of imaginative forms there appeared something like the model of the Venus de Milo. Quote, you may go only to a certain boundary in the shaping of the form. In the moment that you overstep the form just a bit, thereby annihilating the strong personality that must keep the human form intact, you stand at the boundary of the beautiful, of what is possible in a work of art. Close quote. Steiner again. And out of the ever-changing ocean waves of the imaginative astral world, there appeared a figure. It showed how, through what was in it, the outer form of the human being had been carried to the very edge of where the form would renounce the coherence of the personality, where the personality would be lost if only another step were taken. And out of the astral images there appeared the figure of the Le- Leokoon, and the experiences of the woman's soul in the imaginative world continued. And now she came to a figure about which she realized, This does not exist yonder in the physical plane. Nothing like it exists in the physical plane. Only now do I get to know it. Various things in the physical realm are remotely reminiscent of this figure, 
but nowhere is this figure as complete as it is here. It was a wonderfully austere figure, which, having been asked by the soul of the woman, responded that it originated in wide regions, not merely high regions, that it needed for now to work in the realm of the hierarchies, called the realm of the spirits of form. Then the figure said to the soul of the woman, quote, Human beings on earth have never been able to produce any sort of image of me, have never been able to bring into being anything that completely corresponds to me. For my form as it is here does not exist on the physical plane. Therefore they had to dismember me. And by having been dismembered, I attained, that is, if you fulfill what you should fulfill, if you unite with me and become one with me, the possibility of giving you capacities so that you can lay the capacity of imagination into the souls of human beings. For because this capacity has been torn asunder in human beings, the totality can appear only here and there, torn into individual forms. Nothing about me can be called a human sense, but for that reason human beings were unable to chain me. They were only able to tear me into separate pieces. They took from me also my last offspring and tore him into individual pieces. Close quote Steiner again. And again the soul of the woman, not eschewing the sacrifice of being momentarily torn into pieces, united with this spiritual being. Then this spiritual figure said to her, quote, Now that you have done this, you again have become a part of what you were designated as a whole. You have become the archetype of architecture and the art of building. You can give human beings the archetype of architectural imagination if you pour that which you just achieved into the human soul. But you will be able to give them an architectural imagination that only shows them details and makes it possible for them to build structures that descend out of the spiritual world in an expansion from above downward as represented by the pyramids. You will make human beings capable of producing one kind of after-image of what I am only when you show them that they should only employ the art of building for a spiritual temple, not for something that serves some earthly purpose, and that this character should already be visible in the outer form. Close quote. Steiner again, and there now appeared, as earlier the pyramid had appeared out of this seething astral ocean, the Greek temple. And another form appeared out of the seething astral ocean, a form that did not strive from above downward, so as to become broader at the bottom, but instead strove upward, rejuvenating itself in an upward direction, a third form into which architectural imagination had to be torn there appeared the Gothic cathedral. Then the soul of the woman continued to live in the imaginative world, and another figure approached her, even stranger than the previous one, and even more remarkable. Completely strange and remarkable. There streamed from it something like warming love, and then something quite frigid. Who are you? asked the soul of the woman. The figure said, quote, among those in the physical plane who report to human beings about the spiritual world, I have only one name in the proper form. Only they know how to properly designate me, for my name is Intuition. I am called Intuition, and I come from a faraway realm. And by wandering from a faraway realm into the world, I descended from the realm of the seraphim. Close quote, Steiner again. The figure of intuition was a seraphic being, and again the soul of the woman asked, What do you want me to do? Quote, you must unite with me. You must dare to unite with me. Then you will be able to enkindle in the souls of human beings on earth a capacity, which again is part of their imagination, and by which you will become a member in what the youth earlier designated you as. Close quote. Steiner again. And the soul of the woman descended to perform this deed. 
and thereby she became also in outer appearance something quite foreign and quite strange, as far as the outer physical human shape is concerned. It was something that can only be judged by one who can see deeply into the human soul itself. For the soul of the woman, the soul that had hitherto still possessed something etheric, had now become what can only be compared with something soul-like. The spiritual seraphic figure called intuition now said, quote, In exchange you can now furnish human beings with the capacity of painterly imagination. Thereby you became the archetype of painting. Thereby you will be able to enkindle a capacity in human beings. One of their senses, the eye, E-Y-E, which contains something untouched by the self's own thought activity, which contains the comprehensive thinking of the outer world, that is the sense you will be able to bestow once you have the painterly imagination within you. And this sense will be able to recognize the soul being of what is otherwise lifeless and without soul by penetrating beyond the surface. And everything that otherwise appears to human beings on the surface of things, as color, as form, they will be able to ensoul through your capacity. They will treat it in such a way that soul will speak through form, And not only the outwardly visible color will speak, but through the color they conjure up on the surface, something from within the color will speak, just as everything that comes from me leads from the innermost outward. You will be able to give human beings the capacity that enables them to carry movement emanating from their own soul light even into lifeless nature which otherwise appears only as soulless color and form. You will give them that which transforms movement into rest, so that they can hold fast whatever is changeable in the outer physical world. You will teach them to hold fast the briefly shimmering color upon which the rising sun's ray darts, the colors in lifeless nature. Close quote. Steiner again. And an image arose out of the seething ocean of the imaginative world, an image that represented landscape painting. And a second image arose, representing something else, which the spirit-like figure elucidated by saying, quote, Through the capacity that you are giving human beings, you will be able to teach them how to hold fast what endures for shorter or longer periods of time in human life what is experienced in a minute or an hour or in centuries, and is concentrated in a short moment. When past and future mightily intersect, when these two movements of past and future meet, you will teach human beings how these two movements can be held fast as a stable calm in the center when they meet. Close quote. Steiner again. And there arose out of the surging world of imagination the image of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Quote, But you will have difficulties as well, and the greatest difficulty will occur when you allow human beings to apply your capacity to whatever already contains movement and soul, whatever they have already injected with movement and soul from the physical plane. That is where you will most easily stumble. That will be the limit where the images of the archetype that you are may still be deemed art, and that is where danger will be. Close quote. Steiner again. And out of the surging world of imagination rose the image of the portrait. The soul of the woman continued to live in the imaginative world, and another figure approached her, again strange and unlike anything to be found in the physical world, again something that could be called a heavenly figure, not comparable to anything on the physical plane. And the soul of the woman asked, Who are you? The figure said, Oh, there on the earth I have only one name that is used correctly by those who bring knowledge of the spiritual world to humanity. They call me inspiration. I come from a distant realm, but for the time being my place was in the region that on earth, where one speaks of the spiritual world, is known as the region of the cherubim. Close quote. A figure from the realm of the cherubim separated itself out of the imaginative world, 
Again, after the soul of the woman had asked, What can I do for you? What should I do? The cherubinic figure said, You must transform yourself into me. You must become one with me. And in spite of the danger involved, the soul of the woman merged with the being of this cherubinic figure. She thus became even less like anything physical that is to be found on the face of the earth. If one could say of the earlier figure that at least something like an analogy of it exists on the earth, then one had to describe this cherubinic figure as something that bore within itself a being so foreign to anything on the earth that it could not be compared to anything there. And the soul of the woman became completely unlike anything earthly. She became such that one could observe now she herself has gone over into the spiritual realm with her whole being, and she now belongs to the spiritual realm that cannot be found in the world of the senses. The figure then said, quote, Because you have done this, you can now plant a capacity into human souls. And when this capacity rises on the earth in human souls, it will live in these souls as musical imagination. And with your capacity, you have become so foreign to the earth that human beings will be unable to take in anything from the outside and imprint it upon what the soul itself experiences under your inspiring influence. They must enkindle this on their own through a sense that they otherwise know in a very different way. For they must give the sense of tone a new form. They must find the musical tone in their own soul. They must create out of their own soul as from heavenly heights. And if human beings create in this way, then something will flow out of their own soul that will be like a human reflection of everything that flows and sprouts incompletely in nature. Then out of human souls will sprout something like a reflection of the trickling spring, the wind's effect, the rolling thunder. It will not be a copy of these things, but something that meets all of these splendors of nature that flow from unknown spiritual depths like a self-evident sister. Through this, human beings will become capable of creating something that enriches the earth, that is new on the earth, that without your capacity would not have existed, that is like a seed of the future on the earth. And you will give them the capacity to express what lives in their souls, which could never be expressed if they depended on what they now have, on thoughts and concepts. For all of the feelings that scorch the concepts, that would freeze if they were dependent on concepts, for all of the feelings toward which the concept would be fiercely hostile, you will give them the possibility of allowing the innermost being of the soul to breathe out on the wing of melody and song into the surroundings of the earth, and to imprint upon the surroundings of the earth something that would otherwise not be there. All of the complex, powerful feelings, all of the feelings that live like a mighty world within the human soul, feelings that could otherwise never be experiences in the outer world in this form, feelings that one could experience only if one traversed world history and heavenly space with the soul, all of these realms that cannot be experienced in the outer world because of all the cross-currents that would have to pass through centuries and millennia if one wished to know what human beings experienced here and there, all of this they will be able to bring together through your capacities into something they have won for themselves into their symphonic musical works. Close quote. Steiner again. And the soul of the woman grasped how one brings down from spiritual heights of the world what is designated as inspiration, and how this is to be expressed through the healthy human soul. She grasped that this could be expressed only when it was poured into tones. The soul of the woman now knew what the spiritual researcher himself describes as the world of inspiration, and how on the physical plane it can only be given through physical means of expression, so that it is not merely a copy, but can be present for human beings directly. Thus it could be given only in the musical work of art, and the soul of the woman understood that the musical work of art 
could express mighty events. How Uranus once enkindled his own feeling in Gaia's fire of love. And what happened when Kronos wanted to illuminate through the light of Zeus what lived in him as spiritual being. Such were the profound experiences undergone by the soul of that woman through contact with this cherubinic being. The soul of the woman continued to live into the imaginative world, and another figure approached, which was also very unlike anything on earth. And when the soul of the woman asked, Who are you? the spirit-like figure answered, quote, My name is correctly applied only by those yonder in the physical world who convey spiritual events through spiritual science. For I am imagination, and I come from a far distant realm. But from this far distant realm I entered the region of the hierarchies called the region of the spirits of will. Close quote. Steiner again. Quote, what should I do for you? Close quote. The soul of the woman asked once more. This figure also asked that the soul of the woman merge her own being with the figure of this spirit of the will. And once more the soul of the woman became something very different from the usual figure of the soul. She became entirely a soul figure. Quote, because you have done this, you are now able to breathe into human souls the capacity that human beings on earth experience as poetic imagination. You have become the archetype of poetic imagination. And through you, human beings will become capable of expressing in their speech what they can never express, as long as they cling only to the outer world and want to reproduce only things that exist in the physical world. You will give human beings the possibility of expressing through your imagination all that touches their own soul and could not be expressed in any other form, could not stream out of the human soul through earthly means of expression. You will give them the capacity to express these things. On the wings of your rhythms, your meters, and through everything that you will be able to give human beings, they will be capable of expressing something for which language would usually be far too crude an instrument. You will give them the possibility of bringing to expression that which could otherwise not be expressed. Close quote, Steiner again. And in the image of lyric poetry there appeared that which, through the centuries, had been passed from generation to generation and had inspired entire generations. Quote, you will also be able to summarize what could never be represented as one outer physical event. Your emissaries will be the bards, the poets of all ages. In epics they will summarize what is gathered from the wide circles of humanity. And the form that the human will assumes when passions storm against each other, that which human beings on earth, in the physical world, could never fight to the end, this you will be able to conjure up before them in scenes where you will show them how their colliding passions will cause the death of the one and the victory of the other. You will bestow on human beings the possibility of dramatic art. Close quote. Steiner again. And in that moment, the soul of the woman noticed in herself an inner experience, an inner experience that can only be identified with the expression that on earth is usually called waking up. What made her wake up? She awoke because she saw as in a mirror image something that does not exist on earth. She herself had become one with imagination. That which lives as poetry on earth is a mirror image of imagination. The mirror image of imagination is what the soul of the woman saw in poetry. That is what caused her to awaken. Although by awakening she had to leave the dreamlike sphere of spirit, she did at least enter into something similar, be it as a dead mirror image, to the spiritual vitality of imagination. That is what woke her up. And because she awoke, she was able to perceive that the night had passed. Once again the snow-covered landscape surrounded her, Again she saw the coast with the swimming icebergs, the icicles on the trees. 
But when she awoke, she noticed that next to her lay the other woman, as if frozen by the frost she had suffered, not warmed inwardly by what she had taken with her as the impression of this snowy landscape, expressed in the words, quote, Oh, how beautiful! Close quote. Now the soul of the woman, who had experienced all of this during the night, noticed that the other woman, who had almost frozen because she could experience nothing of the spiritual world, was human science. And she took her up so that she could share some of her warmth. She cared for and tended her, and the woman warmed up under the impression of what the soul of the other woman had brought back from the nighttime experiences. Yonder in the east the dawn shone into the landscape. The sun announced itself. The dawn grew redder and redder. And now that she was awake, the soul of that woman, who had had these nighttime experiences, could look and listen to what human beings on earth say when they perceive in themselves something of what can be experienced in the imaginative world. And from the choir of human beings, she heard what the best among them let ring forth as their presentiments about what they themselves did not know directly through imagination, but let flow out of the profoundest depths of their soul as the touchstone for all of humanity. She heard the voice of a poet who once sensed the greatness of what is experienced by the human soul out of the world of imagination. She understood now that she had to become a savior of what was a half-frozen science. She understood that she must warm it and penetrate it with what she herself was, at first with what she was as art, and then that she had to communicate to this half-frozen science what she carried as memory of the nighttime dream. And she noticed how quickly what is half-frozen can come to life again, when what she has to communicate is taken up by science as knowledge. Once again she looked toward the dawn, and the dawn became a symbol for her of that out of which she herself had awoken, and a symbol of her own imaginations. She understood what the poet so wisely had uttered out of his own premonition, and what she heard from out of a new spirit sounded forth from the whole earth. Quote, only through the dawn of beauty do you press on into the land of knowledge. Close quote. That is the end of Lecture 5.1. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art. This is uh, it's translated by Dorit Winter and Clifford Venno. This is the second lecture of the eight lectures that are at the back part of the book. I've numbered it uh, Lecture 6.2. And it is entitled, The Sensory Suprasensory in its Realization Through Art, Part 1. Given in Munich on February 15, 1918. It was certainly out of a profound overall understanding of the world, and above all out of a deep feeling for art, that Goethe coined the words, quote, The one to whom nature begins to reveal her open secret, feels an irresistible longing for her worthiest interpreter, art. Close quote. To this we might add, without thereby becoming ungertianistic, quote, the one to whom art begins to reveal her secret feels an almost insurmountable antipathy toward her best worthy interpreter, the aesthetic scientific approach. Close quote. And today I do not intend to present an aesthetic, scientific approach. It seems to me not only compatible but entirely in accordance with the Gertianistic perspective to speak about art by describing the experiences we can have of it. 
experiences we may have often had, just as we enjoy talking about experiences we have shared with a good friend. With reference to human evolution, we speak of original sin. Today I do not want to enlarge upon whether human life, in its richness, insofar as its shadow side is concerned, can be exhausted by speaking of original sin in the singular when considering human life in general. But in connection with artistic feeling and artistic creativity, it seems to me to be, in any case, necessary to speak of two original sins. In fact, it seems to me that one original sin in the realm of artistic creativity and artistic enjoyment consists of imitation, the reproduction of what is merely sense-perceptible. And the other original sin seems to me to be the wish to express, represent, or manifest through art the supersensory. But it then becomes very difficult to approach art, either creatively or experientially, if both the physical and the supersensory are rejected. Yet this seems to me to be in keeping with a sound human feeling. Whoever wants art to consist only of the sense perceptible will hardly get beyond a refined element of illustration, which may indeed be raised to the level of art, but can never become true art. And we can indeed say, to be satisfied by the merely illustrative element that imitates the physical, or by whatever else is furnished by the sense world alone, belongs to a soul life that has gone somewhat to seed. But a kind of obsession with one's own understanding and reason would be necessary for someone to demand that an idea, something purely spiritual, should be embodied artistically. Expressing a world view through poetry or through pictorial art is not in accord with a cultivated taste. Rather, it corresponds to a state of barbarism in the human life of feeling. Art itself, however, is deeply rooted in life. And if it were not rooted in life, then through the whole way in which it arises, it would not have no justification for existence. For in contrast to a purely realistic worldview, art must exhibit all manner of unreality, and into it must play many of life's illusions. It is precisely because art is obliged to introduce into life something that from a certain perspective is unreal, that it must in some way or another be deeply rooted in life. Now it may be said that from a certain boundary of feeling, from a lower boundary of feeling up to a different higher boundary of feeling, which admittedly has to first be developed in many people, artistic feeling arises everywhere in life. Even if it does not appear as art itself, this feeling arises when, in the ordinary sense world, what is suprasensory and mysterious somehow makes its presence known. And it arises when what is suprasensory, what is purely thought, what is purely felt, what is purely experienced in spirit, lights up before us in a visible sensory form, not as a symbol or wooden allegory, but in a sensory form that it has chosen for itself. Everyone who maintains his soul between the two indicated boundaries of feeling will perceive that even in ordinary life, ordinary sensory input is, so to speak, enchanted. It has within itself something supersensory. Of course, one can say, if someone invites me to enter a room with red walls, I have a certain predisposition that arising in the presence of the red walls is somehow related to artistic perception. If I am led toward red walls and the man who invited me then steps toward me, I will consider it natural for him to tell me all sorts of things that are valuable to me, things that interest me. And if that is not the case, then I will consider the whole invitation into the red room as a sham and will leave unsatisfied. If someone receives me in a blue room and talks continually so that I cannot get a word in edgewise, then I will experience the whole situation as highly uncomfortable, and I will tell myself that actually the man has already deceived me through the very color of his room. Innumerable such things arise in life. 
If a lady wearing a red dress approaches you, it will seem extraordinarily untruthful if she behaves all too modestly. A lady with curly hair will be perceived as truthful only if she is a bit cheeky. If she is not cheeky, it is disappointing. Of course, things need not be like this in life. Life has the right to ignore such illusions, but there are certain boundaries of feeling within which one perceives things in this manner. Naturally, these things are not to be understood as general rules. Some people will have entirely different perceptions about these things. But nevertheless, it is the case that for every human being this kind of feeling does exist in life so that what one encounters in the sensory world can already be perceived as something that contains, so to speak, a spiritual element, a spiritual situation, a spiritual state, an enchanted spiritual feeling. It can certainly seem as if that which stands before us as a demand of our soul, and which so very often in life can bitterly disappoint us, calls forth the necessity of creating a special sphere of life for such desires that demand satisfaction in human life. And the special sphere of life seems to me to be art. Out of the rest of life it forms just what satisfies that sense which exists within such a boundary of feeling. Now, perhaps one will be able to approach what is experienced through art by attempting to look more deeply into processes of the soul that take place both in artistic creation and in artistic enjoyment. For surely one need only have lived truly with art just a little bit, need only have tried to become somewhat intimately conversant with it, to find that the soul processes that have been described are basically the same for the artist as for the one who enjoys art although in an opposite relationship. The artist experiences in advance what I am trying to describe, so that he first experiences a particular process of soul, which is then replaced by another. Someone enjoying art first experiences what I mean by the second soul process, and only afterward does he experience what came first for the artist. Now, it seems to me that this is why it is so difficult to approach art psychologically, because one hardly dares to step so deeply into the human soul as is necessary to grasp what artistic needs call forth. Indeed, perhaps it is only our own time that lends itself to speak more clearly about artistic needs. For whatever one might think of various recent and current artistic directions, of Impressionism, Expressionism, and so forth, and indeed talking about such things sometimes stems from a truly inartistic need, one thing cannot be denied. Through the emergence of these directions from particular depths of soul, which lie deep in the unconscious and were never before brought up out of this unconscious, artistic perception and artistic life have now been brought to the surface of consciousness. Of necessity, because of all the talk about Impressionism and Expressionism, there is far more interest for artistic soul processes and the enjoyment of art than there used to be in earlier times, when the aesthetic concepts of the learned gentleman were so far removed from what actually lives in art. In recent times, concepts have entered into considerations of art, ideas have entered that in some ways are very close to what contemporary art creates, at least compared to earlier times. The life of the soul is, actually, so infinitely deeper than one usually supposes, and very few people have an inkling that human beings have a totality of experiences in the depths of their souls, in the subconscious and unconscious, that are rarely discussed in ordinary life but one must step somewhat more deeply into soul life to find that area between the indicated boundaries of feeling. Our soul life swings like a pendulum between the most diverse conditions, which all fall, more or less, nothing I am saying today is meant to be pedantic, into two types. 
On the one hand, there is something in the depths of the human soul that freely wants to arise out of the soul, and that sometimes, though quite unconsciously, torments this soul if the soul is particularly inclined toward the indicated mood. Then it wants to continually discharge itself, although it cannot do so, nor should it do so in a healthy human condition, as vision. In reality, our soul life, given the right predisposition for this soul mood, continually, and far more than one would believe, strives to transform itself in the sense of vision. Healthy soul life consists in the fact that this, quote, will for vision, close quote, remains only a striving, that the vision does not actually arise. This striving for vision which fundamentally exists in the soul of all human beings, can be satisfied when we present the soul with what wants to arise, but should not arise in the healthy soul, namely the unhealthy vision, in an outer impression, in an outer form, in an outer painting or something similar. And the outer painting, the outer form, can then be what enters so as to leave in the depths of the soul in a healthy manner, that which actually wants to become vision. We then offer the content of the vision to the soul, so to speak, from outside. And we offer the soul something truly artistic if we are able to discern through justified visionary striving what form, what image we must offer the soul so that its urge for the visionary is balanced. I believe that many recent considerations that tend in the direction of expressionism, are closer to this truth, and that the arguments about it are on the way to discover what I have just said. But they do not go far enough, do not look deeply enough into the soul, and do not get to know this irresistible urge for the visionary that actually exists in every human soul. But that is only the one aspect. And one can indeed see, if one examines artistic creativity and artistic enjoyment, that there is a type of artwork that originates in and reflects this need of the human soul. But there is another source for artistic works. The source of which I just spoke lies in a particular constitution of the human soul, in its urge to have what is visionary as freely arising imagination. The other source lies in the fact that within nature itself there are enchanted secrets that can only be found if one agrees, without scientific presuppositions which are not required, to sense what the deeper secrets in surrounding nature actually are. These deeper secrets found in surrounding nature do perhaps seem rather paradoxical for today's human consciousness when they are expressed in words. Yet it is precisely this which makes these secrets, starting in our own time, ever more popular. There is something in nature that is not just growing, burgeoning, sprouting life, which naturally fills the healthy soul with joy, but there is, in addition, something in nature that in ordinary life is called death, destruction. In nature there is something that continually destroys and conquers one life through another. Whoever can sense this will also be able to sense that when he encounters, to choose specifically this excellent example, a natural human form, this human form contains something mysterious in its shape. At any moment, this shape which manifests in outer life is actually killed through a higher life. That is the secret of all life, continually and everywhere. A lower life is killed by a higher life. This human form, which is penetrated by the human soul, by human life, is continually being killed, continually being overcome by this human soul, this human life. And how this happens can be described as follows. The human form as such carries within itself something that would be very different if it were entirely self-governed, if it could follow its own life. But this life of its own is just what it cannot follow, because a different higher life is in it and kills it. 
the sculptor approaches a human form and feels, even if unconsciously, this mystery. He realizes that every human form wants something that cannot come to expression in the human being, something that is overcome, is killed through a higher life, through soul life. He conjures something out of the human form that is not present in the actual human being, that the human being lacks, that nature hides. Goethe sensed something like this when he spoke of, in quotes, revealed secrets. One can go even further. One can say this secret is the foundation of nature everywhere. Fundamentally, no color, no line appears in outer nature without something lower being overcome by something higher. It can also be the opposite, so that the higher is overcome by the lower, but in all of this one can release the enchantment and find what was overcome, which then will become artistic creativity. And when one then reaches what has thus been overcome, what is freed from enchantment, and knows how to experience it properly, then it becomes artistic feeling. I would like to express myself even more precisely, specifically on the latter point. In Goethe, we have many human truths that have yet to be uncovered, but are actually very meaningful. Goethe's theory of the metamorphosis of plants proceeds, for example, from the idea that the petals of a plant are but the transformed leaves, and then goes on to encompass everything in nature, all natural forms. This Goethean theory of metamorphosis, if what is contained within it is extracted through a far more comprehensive knowledge of nature than was possible, in accordance with the age, in Goethe's day, this theory is capable, if only nature is revealed through comprehensive observation, of becoming something far, far greater. That is to say, in Goethe, this theory of metamorphosis is understandably restricted, but it can be broadened. Now, if we stay with the human form, we might say the following by way of an example. Whoever observes a human skeleton sees through a merely superficial observation that this human skeleton actually consists clearly of two parts. One could go much further, but that would lead too far for today. It consists of the head, which is merely placed atop the skeleton, and of the rest of the skeleton. Whoever has a sense for the transformation of forms, whoever can see how one form leads to another, just as Goethe believed that the green leaf becomes a colored petal, will become aware when he expands this way of observing that the human head is a totality, that the rest of the organism is also a totality and that the one is a metamorphosis of the other. In a mysterious way, the entire rest of the human being is of such a nature that we can say, if we observe it appropriately, it can be transformed into a human head. And the human head is something that contains the entire human organism, only in a more rounded form. But the notable aspect is this. If one has the necessary observational capacity to inwardly transform the human organism so that it becomes altogether head, and if one can transform the human head so that it appears itself to be a human being, then the result will be entirely different in each of these cases. In the one case, when one transforms the head into an entire organism, the result shows us the human being as if ossified, as if constricted, as if it is everywhere driven towards sclerosis. If one allows the remaining human organism to become a head, what results bears little resemblance to an ordinary human being, and is reminiscent of a human being only in its basic forms. What results has not ossified into indications of the shoulder blades, but rather wants to become wings, even wants to grow beyond the shoulders and develop over the head from the wings, and then it appears to emanate from the head, and wants to grasp the head in such a way that what ordinarily presents itself as ear in the human form expands and connects to the wings. In short, 
one perceives something of a spiritual structure. This spirit form rests magically within the human form. It is that which, if one expands what Goethe, through feeling, arrived at in his theory of metamorphosis, it is that which shines into the secrets of human nature, so that through this example one can say, nature is something that actually strives in every detail, not just abstractly, but perceptibly and concretely, to become something very different from what it presents to our senses. Nowhere will one have the feeling, if one thoroughly grasps things through an inner sensitivity, that any form whatsoever, that anything at all in nature, does not have the possibility of becoming something beyond what it is. Such an example so significantly expresses how within nature a life is always overcome, is virtually killed by a higher life. The only reason we do not perceive what we bear within us as this human duality, as a dichotomy in human growth, is that something higher, something suprasensory, unifies and harmonizes these two sides of human nature, in such a way that the ordinary human form arises before us. That is why, not taken outwardly, spatially, but in an intensively internal way, nature appears so magical, so mysterious, for in every part of itself it actually wants more, unendingly more than it can offer. What it separates into, what it organizes, is composed in such a way that a higher life swallows a lower life, which is thus allowed to achieve only a limited development. Anyone who guides his feeling in the direction given here will find that this revealed secret, this enchantment that permeates all nature, is like the inner striving for what is visionary. But now it acts from the outside. To inspire the human being to go beyond nature, to set to work in a given place, to extract a particular detail from the whole, and from there to let stream out what nature wants in a particular place, a part that can become a whole, but in nature is not a whole. Perhaps the following may be mentioned here. In the construction of the building of the Anthroposophical Society in Dornach, near Basel, the attempt was made to realize sculpturally what I have just indicated. The attempt was made to create a sculptural group out of wood, representing, I would like to say, a typical human being, but representing this typical human being in such a way that what is usually merely a tendency, kept in check by a higher life, is represented so that the form momentarily becomes gesture, and this gesture is then brought once more to rest. The attempt was made here to awaken sculpturally what is kept in check in the ordinary human form, not the gesture that comes from the soul, but the gesture that is killed in the soul and kept in check by the life of the soul, and then to let it come to rest again. The attempt was made to bring the quiet surfaces of the human organism into movement gesturally, and then to bring them to rest again. This allowed quite naturally for the perception of the tendency that every human being has, and that is of course kept in check by a higher life, for the asymmetry that is present in every human being, no human being is formed on the left exactly as he is on the right, to emerge more strongly. But having once allowed it to emerge more strongly, having, so to speak, dissolved what is held together in a higher life, one must then connect it with humor on a different higher stage, for then it is necessary to reconcile what approaches one naturalistically from outside. It becomes necessary to reconcile this crime against naturalism artistically, to make the asymmetry conspicuous, to bring various things into gesture, and then to allow them to be brought to rest again. We then had to atone for this inner crime by, on the other hand, showing the triumph that happens when the human head metamorphoses into a dark, nightmarish form that, however, is then overcome by the representative of humanity. 
the form placed beneath his feet, so that it can be perceived as a member, a part, of what represents the human being. The other form we had to create for this sculpture represents what feeling demands when, besides the head, the remaining human form becomes so mighty, as it is indeed in life, though kept in check by a higher life, that what is usually held back and stunted is overgrown, for example, what is attached at the shoulder blades and is set unconsciously into the human form as a luciferic element of sorts, an element wanting to escape the human form. If everything set into the human form that erupts as urges and desires becomes form rather than being overcome by a higher life, the life of understanding or reason, which is otherwise formed in the human head, if all of this manifests itself, then one has the possibility of disenchanting nature, of wresting from nature her revealed secret by taking what nature has killed off piecemeal in order to create a whole and presenting it again in parts so that the observer must carry out in his soul what nature has otherwise carried out for him. Nature has done all of this. Nature has really composed the human being in such a way that the various individual parts are assembled into a, an harmonious whole. By dissolving what is enchanted within nature, one dissolves nature's suprasensory forces. The occasion does not arise in either a wooden allegorical or in a reasonably creative manner to search for something as idea, as something thought up, as a merely suprasensory spiritual presence underlying nature. Rather, one simply inquires of nature, how would you grow in your individual parts if your growth were not interrupted through a higher life? One manages to release the suprasensory out of the sensory, whereas it is usually enchanted within the sensory. One actually manages to be supernaturally natural. I believe that the longing of our era to give structure to these sorts of secrets of nature this sort of sensory, supra-sensory element, can be perceived in all of these different tendencies and strivings, which were begun but got stuck in the beginning and are designated as Impressionism. For one has the feeling that what happens in art and in artistic creativity and enjoyment ought to be further elevated in our consciousness today than it was in earlier eras of art. There has always been the striving for what takes place there, namely that the repressed vision is satisfied or that something is placed in front of nature that wants to imitate its processes. For, in fact, these are the two sources of all art. Let us return to the time of Raphael. In Raphael's time, these things were, of course, striven for quite differently than Cezanne or Hodler are attempting in our day. But, more or less consciously, this striving that is designated in art through these two streams has always been present. It is only that in earlier times it was considered completely, fundamentally original if the artist himself did not know that in his soul something spiritually unconscious approached nature and freed what was enchanted within nature when he sought for it in the sensory suprasensory. Thus, when one stands before a work of art by Raphael, one has the feeling that if one has any inclination to interpret what otherwise remains dark in the unconscious depths and does not need to be expressed, one makes an agreement with the artwork and thus also with Raphael. But this agreement might give one the feeling, as mentioned, it need not be expressed, not even by one's own soul, that in an earlier life, one had been together with Raphael and had experienced all sorts of things from him that had lodged themselves deeply in the soul. And the agreement one had reached with Raphael's soul centuries ago has become quite unconscious. Then when one stands before Raphael's works, it arises again. One has the feeling that something agreed upon long ago between one's own soul and Raphael's soul is present. One does not have this feeling 
in the presence of more recent artists. The more recent artist leads one spiritually, so to speak, into his chamber, and what is agreed upon is close to human consciousness. The agreement is made with him in the present. Because this longing, this necessity of time has now arisen, the process of the upwelling imagination, which is actually a repressed vision, allows itself to be satisfied artistically in our time. And although today it is still somewhat elementary, a real dissolving of what is otherwise unified in nature arises before us. Yes, a dissolving and then again a joining together, the imitation of a natural process. What endless meaning was achieved by the efforts of recent painters to study the different colors and the light in its different nuances, to discover that fundamentally every effect of light, every nuance of color, wants to be more than it can be when it is forced into a whole, when it is killed through a higher life. So much has been attempted, beginning with this feeling, in order to awaken the life of light itself, to treat light in such a way that what generally remains enchanted within it, when it must serve the formation of ordinary natural processes and natural events, is released from enchantment. We are still mostly just at the beginning with these things. Nevertheless, from these beginnings, which correspond to a justified yearning, we will proceed and likely be able to experience how something will become a secret purely artistically and then become a solved secret. This sounds, when spoken aloud, somewhat banal, but many things that sound banal contain secrets. We must only get close to the secret, especially the feeling for the secret. What I mean here is the answer to the question, why can one not actually paint fire or draw air? It is quite clear that, in reality, one cannot paint fire. One would need to have an unpainterly sense if one wanted to hold fast the glittering, glowing life that can only be held through light. No one should desire to paint lightning, and even less so to draw air. But on the other hand, one has to admit that everything contained in light hides something that strives to become like fire, to become something immediately like it, so that it says something, so that it makes an impression that wells up out of the light, and also out of every single color nuance, just as human speech wells up out of the human organism. Every effect of light wants to tell us something, and every effect of light wants to tell the other effect of light something. In every effect of light rests a life that is overcome, killed through larger connections. If we turn our feeling in this direction, we discover in this way the feeling for color, what the color says, which is what was started in the time of plain air painting. Readers aside, plain, P-L-E-I-N, hyphen air, possibly plain air, end of readers aside. If we discover this secret about color, then this feeling expands, and we find that basically what I have just now said is applicable. But not for all colors. Colors speak in different ways. Whereas the lighter colors, the reds and yellows, actually attack you, say a great deal to you, the bluish colors are something that provides the painting with a set transition into form. Through blue we already come into form, in particular into the form-fashioning soul. Artists were on the path toward making such discoveries, but often remained stuck halfway along the path. Many a painting by Sinak therefore seems so unsatisfactory, even though in other ways it can be quite satisfying because blue is handled in just the same way as, let us say, yellow or red, without there being the consciousness that the blue spot of color placed next to the yellow has a totally different value than the red next to the yellow. This seems to be something trivial for anyone who can feel colors, but in a deeper sense we are only starting on the path to the discovery of such secrets. Blue and violet, 
These are colors that definitely lead the painting from the expressive into the inner perspective. And it is definitely possible that merely through the use of blue next to other colors, we could bring about a wonderful perspective in a painting without any sort of drawing. This is how we progress. We come to the realization that drawing can really be what we would call the work of color. If we succeed in transforming the color into movement so that we see the drawing rather mysteriously under the guidance of the color, we will notice that this is particularly possible with blue, less so with yellow or red, because these are not suited to being led in such a way that inner movement arises, that there is movement from one point to another. If we want to create a figure that moves inwardly, that flies, for example, and because of this inner mobility becomes inwardly now smaller, now larger, then we will find ourselves compelled, not by starting with some sort of principle of reason or some kind of learned aesthetic, which is never justified, but by starting from the most elemental feeling, to employ nuances of blue and to lead these over into movement. We will notice that in principle a line can only appear, that drawing only arises, that something figurative can only appear if we continue what we started when we allowed the blue tints to be set into motion. For every time we move from the painterly, the coloristic, into the figurative, the form, we will transform what is sensory into the basic color of the suprasensory. In transitioning to lighter colors, through blue and from there arriving inwardly at drawing, we will have in these lighter colors the transition to the sensory suprasensory, which contains the suprasensory in, so to speak, a narrower tone. For color always wants to say something. Color always has a soul that is suprasensory. And we will find that the more we are involved in drawing, the more do we become involved in the abstract suprasensory, which, however, must fashion itself in a sensory form because it appears in the sensory world. Today I can only give indications for these things, but it is clear that in this way we can perceive how, in a specific area, color and drawing can be applied by artistic creativity in such a way that the application contains what I would like to express in the following words. Nature holds it under enchantment, and we disenchant what is hidden in the sensory through a suprasensory element that has been killed by a higher life. If we look at sculpture, we will find there are always two interpretations for the surfaces as well as for the lines. But I would like to speak about only one interpretation. Firstly, healthy feeling does not allow the sculpted surface to remain as it is in the natural human form, for there it is killed off by the human soul, by human life, by something higher. We must look for the life of the surface itself by first spiritually removing the life or the soul incarnated in the human form. We must look for the soul of the form itself. And then we notice how we find it when we do not allow the surface to have single curves, but rather add another curve to the single curve so that we have a double curve. We notice how we can guide the form so that it speaks. And we notice that deep in our unconscious, in contrast to what I have dealt with now, in a more analytical sense, there is a synesthetic sense. Sensory nature does indeed disintegrate into the pure sensory suprasensory, which is only overcome in higher stages of life. Within the indicated soul boundaries, we have an elementary urge to release nature from enchantment in this way, so as to see how the sensory suprasensory dwells within it in various forms like crystals in a druze, and how because they are in their druze, their surfaces are truncated, 
Read it aside. Druze is spelled D-R-U-S-E. End of readers aside. But the human being also has within himself, sometimes very strongly, especially when this division, this analysis, this release of nature into the sensory, supersensory, is intensively present in his unconscious. That capacity, which I would call synesthesia, a synesthetic sense. What is strange is that whoever observes the human being properly will discover that we use our senses in a very one-sided way. When we see colors, forms, effects of light with the eye, we develop the eye in a one-sided way. In the eye, E-Y-E, there is always something like a mysterious sense of touch. The eye always feels while it sees. In ordinary life, however, this is suppressed. But because the eye forms itself in a one-sided way, we always have the urge, if we can sense it, to experience how what develops in the eye is a sense of touch, a sense of self, a sense of movement, which arises when we move and feel how our limbs move through space, is suppressed. That element of the other senses, which is suppressed in the eye, we experience as stimulated, although it remains standing still, in the other person when we look. And what is thus stimulated in the observed person, but is suppressed by the one-sidedness of the eye, that is what the sculptor remodels again. In fact, the sculptor fashions forms that the eye does indeed see, but so weakly that this weak seeing remains entirely unconscious. The sculptor serves a direct transmission of the sense of touch into the sense of sight. That is why the sculptor is compelled, or at least must attempt, to release the quiet form, which is otherwise the only object of the one-sided eye, into a gesture that always prompts imitation by another gesture. And this gesture, which one has now released from enchantment, must be brought to rest again. For fundamentally, what is animated in one direction and then brought to rest in the other, what is active in us as soul process, whenever we are active artistically or are appreciating art, is on the one hand, always like what happens when the human being breathes in and out. This process, raised up out of the human soul, makes a grotesque impression, although it calls forth, on the other hand, a feeling of the great infinities that are enchanted within nature. The development of art, and this is demonstrated by certain beginnings that have been with us for decades and are especially prevalent now, certainly moves in the direction of unlocking such mysteries and of really forming these things more or less unconsciously. One need not talk about these things a great deal, for they will take form more and more through art. For example, there will come a time when we will sense the following. Indeed, in regard to certain artists, we can say that they have more or less unconsciously sensed something like this. For example, we understand the recently deceased Gustav Klimt especially well if we take into account such preconditions in his feeling, in his understanding. There will come a time when we will sense the following. Let us say we felt the urge to paint a beautiful woman. Then something like a picture of this beautiful woman would have to form itself in the soul. But someone with subtle feelings will sense that at the very moment in which he has made something out of a beautiful woman, he has, in a spiritual, supersensory way, led this beautiful woman from life into death. At the very moment we decide to paint a beautiful woman, we have killed her spiritually. We have taken something from her. Otherwise, we would be able to encounter this woman in life and would not develop what can be artistically developed in the painting. We must first artistically have killed this woman, and then we must be capable of harnessing as much humor as is necessary to bring her to life again inwardly. In fact, a naturalist is unable to do this. Naturalistic art grows ill because it lacks humor. That is why it furnishes us 
with so many corpses, with what in nature is killed by higher life but it lacks the humor necessary to re-enliven what nature has killed in the first process. Even with a comely woman, in her presence we feel not only as if we had mysteriously killed her, but as if we had first mistreated her and only then killed her. That is always a process that moves in one direction, this process of killing, which is connected with the fact that one must recreate what in a higher life overcomes the will for existence in nature. It is always a killing and a bringing back to life through humor that must transpire in artistic creativity and in the appreciation of art. Someone who wants to plant a dashing farm boy up on the alpine pasture is not required to recreate what he sees. Rather, he needs to be clear that what he has grasped as an artistic concept kills the dashing farm boy on the alpine pasture, or at least rigidifies him, and that he must awaken this rigid painting back to life by giving it a gesture that reconnects what has been killed off individually with the rest of nature, thereby giving it a new life. Hodler tried such things. They correspond to the longings of contemporary artists. These two sources of art correspond to the deepest desires, the unconscious desires of the human soul. The fulfillment of what wants to become vision, but must not become vision in healthy human nature, will always lead more or less to the expressionist art form, though we need not pay too much attention to this catchword. And what is created in order to gather together what we have in some form dissolved into sensory suprasensory parts, or from which we have killed the immediate sensory life so as to infuse it with suprasensory life, will become impressionistic art. These two desires of the human soul have always been the sources of art. It is just that through the general evolution of humanity in the immediate past, the first source was pursued expressionistically, the second impressionistically. This will likely develop in larger measure in the future. In the future we will have an artistic feeling when, instead of using the intellectual consciousness, we expand our feelings more and more in these two directions. These two directions, and because of various misunderstandings, this must be emphasized again and again, do not represent something pathological. Pathology will pervade humanity if the movement toward the visionary, within certain limits of elementary natural health, were not satisfied by artistic expressions. Or, if what our unconscious does continually, this dividing of nature into sensory suprasensory components, were not time and again permeated by a higher life, through a truly artistic humor, so that we are able to imitate in our works of art what nature achieves creatively. I thoroughly believe that the artistic process lies deep, very deep in the subconscious, but that under certain circumstances such strong, such intensive conceptions of the artistic process can be meaningful for life, can affect something in the soul that weak conceptions never can namely to be able to really cross over into feeling. When these two sources of art announce themselves feelingly in the human soul, then one will certainly see how healthy Goethe's feeling was at a certain moment of life. Such things are, of course, always one-sided. When he felt that the purely, genuinely artistic element lies in music. He said that music represents the highest in art, as mentioned, it is one-sided, because any art can achieve these heights, but one always characterizes one-sidedly when one makes characterizations. Music represents the highest in art because it is entirely unable to imitate nature, but instead is in its own element both content and form. But every art will become content and form in its own element, if instead of fabrication or clever ideas, 
it wrests secrets from nature through the discovery of the sensory suprasensory in the manner indicated today. I believe, however, that becoming aware of this sensory suprasensory in nature is often a rather secretive process in the soul itself. Goethe himself coined this expression sensory suprasensory, and although he calls this sensory suprasensory a revealed secret, it can only be found when the subconscious forces of the soul are able to immerse themselves entirely in nature. In a manner of speaking, what is a visionary arises in the soul when the suprasensory experience wants to release itself. It rises out of the soul. Whatever can be experienced outwardly as spiritual, outwardly as suprasensory, is experienced by one who can experience spiritually, not by one who has developed vision that refined and purified by spiritual science has become imagination, but by one who has developed intuition. By means of vision, one places the inner, to a certain extent, outside, so that the inner becomes an outer in oneself. In intuition, one goes out of oneself, one steps down into the world. But this stepping down remains unreal if one is not capable of releasing that which nature always keeps enchanted and what it always wants to overcome through a higher life. If then one places oneself into this released nature, then one experiences intuition. These intuitions, insofar as they make themselves felt in art, are certainly related to intimate experiences that the soul can have when it becomes one with things outside of itself. That is why Goethe was able to say about his own rather impressionistic art to a friend of his, I want to tell you something that will clarify the relationship people have to what I have created. My work cannot become popular. Only those who have experienced similar things, who have gone through similar circumstances, will in reality be able to understand my work at all. Goethe already had this artistic feeling, especially in Part Two of Faust, which is still hardly understood. It appears in poetic form. Goethe already had this artistic feeling, leading him to look for the sensory suprasensory by recognizing that part of nature which wants to become a whole beyond itself, which becomes something else through metamorphosis, and then is combined with this other into a product of nature a product that is, however, killed through a higher life. When we penetrate nature in this way, we reach a true reality in a much higher sense than ordinary consciousness believes. Entering into this provides the greatest proof that it is not necessary for art merely to recreate the sensory or suprasensory, merely to express the spiritual, which can err in two directions but rather that art can shape, can express what is sensory in the suprasensory, what is suprasensory in the sensory. Precisely by recognizing the sensory, suprasensory, we are, perhaps in the truest sense of the word, naturalists. And in particular we are naturalists as concerns the sensory, suprasensory, because we can only grasp it if at the same time we are supernaturalists. That is why I believe that genuine artistic experiences will truly shape themselves in the soul in such a way that they can also stimulate artistic understanding, artistic enjoyment, so that we will even to some degree be able artistically within art to live independently and even to develop. In any case, however, this intensive, deeper consideration of the sensory suprasensory and its manifestation in art, will help us understand Goethe's deeply felt words, which arise out of a deep understanding of the world. This was my point of departure, and it is with this that I also want to end. These words seek, in a comprehensive way, to highlight our relationship to art as human beings, precisely at the point where we are able to value art deeply in its relationship to the true suprasensory reality. 
and humanity, because it can never exist without the supersensory, because the sensory alone would die if it did not live in the supersensory, will more and more through its own needs make Goethe's words a reality. Quote, the one to whom nature begins to reveal her open secret feels an irresistible longing for her worthiest interpreter, art. Close quote. The end of lecture 6.2. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com as well. Please consider becoming a patron. And there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art. This is the seventh entry in the, uh, in the book, the third of the lectures. I'm calling this number 7.3, entitled The Sensory Suprasensory in Its Realization Through Art, Part 2, given in Munich on February 17, 1918. There is a very witty man who uttered a remarkable phrase about all human philosophizing. In a recent publication, which considers at length all the impossibilities and uselessness of human philosophizing, he said human beings have no more philosophy than an animal and distinguish themselves from animals only in that they furiously attempt to achieve a philosophy but ultimately have to admit that they are defeated and must lose themselves in ignorance. There is a lot in this book, which is otherwise a book worth reading, that basically collects everything that can be said against philosophy. That is why the man in question became a professor of philosophy at a university. I would like to quote this man with a remark that is concerned with natural science. It is a fairly radical remark. For the gentleman in question says that nature is mysterious in all directions, and that when the human being really perceives these mysteries of nature on all sides, he cannot but realize how endlessly small his own being is. Nature in its infinitude spreads itself out immeasurably, and we ought to feel that we, with our concepts and ideas about nature, stand around gaping. I am quoting, and one can say that This remark is not entirely incorrect, and that when we observe nature, we human beings really do notice how little of what we can grasp in our thoughts. Even when we practice our cleverest natural science, actually reflects the immeasurable mysteries of nature. And if we did not perceive how nature is confronted by the thought, which is not the result of nature alone, but can only be generated in the human soul, If we did not know that this thought corresponds to a human need, if we did not feel in the activity of the thought about nature something of what determines our humanity and our human development, something which we need just as the seed needs the plant, then we would really not know with ripened self-knowledge why we even think about nature. We think about nature for our own sake, and know that when we confront nature in our thoughts, we are actually quite distant from this nature. That is how we feel in observing nature. If we feel ourselves in the presence of the spiritual world, the supra-sensory world, then we have to say this differently. When this supra-sensory life presents itself within us, no matter how insignificant or childish it may appear to be, We feel an inner necessity to express what the Spirit reveals in the soul. And even though we experience the most intense sense of responsibility toward everything we utter about the Spirit, about what we speak out of the Spirit, about what can only be revealed and fostered in the soul, we feel that we must obey this, that we must express this out of an inner necessity just as the child grows or learns to speak. 
Therefore we feel ourselves in opposite conditions in the face of the sensory or the suprasensory. A third aspect is what one could call thinking about or speaking about art. If we want to express ourselves about art, we feel neither the, quote, standing beside nature, close quote, which we always feel when thinking about nature, nor the necessity that comes over us in the presence of inner revelations of the suprasensory. Instead, when we try to express ourselves about art, we have the feeling that we are disturbing ourselves continually with the thought we are developing. In the presence of artistic appreciation, the thought is actually a real troublemaker. And as regards everything related to art, we would again and again like to stop talking and instead appreciate the art silently. If for some reason, however, we do not want to talk about art, then we do not want to do so with the attitude of a professor of aesthetics or even an art critic. Certainly not from the perspective of the art critic, which would be like eating some tasty food and then giving a lecture about why it tasted so good. We only want to talk about our own experiences of art, our joys, what we learned, and so forth. Just as we sometimes like to speak about recent experiences with a dear friend, out of heartfelt depths, not critically, is how we ought to speak about art. And we also ought not to claim something lawful or generally valid when speaking about art, but rather just state our own subjective belief. But it seems to me to be a consistent feeling in relation to any sort of discussion about art that thoughts are a disturbance. And it is precisely this which seems to me to indicate the peculiar nature of art. Inasmuch as we human beings live in the world of the senses, the question might be asked, what is the relationship of art to the world of the senses? And, inasmuch as we can only exhaust our feeling about the world of the senses, if we have a relationship to the suprasensory, we could also ask, what is the relationship of art to the suprasensory. Now, it seems to me that through an elemental feeling that develops in relation to artistic creativity, we quickly have to arrive at the conviction that art is neither able to represent the sensory as it surrounds us, nor to bring the thought to expression. In the presence of the sensory, someone who has a feeling for nature will always have the perception that if one wants to represent it and create a picture of it, one cannot reach nature as such, that nature is always more beautiful and more complete than any representation. In the presence of what is spiritual, poetry about world views or things of that nature attest to this, one will have the feeling that if one wants to represent it, one will describe things that are insipid and superfluous. Poetry about world views have, under all conditions, a pedantic schoolroom character. Any true artistic feeling will actually always reject allegorical symbolism. And so it is just this question about the relationship of art to the sensory and the suprasensory that can seem like a life question. That is why the question arises. Is there something else, apart from the sensory and suprasensory, that has something to do with the essential task of artistic creativity and appreciation? No doubt this is a question we will be able to answer only by really engaging with the sole process of artistic creativity and appreciation, not by describing it through the laws of aesthetics, but through experience. When we stand before the world in an ordinary, sober, let us say for the moment, inartistic manner, we are dealing with sensory perception on the one hand, and on the other hand, with what is engendered by sensory perception in our own soul, namely with our thoughts. A perception such as the one offered by nature, like the demand for art to reproduce a human being, seems to me, for the given reasons, to be something rather impossible and therefore superfluous. 
the desire to reproduce through art the immediate perception of nature actually always arises from certain artistic aberrations. But on the other side, and perhaps this is something remarkable, but we do experience it, and I have already indicated this in reference to discussion about art, it appears thus. In the process of real artistic creativity and appreciation, we make the effort to ignore the thought as best we can, in no way to allow the thought to arise. This seems to me to rest on the fact that in the human soul, processes continually form that either can thrive to the end or will stop at some place or another. We can follow these processes only by descending through spiritual observation into the depths of the soul's life, which remains in the subconscious or unconscious realm for ordinary consciousness. Whoever observes the soul life of the human being will find, at first apart from observation of the outer world, that this soul life, insofar as it continues to develop when we ponder it, to develop freely in the inner life, always has a tendency that can be described in no other way than this. Whatever ebbs and flows in the soul's life as sensing, as restrained will impulse, as feelings, and so on, wants to ascend. And in principle, also in the healthy life of soul, it wants to form itself into what one calls a vision. In life we actually always strive to form the ebb and flow of the soul's depths into vision. Such vision, however, may not come to the surface in the healthy life of soul. It must be replaced. It must be checked as it arises. Otherwise illness arises in the life of soul. In every life of soul, however, strivings to form visions announce themselves. And we go through life continually arresting visions in our subconscious by letting them fade away. That is where observation of the outer picture helps us. If we approach the outer world directly with our seething life of soul, then the outer world dulls what wants to become vision, and the vision fades into a healthy thought. I said that we go through the world continually striving for visions. The corresponding perceptions, however, do not always become conscious in the proper way. But whoever attempts to clarify what resounds softly between the lines of daily life, whoever attempts to observe this will soon see that really all manner of things show up. I have to say, if, for example, I happen to enter someone's dining room and to find there a company of people eating and the plates and bowls were painted red, I would involuntarily believe through an elemental feeling there around the table is a company of gourmets who really want to sink into the enjoyment of the dishes and desserts. If, in contrast, I were to see that there were blue plates and bowls on the tables, then I would believe that they were not gourmets, but that they were eating because they were hungry. Of course, one could also see this differently. That is not the point. The point is that we are always tempted to release an aesthetic feeling by means of things that approach us in life, and then to turn this into a fading vision. Naturally, it is entirely possible to be deeply deluded in this realm. That does not matter. Even if it is not true that one must tell a group eating from red plates that they are gourmets, aesthetically it remains true. One could just as well say, if someone welcomed me into a red room and continually allowed me to talk without saying a word, like a very boring gentleman, then I would say, he is lying to me. For in a red room I await someone who has something to say to me, and I would consider it a profound deception for him to just let me talk and talk. So we are actually always inclined, as we go through life, to raise what we experience to a repressed vision, which then pales beneath the outer impressions of life. Artistic appreciation and creativity always go a step further. Artistic appreciation and creativity cannot let 
what seethes and boils down there in the soul's life, rise up subconsciously into a mere thought. That would be something that would indeed fill us with thoughts, but it would not bring us to something artistic. If, however, we are able as artists, or because the artist approaches us, to take what wants to rise up in the soul, and to arrange something outwardly, I mean an arrangement of color, and if our perception is such that this color arrangement gives us something we need, so that the corresponding rising vision, which, however, must not be allowed to become vision, has an outer complement, then we definitely have something artistic before us. I can well imagine that someone might simply limit himself using some sort of artistic means to express moods of soul and feelings by arranging colors that perhaps do not correspond to any outer object. Perhaps the less they correspond, the better. But that to some extent are the counterpart of what wants to become vision in his soul life. In the copious contemporary discussions about all sorts of artistic things, we have become more aware of such phenomena. And when someone creates something that has nothing to do with outer things and merely has the task I just noted, we speak of expressionistic art. These days it is not frowned upon to assume that what is being prepared as longing in the human being and strives toward a goal corresponds to a fundamental tendency in humanity, namely to make sense perceptible what can only reveal itself spiritually in the soul. If, however, one were to desire to express a thought, something that has already become a pale thought before the visionary stage, through some sort of sensory medium, then one would be inartistic. If one avoids the thoughts and places oneself immediately in the presence of the sensory form, then one has established a relationship between the human being and that which has come about artistically, that through which the thought was stopped. And one can say, that is the essential thing, that art represents neither what is sensory nor what is suprasensory. Instead, it represents the sensory suprasensory. Something where in the sensory there is an immediate counterpart to a suprasensory experience. Neither the sensory nor the suprasensory, but only the sensory suprasensory, can be realized through art. On the other hand, we might ask ourselves how is it possible to have any sort of artistic relationship to nature if it is not possible simply to imitate in art? what we perceive in prosaic life as outer nature. If nature did not include anything but what it offered through outer perception, which stimulates the formation of thoughts, there would be no necessity for the genesis of art. We can only speak of the necessity of artistic creation if more is contained in nature than what comes to light for the imagination, the thoughts, in the completed products of nature which cannot form the bridge in art between the personality and outer nature. But we must also admittedly say, nature has within itself that immensity, that powerful infinitude, which we cannot immediately grasp through our thoughts. Even in its sensory aspect, nature contains the suprasensory. We arrive at the basis for the sensory suprasensory in nature if we observe nature in such a way that we try to reach what exists in nature apart from its sensory impressions. Now, I would like to give an example. When standing before a human being, we can direct our attention to the human form, to how the incarnadine reveals itself in the human form, to how, through the outer form, the soul announces itself in physiognomy and facial expressions we can trace how all of life is really imbued by outer form. We can certainly do that. But even if we wanted to reproduce everything that is part of a human being, we could not, as previously mentioned, arrive at nature. For it is still inartistic 
to want simply to reproduce an outer object of nature. Anyone who seeks a mimetic copy of the outer world in a work of art is confessing from the beginning these things need to be expressed radically that he desires not a work of art but an illusion. And there is yet another thing. We must say, if we follow what is expressed in the human form, then what appears there as form is killed through everything else that lives in it, through the tone that comes directly from life, through the soul content. And that is the secret of nature, that it is so endless in its detail that each detail withstands being killed through something superior. But if we have a sense for this, we can awaken, out of its own being, what has been killed. What is killed in the human form by the higher life, killed through being permeated by the soul, can be so enlivened that the form itself now becomes a living being without harboring, in itself, life and soul content. For example, as sculptors, we ourselves can provide the form for what we need to use because we are working in materials. We realize that nature is so powerfully infinite that in every one of its details it hides endlessly more than it reveals. When it places a form before us, it kills the inner life of that form. Life is enchanted within it, and we can break its spell. When in nature something that is colored presents itself to us, we can be sure that the object's color has been killed through something else. If I take just the color itself, then I can awaken something out of the color that has nothing to do with what the color is in the object. I create a life out of the color, a life that only lies enchanted in the color when the color appears on the surface of a natural object. In this way, it is possible to break the spell of enchanted life in everything that appears to us in nature, it is possible to release what exists in nature and its intense infinitude, to release it everywhere, out of this nature, and never to create imitations of nature, but to break the spell of what has been killed in nature through something higher. When we speak of these things, or try to speak of these things, we are tempted to speak in paradoxes, but that, I believe, does not matter, because these extreme radical cases can show how things actually function in less radical cases. Just as I can, on the one hand, think that when the artistic element is worked out of the inner being through the stem division, and I create the counter-image in forms and lines and colors, these lines and colors may be so composed that they reflect nothing other than the restrained vision. So, on the other hand, I can say, it seems possible to me that I can create something living out of a natural being, let us say, a human being in which life itself has been killed, making it a corpse, by re-enlivening the corpse artistically through something I extract out of the common universal element. Such extreme cases are not required, it is, however, possible, as a borderline case, that when nature has already killed a being, a new creation, even if it is the corpse, can come into being, because something which is very different from what the human being is himself, with his soul being, can be added in order to imbue the form with soul. I could well imagine that a bewitching work of art might come about because a corpse sprouts forth new life that reflects these secrets, which exist in relation to the human being and are hidden only because until his death the human being actually contains his soul being in himself. We need not stumble on account of such borderline cases. It is, after all, a borderline case. It can clarify that artistic creativity in the presence of outer nature, can be effective. For actually, even if not driven to be a borderline case, artistic creativity and appreciation continually proceed in this way. Art is a continual redemption. 
of mysterious life, which cannot be in nature itself, but must be extracted from it. I confront in the human form a product of nature that has been killed, but I attempt to awaken the life of this form, and although the form is just a dead form, to awaken the entire human being out of this form. Genesis tells us that the human being emerged from the breath of God, that the human soul was breathed into him. That could lead one to see more in the air than just the combination of oxygen and nitrogen. It could mislead one to see in the air something of what awakens the human soul, something soulful. It could mislead one into believing that this air breathed in by the human being longs fundamentally to become a soul. One might be able to see in the air the counter-image of what is human soulfulness, In other words, more than something merely lifeless, a longing toward the human being. But it is the case that having such a perception about the air will be very difficult, because air and fire do little to inspire artistic formation. No one will actually want to paint fire, just as little as lightning, nor will anyone want to draw the air. So as far as the air is concerned, we will not easily come to this feeling. But it seems to me that a true artistic feeling about the worlds of light and color can come to this feeling. We really can have this feeling in the presence of the world of light and color. Every color, or at least the relationships among the colors, have the longing to become either a whole human being or part of a human being. As part of the human being, either they find themselves as an inner expression of his being, or the light illuminates him and is reflected. But we can say that if one lives in the light itself, then one lives in the longing of the air to form itself, for example, into a human face. We can have the feeling red and yellow want something, They want to form themselves into something that is part of the human being. They have a language that is inherent within them. Then we will not attempt merely to reproduce the human being in a prosaic way. In any event, it must become an ideal of artistic creativity to become liberated from the model. Whoever does not overcome the model, the moment he begins to create, whoever does not view it as something that guides him in how to eavesdrop on the secrets of nature, will remain dependent on the model and create mere illustrations. On the other hand, someone with artistic feeling will be tempted to form a human being or some other being or natural form out of the color. For such a person, color will be able to achieve an inwardly differentiated life. We will find that red and yellow are such that they tempt us to use them where we want something to come to expression, to speak through itself. What faces us in red, in yellow, will express itself on its own, will generate through its own strength the ideal of art, namely to exclude the thought. Blue and violet are different when they face us. There it is more a matter of having the feeling that blue and violet, at least in one direction, come near the thought. We will have the feeling that we cannot represent with blue or violet something that expresses its own nature, but rather something that expresses another thing besides itself. We will be tempted to represent the blue according to our own inwardness by showing it in movement. And we will experience that it is difficult to bring forth an inner movement in the object by using any kind of red lines. Red is much more likely, I would say, to give rise through lines, through shading, to physiognomy. Red will speak through itself. Blue, if we transpose it into lines, will divulge its inner nature, will lead us more under the surface of the color than in an outward direction. If something expresses itself as color, we have the feeling that the color pushes us back. Blue leads us under the surface of the color. We think that 
in what comes to expression in the blue, movement and development of will are possible. It will be fruitful to use blue in painting a purely sensory, suprasensory being, meaning a suprasensory being that we want to place into the sense world, and to express its inner mobility with nuances of blue. In that way we can break the spell of whatever approaches us in nature as an individual part, whatever has been killed in nature through a higher life. We can find the sensory, suprasensory itself in nature. We can enliven the mere form. We will find that a satisfactory impression can never really be made if we simply reproduce the human form as it is in the human being in a sculptural artwork. Once, many years ago, I had a strange experience with a friend who became a sculptor. He told me at the time, both of us were very young people, quote, Yes, you see, one would accomplish the right sculptural work of art by exactly imitating each individual change in the surface. I have to admit that this utterance made me wild, for it seemed to me that this was the path to the very most horrible artistic achievement. For in any case, if we want to reveal in the stone or wood what the human form has as form, what it is in him that kills life through something higher, without this inner life, then we would have to enliven it. The surface must be called upon to express what it never can express in the outer nature of the human being. We will find, for example, that if we curve a surface and then curve it again so that the curved part is bent again, we have the simplest archetypal phenomenon of the inner life. A surface that is curved in this way, so that the curve is curved again, can be used in the most varied ways. And of course this needs to be further developed. The inner life of the surface will emerge from the surface. Such things prove to us that there is a relationship between outer nature and the human inner realm, which in truth has the character of the sensory suprasensory. We recognize the thought formation of outer nature when this outer nature kills off through something higher what otherwise holds a higher spiritual life under enchantment. Thus we are forced to grasp the dead life by means of a dry thought. If we avoid this pale thought and attempt to grasp what lies enchanted in the individual parts of nature, and try on our own to carry out the process of gathering it together, of giving it a higher life, then we experience the process of artistic creation or artistic appreciation. The relationship of these two is simply that what is later for the first is earlier for the second, and what is earlier for the second is later for the first. If we follow this method of observation, that is directed toward the intense infinitude of nature, toward the possibility of breaking the spell of the secrets of nature, of what it represents in the soul life of the human being, then we must say, the pale world of thought is not called forth in this way. What is freed from enchantment in this way is lighter than what the mere thought can grasp. It again provides a connection between the outer object and the human soul, a connection in which thought is eliminated, but in which there is, nevertheless, a striving for a spiritual relationship between the human being and the object. Of course, this can proceed further, and there we come to what can today seem to be really absurd, even horrible to many people. This is understandable, but people have always taken as horrible what they later take for granted once they have gotten used to it. If you observe someone, you need only consider his skeleton. A merely superficial observation will reveal that the skeleton consists of two radically different members. The rest we will not consider today. First, the skull, which is, so to speak, just set atop the skeleton. And second, the rest of the body of the skeleton. For someone who has a sense for form, not through anatomical observation, but through a feeling perception of skull and skeleton. 
it becomes evident that the one is a metamorphosis of the other, that we can think of the form of the main bones in such a way that wherever there is a bump, the bone could expand. And on the other hand, wherever there is an expansion, it could contract. Through metamorphosis alone, we really can, through the change of forms, have the skull arise out of the body of the skeleton, and to a high degree have the body of the skeleton arise out of the skull. Thus we can say, the entire human being is enchanted within the head. Even if we are confronted by a skeleton without a head, we will be tempted, if we do not want to be stuck in the sensory observation, to supplement this skeleton with a head in a sensory, suprasensory way. We will be tempted to have the vision of the head arise from the skeleton. There are people who cannot imagine this. But it is impossible that in nature somehow the skeleton of the human torso came about without the skull. For someone who does not confront nature merely with abstract conceptions, but rather carries the being of nature in his own feeling perception and senses objects in nature only as they must be sensed, it will be obvious that the skull must arise like a vision out of the body of the skeleton. But for one who sees through such things, it must follow that if he has only the head, and as if in a vision adds the entire human being, this human being will be different than if vice versa he adds the other. It is similar and yet different. Thus we can say, In outer nature the human being is created as a whole, which consists of a division into head and the rest of the organism. But each individual part wants to be a whole human being. In a higher whole, that life is killed, which is enchanted in each individual part as a whole human being. If we exclude this thought that rises up when we face a human being, then we must supply the human being with what we take from him when we analyze him out of our own inwardness. And in this way we are building nature creatively, as nature builds itself. We achieve this endlessly intensive, meaningful process of unifying, which must first be killed in its parts, so as to reappear at a higher stage. And of course it is different when we produce it in the spirit. I believe this already calls forth a certain horror. In Dornach, in our building, we tried, when can try things in any sphere, for it should never be a case of wanting to limit art because of some sort of dogma, with a group that was to be sculpted in wood. It is important that it be sculpted in wood, for it would not be possible with stone. First of all, in a central figure, we tried to unify on a higher plane what is also unified in the human being through nature or once again the parts are killed through something higher. Every human being is asymmetrical, but we can feel what in the left side wants to become something quite different from the right. Thus, two people stand before us, the left person and the right person. What is specialized in the left person and the right person is unified in nature into a higher whole by killing the willfulness of the parts. In artistic observation, which confronts the will of nature, there arises again, I might put it like this, the complete form of the left person and the right person. Fundamentally, they both want something different. And the artist must, this can stay very much in the unconscious, relive the process that nature completes on a different plane when it kills the left person and the right person and balances them out in the whole human being. If we really create an artistic form in which there is the indication that the human being is an asymmetrical being, then something else must be added. When the sensory, suprasensory is perceived, it makes it necessary to include the necessary parts. That is why we had to create other figures. We were obliged to compensate for the disintegration and reunification of the left person and the right person by hinting at the two polarities. 
What is it that lives in the human being as a vision if we consider the human torso as it becomes a whole human being? For there would live in the outer form what rises from the torso into the head as urges and instincts, which we could call luciferic. We will want to form what is luciferic differently than nature does. For example, we will transform the shoulder blades into wings. Then we will in turn be tempted to combine these wings with the form of the ear and head, which constricts nature. Something different from a normal, natural human being will result from these sensory, suprasensory human parts. But it will represent a particular aspect of the human being, an aspect that we should not represent individually. It would be gruesome if someone were to play such a figure on its own. But in the context of the human being and brought into the right composition with the human being, it can be composed in such a way that we can imitate the compositional power of nature. We must also copy in the opposite way what wants to become a whole human being in the human head, what wants to become an entire human being in the human head that will be calcified, hardened. That is what we continually have to overcome in ourselves, what we do actually overcome when we add impulses effectively from the rest of our organism to those which we carry in our head, impulses that keep the hardening fresh. We have to overcome what is head by what originates in the heart organism as blood. There the sensory, suprasensory constitution of the human being provides the possibility of observing in the separate forms what nature itself composes in a hidden way on another plane. In actuality, what we could call a process of creative imitation, a process in the human soul, becomes something that nature does not only imitate abstractly, outwardly, but that the development of nature itself carries out in the human being. This presupposes that the artist and the appreciator of art confront nature and themselves in a very complicated manner that remains in the unconscious because the thought is stopped. This is understandable. We must really say, as far as the soul is concerned, we are in a very complicated process with what ought to become artistic. If someone really wanted to reproduce a beautiful woman, then by only imitating what nature provides, he would kill this woman inwardly. He would represent her as dead. She would not be alive in him, especially if he reproduces her very faithfully. We must be able first to transform her into a corpse, but then, which is really true humor, recreate her beauty out of an entirely different element. Without, metaphorically speaking, killing a beautiful woman pictorially, we must really first somehow turn her into something dead. We cannot draw her properly. Her beauty is present in nature, through something quite different than it must be in a finished work of art. We must first discover through humor what will newly create that which we must actually kill. We could say, if we sit opposite an earnest scholar and make a copy of him, then the copy will first be a joke. Perhaps we will be tempted to laugh at his earnest expression. But we will only be finished artistically with the earnest scholarly expression if we bring it to life again through something else in a humorous way. We will in turn have to do this lovingly and will then understand it from an entirely different perspective. It is therefore a matter of resuscitation, of breaking the spell, of redeeming through our own subjective life what is killed in nature. If I were to observe a dashing young farm boy walking through the alpine meadow and simply reproduce him, I would probably create something very dead. But if I make the effort to, so to speak, kill him first, and then through the lines I draw, bring about harmony between him and surrounding nature, I will create something artistic. Hodler tried such things, and we can see that in the subconscious similar things are attempted everywhere. 
This led to artistic discussions about what can be called, on the one hand, the creation of the counter-image for the unfinished vision, and on the other hand, the creation of the subjective counter-image through what is enchanted in nature and continually killed through a higher life. Thereby the sensory suprasensory nears the human being from two sides. Thereby the human being can try to bring this to a higher new existence in art. In my earlier lectures on this theme, I tried to connect these thoughts about how the sensory suprasensory can realize itself through art to certain thoughts of Goethe. This was held against me, and I now notice that I have been able to speak here without reference to Goethe. All sorts of complaints are raised just when one refers to Goethe, because people who consider themselves to be especially close to Goethe think that if they repeat something of his that they do not understand, they can make judgments about those others who take the trouble to penetrate the matter. We can understand these things. It is a natural process in human life. And we sometimes have to be downright happy when something we say is subject to such judgment. We could even have the point of view, if someone else has experienced a confirming judgment, then we must have said something really superfluous or stupid. What I have been able to avoid here, I do at least want to bring forward at the end. I truly believe that anyone who approaches Goethe with understanding will find in his broad-minded and sound observation of art, although perhaps expressed differently, what today was described as the sensory suprasensory element of art. Even the expression is borrowed from Goethe. And I believe, although I am certainly of the opinion that in a certain sense it is correct for someone who has experienced art's secrets to possess a fairly unspoken antipathy toward the intellectual criticism of art or aesthetic scientific observation, I believe that art can only be talked about from the standpoint of life, that the artists themselves have the most correct way of talking about art. Admittedly, this can sometimes lead to remarkable experiences. As a general rule, artists grumble terribly about what the other artists create. And though one may enjoy the artist's works of art, one does not always enjoy what the artists say about their artworks, because they occasionally live in delusion about their own works of art. But the artist really must create out of illusion, and it is just this which might be right, which provides the right impulse for his artistic creativity. Even if I admit all of this, and if from a particular point of view I understand that the artist is really always fairly aloof from everything that approaches him as pandering from the side of aesthetic, scientific, or other such observation, I nevertheless do not believe that it is entirely unnecessary to form feeling-like ideas about art. I believe that art must always progress along with the general progress of the soul's life. I believe that it is just through this consideration of the sensory suprasensory as it forms itself out of the restrained vision as it appears to us out of outer nature when we free it from its enchantment that art solves the riddles of nature in a sensory suprasensory way. Thus, in conclusion, I want to summarize today's considerations by quoting this beautiful worldly utterance of Goethe, The one to whom nature begins to reveal her open secret feels an irresistible longing for her worthiest interpreter, art. The end of lecture 7.3 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, It can be heard at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com as well. Also, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner to English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art. This is the uh, lecture 8.4. It's the fourth of eight lectures, 
and the eighth section in the book. There's essays and lectures in this book. Translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. It's entitled The Sources of Artistic Imagination and Supra Sensory Knowledge. Part 1, given in Munich on May 5th, 1918. Since ancient times, human beings have felt the connection between artistic imagination and supra-sensory knowledge, that which we can call visionary consciousness, or if the term is not misunderstood as is easily possible, clairvoyance. For the spiritual researcher of today, who attempts to penetrate into the spiritual world from today's perspective, this relationship between artistic creation and supra-sensory knowledge is much more meaningful than the more frequently emphasized relationship between visionary life, which is fundamentally based on pathological conditions, and clairvoyance that truly lives only in the soul without the help of the body. Now, we know that poets and artists in general often feel a very close relationship between their whole way of working between their experience on the one hand and clairvoyance on the other. Artists, especially those who seek a path into suprasensory realms in their work, writers of fairy tales or others who work artistically in an attempt to embody the suprasensory, speak, justifiably and out of a living reality, about how they see the figures they create standing before them, how the figures move and act before them, making a real objective impression on them when they concern themselves with these figures. As long as this confrontation with what one recasts into an artistic form does not rob the soul of its clarity, as long as it does not pass over into compulsive visions over which the human will and the mind's clarity have no control, so long can one still speak of a kind of borderline event between artistic intuition and clairvoyance. In the realm of spiritual scientific research, there is a very definite border, and this is the important thing, between clairvoyance and artistic creativity, together with its source, artistic imagination. Whoever cannot see this border clearly, or cannot make it fruitful for his own life, will easily end up where many who came to me as artists ended up, who had a certain fear of being harmed by their own work, because something of the visionary penetrated their consciousness. There are people who have a genuinely artistic nature, but find it necessary for their artistic work to allow impulses to arise out of their subconscious or unconscious soul who then shrink back as if faced with fire, afraid that something of a suprasensory reality that stands before the lucid consciousness might shine into their unconscious creative work. There is a great difference, subjectively, in their relationship to the experience of artistic enjoyment, reception and understanding, and the experience of the suprasensory world through suprasensory sight. Artistic creativity, reception and viewing allow the soul within which they develop to direct the personality to the outer world with the help of outer perception and with the help of visualization, which then becomes memory. We need only recall the characteristics of all artistic creativity and enjoyment to be able to say, certainly in artistic receptivity, And also in artistic work, there is perception and sensory understanding of the outer world. It is not present in as crude a form as it otherwise is in sensory manifestations. It is a spiritual understanding and creativity, which freely interacts with perception and visualization and with what lives in the artist as recollection and the content of his memory but we would be unable to debate about the justification of naturalism and individualism if we did not know about this dependence on perception. In the same way, we can convince ourselves that hidden memories, elements that lie unconscious in the soul and constitute human memory, 
contribute to artistic work and enjoyment. All of this disappears in the true suprasensory knowledge of modern spiritual research. For there we are concerned with a complete withdrawal of the soul from sensory perception, as well as from the usual visualization and whatever is connected as memory with this visualization. Yes, the big difficulty lies in convincing contemporaries that there is something like an inner experience that excludes perception and ordinary conceptions and memories. Especially the naturalist will not admit that this could be the case. He will always claim, you say that nothing flows into your clairvoyance. I see that you are mistaken. You do not know how hidden content lies dormant in your memory and then cunningly rises up. This happens because those who raise such objections do not concern themselves with the methods by which clairvoyance is achieved and which show that the impression of the spiritual world can be directly present without being influenced by reminiscences or hidden memories. Schooling depends precisely on this that we find a way to free the soul of outer impressions and ideas based on memories. Thereby a solid border has been made between artistic creativity and the production of suprasensory knowledge. For the soul, the human eye, capital, in which suprasensory knowledge lives, really does not make use of the bodily organization, which does, however, play a role in artistic creativity. But because this is the case, the question that arises all the more is what is the relationship between that which arises from subconscious soul depths as impulses that weave into artistic creativity and enjoyment, and that which comes out of the purely spiritual world through direct, immediate impressions born of suprasensory knowledge? To answer this question, I would like to consider several experiences of art that the seer himself has. These experiences with art are generally characteristic right from the beginning. It becomes apparent that if we have learned to stand in the suprasensory life, to collect suprasensory knowledge, then we actually become capable of excluding for certain periods of time all sensory impressions and pictures remaining in the memory that connect to these impressions. Now, if someone who is standing within this suprasensory sight then also tries to clearly grasp, in relation to a work of art, everything that he is used to grasping in relation to an outer sensory phenomenon, an entirely different experience arises. In the presence of a sensory phenomenon, the seer is always able to exclude sensory perceptions and inner pictures stemming from memory. But this is not the case in the presence of works of art. The seer always retains an important inner content of the artwork that he neither can nor intends to exclude, in spite, of course, of excluding all sensory and memory impressions. The work of an art offers something that proves to be related to his clairvoyance. Then the question arises, what is the basis for this relationship? We realize this if we attempt to grasp what is active in the human being when he sees purely spiritually in suprasensory knowledge. Then we recognize the inadequacy of the ideas we human beings have about ourselves and our relationship to the outer world when we remain in our ordinary consciousness. We believe that our ideas, feelings, and will are strictly separated from one another. Psychology does indeed point out the interrelatedness of these activities, but not skillfully enough. Someone who experiences the complexities of soul life as they are present in vision knows that such a differentiation between thinking, feeling, and willing does not actually exist. Instead, in ordinary consciousness and life, There is, in thinking, always a residue of feeling and willing, in feeling a residue of thinking and willing, and in every willing a residue of thinking and even of perception. Willing retains a hidden unconscious residue of perception. 
This needs to be kept in mind if we want to understand clairvoyance. For from what has previously been said, you can see that thinking and perception are silenced in spiritual sight, but that feeling and willing are not silenced. Yet it would not be clairvoyance if the person developed feeling and willing as happens in ordinary consciousness. On the contrary, when the person passes over into a state of spiritual sight, all willing, as it exists in ordinary life, must be silenced. The person enters a state of complete calm. What is meant here by clairvoyance is not to transport oneself restlessly into the spirit world, as, for example, in the case of dervishes. Instead, what is meant is the complete silencing of everything that expresses itself in ordinary life as willing, or as the force of emotional feelings. In everything the human being lets flow into action out of his willing, there still lives something of an emotional feeling. This feeling also in reference to the revelation of willing must be silenced. But it is not the emotional feeling as such that is silenced, and, above all, not the impulse of the willing. Perception and thinking are silenced, but the impulse of the emotional feeling and willing are justified. Only they pass over into a condition of soul stillness and therefore develop the character of their perceiving and thinking in a different way than usual. If we were to remain at the mere feeling or at a falsely mystical inner expression of willing, we would not be able to enter the spiritual world. But in the condition of soul stillness, what is otherwise emotional feeling and impulse of will expresses itself spiritually. Feeling and willing express themselves in such a way that they appear before the soul as objective, powerful, thought-like spiritual beings, while the remaining perceptions and ideas that otherwise go unnoticed in feeling and willing are revealed and become capable of entering the spiritual world. Once we have grasped how, as seers, we live in feeling and willing, in the way that human beings usually live in thinking and perception, not in unclear thinking and feeling, not in nebulous mysticism, but as lucidly as otherwise in ideas and perceptions, then we can understand art fruitfully admittedly in such a way that we only then come to realize the worthlessness of such summaries as are expressed through the word art. Art comprises very different realms, architecture, sculpture, music, poetry, painting, and more. And we could say if we wanted to establish the relationship among the various arts using the seer's experience, the concrete differences among the arts would appear much more meaningfully than the way they do when philosophy combines them under the name art. By achieving the possibility of experiencing the thought content of the world and the spiritual content of the world with help of thinking that has been transformed into emotional feeling and willing, we achieve a remarkable relationship to architecture. I have said that ordinary thinking and perception are not present in clairvoyance, but a completely different thinking arises, one which flows out of feeling and willing. It is a conceptualization that is actually a thinking in forms, which through thinking could directly represent forms of the distribution of forces in space, relationships of dimensions in space. This thinking feels itself to be related to what comes to expression in architecture and sculpture, when these represent truly artistic structures. We feel our thinking and perception to be particularly at home in architecture and sculpture, because the abstract, shadowy thinking, so beloved today, ends, is silenced, and a concrete thinking begins. It cannot but transform its content into spatial forms, moving spatial forms, stretching, overarching, bending forms, in which the will that flows into the world comes to expression. The seer is obliged not to grasp what he wants to know in the spiritual world, 
with the kind of thinking used by the rest of science. That would not provide spiritual knowledge. It is mere illusion to think we have spiritual knowledge. For with ordinary thinking we cannot penetrate into the spiritual world. Whoever wants to penetrate the spiritual world must, as a thinker, have what creates its own sculptural or architectural, but also living, forms. Thus we realize that the artist enters into an experience of unconscious forms. These forms strive upward, fill his soul, turn themselves into ordinary ideas that allow themselves partly to be worked out. They are transformed into what is then artistic form. The architect and sculptor are transitional elements for what the seer experiences as ideas and perceptions in the spiritual world. What the seer grasps in his life of thought and perception slips into the organization of the architect. Deep down in the soul life, it rises up in waves and becomes conscious. This is how the architect and sculptor create their forms. The difference is just this. The essential form-giving aspects underlying architectural and sculptural creations come up out of subconscious impulses, whereas the seer discovers these impulses as that which he needs in order to grasp the great relationships in the spiritual world. Just as one ordinarily has ideas and perceptions, so the seer has to develop skills that point to what imbues and enlivens the world structure. And what he as seer sees through and lives into, this lives in an unconscious way in the architect and sculptor, penetrating their artistic creativity. Someone familiar with supra-sensory experiences who seeks a relationship to the musical and poetic arts will have a different type of experience. In this case, the seer will, bit by bit, feel his inner life completely differently from his ordinary consciousness, which conceives and perceives the outer world. He feels himself to be within his feeling and will. Whoever can practice self-observation knows that it is only in feeling and willing that we are in ourself. But it is precisely this feeling and willing that the seer lifts out of himself. And because this feeling and willing provide him with ideas and perceptions, he takes leave of himself in his feeling and willing. But something else appears in their stead. He finds himself again. By having the distinct consciousness that he has stepped out of his body and does not perceive anything with the help of his body, he finds himself again in the outer world and intuitively goes over into what is, he has perceived in the moving forms and has shaped into ideas. He carries his own self into the outer world. By doing so he learns, so to speak, to say to himself, by passing through experiences inwardly, it becomes clear that I have stepped out of my body, which was always the mediator of my relationship to the outer world, but I have found myself again by submersing myself in the spiritual world. When this becomes inner experience, the seer finds that he must receive his willing and feeling from the spiritual world again in order to receive himself again out of the suprasensory world. He must do this while a feeling and willing, but a transformed feeling and willing, that do not resort to the body for help, now become his. A feeling that is inwardly related to the experience of music, that is, indeed, so related to the experience of music that we could say it is even more musical than the comprehension of music itself. This feeling is akin to flowing out into tones with our soul nature, into a symphony or some other piece of music, as if we were becoming melody, becoming vibration. With poetry, we are within willing. This is what poetry demands, that by rediscovering our willing, we learn to perceive true poetry. Feeling is musical. Willing is in true poetry. Painting presents a very unique and special case for the seer. In this case, neither the one nor the other sets in. 
Instead, something different, more characteristic arises. In the presence of genuine painting, the seer has the feeling, and he might himself be a painter, for we will hear that artistic creativity and suprasensory knowledge can exist side by side, that the painter approaches him from an indeterminate part of the world, bringing him a world of line and color, and the seer approaches from the opposite direction toward the painter and must take what the painter brings, whatever of the outer world he has put into his art, and place it as imagination into what he, the seer, experiences in the spiritual world. But the colors the seer experiences are not the same as those of the painter, and yet they are the same. They do not conflict. To understand this, you might consider the sensory-ethical part of Goethe's color theory about the moral effect of colors. It contains the most basic aspect. There, the feeling effects of individual colors within the soul are described with an inner instinct. Clairvoyance reaches this feeling from out of the spiritual world, this feeling that we really experience every day in the higher world. We should not think that the seer, in describing colorful auras, is speaking as the artist speaks of colors. He experiences the feeling that we otherwise experience in the presence of yellow and red, but it is a spiritual experience and should not be confused with physical visions. The worst misunderstandings revolve around this point. For the seer, the experience of art can be designated as an encounter with something similar approaching from the opposite direction. Agreement is possible because the same thing comes from the outside that has been created from the inside. Parenthesis, I always assume that we are dealing with artistic creativity, with which agreement is possible, in that it is preceded by art and not naturalism. Close parenthesis. To put it crudely, the seer must imagine, must illustrate what happens. This happens by having him express in colors and forms what he experiences. There he encounters the painter, and it has to be said again that if he were to ask the painter what their relationship is, then the painter would have to answer, Something lives in me. By having gone through the world with ordinary eyes, transforming into art the colors and forms I saw, I experienced something that earlier on surged in the depths of my soul. It rose into consciousness and became art. The seer would then say to the painter, that which lives in the depths of your soul lives in the things. By passing through these things, you live with your soul within the spirit of the things. Now it is necessary, in order to conserve strength for painting and to experience what you experienced, while passing consciously among the things outside, so that you do not extinguish what approaches your senses, it is necessary to keep the impulses that create painting alive in the subconscious. It is a matter of having the unconscious impulses now surge up into consciousness. The seer says, I went about in the same world, but paid attention to what it is that lives in you. I observed what took place in your subconscious, brought what was subconscious in you to consciousness. It is precisely in this kind of understanding that something which is usually not properly observed will arise in considering the great meaningful problems of the human soul. When we have an inner experience of what has just been characterized, then something approaches that deeply moves us. It is the mystery of incarnadine, this wonderful human flesh color, which is actually a big problem for clairvoyance. It hints at the fact that the clairvoyance I am talking about is not entirely unknown and foreign in ordinary life. It just is not noticed. I would like to utter the paradoxical but true phrase, every human being is clairvoyant, but it is denied, even when, in a practical sense, it cannot be denied. If we were to deny it in a practical sense, all of life would be disturbed. 
Today there are peculiar people who think, how do I come to have a stranger standing before me? They want to remain entirely in the realm of naturalism, want to remain true naturalists, so they say. I have stored the oval face and other features in my memory, and because various experiences have shown me that in such features a human being lies hidden, I can conclude that behind the form of the nose there is a human eye, capital. We can find such arguments amongst the so-called rational people, in quotes, but that does not correspond to the experiences we have if we observe life from the perspective of our own participation in life. I do not conclude something about the I, capital, because of the shape of the face. I am conscious of an I, because the perception of that which appears before me as a physical human being is based on something different from the perception of a crystal or a plant. It is not true that inanimate, natural bodies make the same impression as a human being does. It is different with an animal. The sensory human object standing before us raises itself, makes itself spiritually transparent, and by means of true clairvoyance we see, whenever a human being is present, his eye. That is the true fact. Such clairvoyance consists of nothing but the following. We take the way in which we stand in our own subjective nature in the presence of a human being and expand it throughout the world so as to see whether there is something else that we can see through in the same way as we see through the human being. We really cannot get a true impression of clairvoyance without taking into consideration the basis for the differentiated understanding of the other human being. For this understanding is based on the clairvoyant perception of the other soul. Incarnadine plays a special role in such clairvoyance. When the human being is seen outwardly, this incarnadine appears finished. For one who sees spiritually, the incarnadine changes in the experience of being observed. It is an intermediary stage. It results when clairvoyance, which is spread across the other realms of the world, is directed at the human form, so that the quiet incarnadine swings between the polarities and the middle. We perceive paleness and blushing. The latter is like a raying out of warmth. The middle is present in the perception of paleness and blushing. Connected with such an experience of the being and movement is the knowledge that we are diving into the outer being of the human being, not just his soul, but into his eye. We dive down into what he is in his body because of his soul, because of his incarnadine. This leads us into the relationship between artistic understanding and supersensory knowledge. For what becomes so malleable in the inner grasping of incarnadine lies unconscious in the artistic creativity of the incarnadine. The artist need only be subtly aware of this. Nevertheless, only by seeking this experience will the artist be able to place fine, living vibrations into the center of the incarnadine. So, we see how in painting sources of artistic imagination collide with suprasensory knowledge. They collide in ordinary life, even if one does not notice it, in the realm of language. Nowadays, language is usually considered also scientifically in a very intellectual manner. But the life of language is present in us in a threefold way. Whoever approaches language clairvoyantly and has to express what he perceived in the spirit world first acquires a perception in relation to language, which one might well call insane. When people talk amongst themselves, even when they are involved in science, everything they say is a degradation of language, below the level on which language ought to stand. Language as mere means of, for communication is a degradation. We perceive that language lives in its own being, where poetry flows through language, where what arises out of the human inner life flows through language. 
then the spirit of language is itself at work. The poet actually first determines where the level of language is and experiences ordinary speech as neglecting the higher level of speech. We can feel why a sensitive poet like Morgenstern would remark that a lower limit of language is actually perceptible and that it is quite widespread, this limit, which we can call idle chatter. He finds that chatter has its origin in ignorance of the sense and value of the individual word, that the chatterer manages to take the word out of its firm contours and to make it obscure. Morgenstern feels that this expresses a deep secret of life. He says, language takes revenge on the obscurer, on the obscured. Because he was able to bridge poetry and clairvoyance, this statement is just as comprehensible as when he finds the affinity between tone, picture, architecture, and so forth. This same affinity was, after all, the basis of all of Goethe's creativity. For a time in his life he did not know whether he should become a poet or a sculptor. The clairvoyant, however, experiences the content of spiritual experience outside the realm of speech. It is difficult to make this clear because most people think in words, but the clairvoyant thinks wordlessly and must then pour what is a wordless experience into the fixed language. He must adjust to the formal conditions of language. He need not experience this as coercion, for he reaches behind where the mystery of language creation exists. He can make himself understood by stripping away the common intellectual aspect of language. That is why it is so important to grasp that how the clairvoyant speaks is more important than what he says. What he says is determined by the conception that everyone brings in from the outside. It is necessary, if he is not to be considered a fool, that what he says be clothed in feasible sentences and conceptual associations. For the highest realms of spirit, how the clairvoyant says something is important. We gain a proper understanding of this if we note the how, if we note how the clairvoyant is careful to say some things briefly, others more broadly, and still others not at all. That he must formulate a sentence from one side and then another from the other side. The structural aspect is important to the higher parts of the spiritual world. That is why it is less important for comprehension to listen to the mere content, which is, of course, also important as revelation from the spiritual world, than it is to penetrate through the content to the manner in which the content is expressed and so to see whether the speaker is merely coupling sentences and theories or whether he speaks from experience. Speaking from the spiritual world becomes visible in the how of what is said, not so much in the content insofar as it is of a theoretical character, but rather in how it is expressed. It is possible, in the case of such communications out of the forms of language, for the artistic element of speech to work into what inspires the seer to raise himself up to the process of speech creation in such a way that he recreates something of what was present when speech arose out of the human organism. What, then, is the basis for what appears in clairvoyant consciousness, for what lives into the spiritual world through artistic creativity, for what lives in artistic imagination, unconsciously and subconsciously. Naturally, artistic creativity is conscious, but the impulses, the drive, must remain in the unconscious so that artistic creativity is free from bias. Only someone who knows that for certain reasons ordinary human consciousness is designed for something other than entering into the fullness of the world will be able to understand what this is about. Our ordinary consciousness tends, on one side, toward observing nature. But what it delivers is the result of our concepts, which do not penetrate 
into the realm of space where matter haunts, so says Dubois Raymond. And further, what lives in the soul cannot be fulfilled by reality. However deeply the mystical is experienced, it always hovers above reality. The human being does not come to the totality of the world either through seeing into nature or through seeing into the soul. An abyss is there which usually cannot be bridged. It is consciously bridged in clairvoyant consciousness, in artistic creativity. Then self-knowledge must become something different from what is usually designated as such. Mystical insight finds that it is accomplished enough when it says, Within me I have experienced God, my higher self. But true self-knowledge wants to perceive how what we otherwise experience only as the point of the I lives creatively in the organism. In that we have ideas and perceptions, we are not just conceiving and perceiving beings, but we also breathe in and out continually. While we stand in the world in waking consciousness, we always breathe in and out. But ordinary consciousness does not perceive what is happening in us. Something wonderful happens there, which can only be recognized through clairvoyant consciousness. When we do not look only at the nebulous I, but how this I lives, shaping concrete reality, then the following becomes apparent. In the out-breath, the cerebrospinal fluid goes into the spinal canal in a long sac which has all sorts of malleable, fragile places. It pushes down, pushes at the veins of the body. I am describing what happens there as an outer process. Ordinary consciousness cannot penetrate there, but the soul partakes of this subconsciously, this spreading out of what comes from the brain into the veins of the body, and it partakes when breathing in of the stemming of the venal blood in the veins of the back, through the spinal canal, the penetration of the cerebrospinal fluid into the brain, and what is happening in the interplay between nerves and sense organs. Ordinary consciousness is vague here, unaware of any of this, but soul and spirit are involved. This process unfolds as though chaotically. What pushes back and forth there is what happens in every human being in music. Music lives inwardly here in this process. And what is creative in music is to lift up into outer conscious form what the musician learns to experience as music in his soul life. Tone lives in it, the subconscious living flow of music within which the human soul weaves. Our psychology is still very elementary. Things that throw light on the life of the artist still have to be researched in harmony with clairvoyance. Human experience is complicated. The impulse for artistic imagination is actually this subconscious knowledge of the soul, in that the musical life takes place between the spinal canal and the brain into which blood shoots, and the cerebrospinal fluid sounds upward against the brain so that the nerve is made to vibrate. If this is brought into connection with the possibility of higher perception, then therein lives more enjoyable inner music than in the objective impulse from which the human soul is born, when the human being, from out of spiritual life, enters through birth or conception into physical existence. The soul steps into existence by learning to play the instrument of the physical body, and what happens when this entire movement takes place, this vibration of the cerebrospinal fluid? What takes place there in the alternating relationship between nerves and senses? When the vibration of the nerve strikes the outer senses, mind you, not yet the sense perception, when the vibration of the nerve in the waking state simply strikes, then what lives unconsciously and gets drowned by the perception is poetry. Between the senses and the nervous system 
there is a region in which the human being unconsciously writes poetry. The nerve vibration rolls into his senses. It runs its course unconsciously, which can be determined physiologically. This life runs its course in the senses and is the production of poetry. The human being lives in the inner creation of poetry, and poetic creativity is the raising up of this unconscious life. I have shown this through the process of breathing. When considering the out-breath, we must be aware that the cerebrospinal fluid pushes down in the body, into the forces that come from the body, to meet it, and into the forces through which the human being places himself into the outer world. We continually stand in the world in a particular equilibrium, whether with our legs spread apart, with an arm bent, or whether we crawl as children, or whether we transform the equilibrium of crawling into the equilibrium of being erect, we are in an inner condition of balance. What the inner forces bring toward the vibrations that are breathed out, this is the basis for what is fashioned in sculpture and architecture. The emotional feeling which lives in the human being when he moves but keeps the movement quiet is brought to expression in sculpture. This is an inner experience that is related to the forms of the body. We will recognize this only if we are used to fashioning perception and thought into quiet form conceptions. We get to know that the forces emanating from the body are not chaotic, but are, rather, forms that show how the human being is integrated into the cosmos. When considering forces of a more outer nature, which the soul experiences subconsciously, we are more engaged with sculptural imagination. Between these two there is a remarkable unconscious realm that the soul maintains in its depths. By vibrating between body and brain, the undulation of the nerve, which is actually the cold intellectual part of the human body, comes into contact with the warm blood. In this sort of penetration by warmth and spirit lie the unconscious sources of artistic creativity that animate the painter, who then brings his impressions, which he has raised up from the subconscious, onto the canvas. Unconsciously, human beings are in the spiritual world that is revealed only through clairvoyance. It was not for nothing that in the old days the body was considered the temple for the soul. Therein lay the indication of how architecture is related to the condition of balance in the body and in the entire cosmos. Art should express what the artist can implant in his artistic work only because his soul has experienced it in connection with the world because his body is a microcosmic reflection of the whole macrocosm. If this is to be brought to consciousness, it can only be done through clairvoyance. Why does ordinary aesthetics, which is built upon the example of natural science, turn out to be so unfruitful? The artist can make nothing of this academic, aesthetic theory, which seeks to bring the unconscious nature of the human being to consciousness in the same way as ordinary scientific research. Clairvoyance makes conscious what lives in artistic creativity. Only the artist should not fear clairvoyance the way so many do. The two realms can live separately, side by side, in the human personality, because they can be so very divorced. It is possible for the soul to live outside the body in the spiritual world. Then it can observe how what otherwise remains subconscious is crystallized in artistic form, but also can observe what the clairvoyant can experience artistically apart from his clairvoyance. Such experience can only fructify art and serve the artist, just as artists can fructify clairvoyance. The clairvoyant who has artistic sense or taste will be spared from developing a spiritual science permeated all too much by Philistinism. He will represent this spiritual world flexibly, will be able to form the how 
of spiritual science that I mentioned earlier in a more considered way than one who made his way into the spiritual world without artistic sense. It is not necessary to develop fear of clairvoyance as so many artists do. I am talking about serious fear, not just the fear someone might have of being called an anthroposophist. I am speaking of the very prevalent fundamental fear that clairvoyance will impair the immediacy of artistic creativity. In fact, such impairment does not take place. But we live in an age in which, through the historical necessity of human evolution, the soul is pushed to make conscious what used to be present in subconscious naivete. The times we live in can only be understood by someone who transforms what is unconscious evermore into the free grasp of what is conscious. If this need of the times is not met, humanity will step into a cultural dead end. Because art cannot be understood by ordinary science, the aesthetic of the artist is rejected. But clairvoyance develops a science that does not rob art of its essence by attempting to understand it. Clairvoyance is flexible enough to understand art. Therefore, we can understand it as a fact of the present times that a bridge between art and clairvoyance must be built, as Christian Morgenstern beautifully describes, in words that point to the necessity for change. Quote, Whoever wants merely to immerse himself with feeling into what can presently be experienced of the divine spiritual, without seeking to understand it, is like an illiterate person who all his life sleeps with a primer under his pillow. Close quote. One often wants to sleep all one's life with a primer of world knowledge under the pillow in order to avoid weakening through clairvoyant knowledge one's original elementary creativity. Whoever grasps clairvoyant knowledge in the best sense in which it is meant today will understand that in the sense of Morgenstern one must emerge from illiteracy, that one can build bridges between art and clairvoyance, and that new light will thus be shed on art and through art new warmth will be given to clairvoyance. Thus, as the fruit of appropriate efforts in the beneficent future, through clairvoyant light and artistic warmth, a deeply meaningful impulse can be introduced into future human development. The end of Lecture 8.4 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com As well, you may listen to this podcast at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. Also, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art. Translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. This is Lecture 9.5, which means it's the ninth section of the book, but the fifth of eight lectures that are at the end. This book is made up of essays and lectures. It's entitled The Sources of Artistic Imagination and Supra Sensory Knowledge, Part 2, given in Munich on May 6, 1918. Since ancient times, humanity has felt a certain relationship between suprasensory knowledge and impulses of artistic imagination, of artistic creativity and appreciation. Whoever comes into contact with artists realizes that in widespread artistic circles there is a fear that artistic creativity could be disturbed by approaching those experiences of the suprasensory world out of which artistic imagination receives its impulses, as is striven for by spiritual scientific suprasensory knowledge. On the other hand, it is, after all, known in the broadest circles that certain artistic natures, who, with their artistic activity, approach what appears to ray in from suprasensory worlds, experience something like clairvoyance in the context of their creative imaginations writers of fairy tales or other artistic individuals 
who are interested in working with what rays from suprasensory worlds into the sensory world, know how the figures they create in their artwork appear, though they are thoroughly spiritual, in such a way that they have the feeling that they are interacting with these artistic figures, or that these figures are interacting with each other. Insofar as we maintain complete consciousness, through which, at any time, we can tear ourselves from what comes over us clairvoyantly, spiritual science can also speak of clairvoyance in such a case. We must say there are commonalities between artistic creativity, artistic imagination, and the consciousness that can transport itself knowingly into the spiritual world. Nevertheless, some find it necessary to stress, particularly in the face of such spiritual scientific perceptions as are meant here, that the artist should not let himself be robbed of his originality because of what he takes up consciously from the spiritual world. With such a view, one overlooks the essence of the relationship between artistic imagination and clairvoyant vision in the spiritual world. For the clairvoyant vision referred to here is one that develops in an entirely independent way through pure soul activity, independent of physical bodily means. Today I cannot detail how it is possible for the soul to enter the spiritual world free of the body. I simply want to point out that what results as affinity and connection between genuine artistic activity and true genuine clairvoyance interests the anthroposophical spiritual researcher more today than the relationship between clairvoyance and visionary conditions, abnormal conditions, which, although there is the attempt to designate them as clairvoyance, are nevertheless still connected to bodily conditions and do not represent pure soul experiences. But in order to accept the real relationship between artistic imagination and clairvoyance, it is necessary to discuss what, in the strictest sense, differentiates these two from one another, and this is something quite significant. Whoever is active creatively in artistic imagination will not, as is the case in ordinary sensory perception and examination of what is perceived, take up the sensory world and reproduce it in himself. Rather, he will change it, idealize it, or whatever one wants to call it. The orientation does not matter. It does not matter whether one takes things up realistically or idealistically, whether one is impressionistic or expressionistic. But in all art, there lives a metamorphosis of what is usually reproduced by the human being from the reality. But in artistic creativity, what can be called perception of the outer world remains alive. The artist abides by the perceptions of the outer world. In his artistic creativity, the conceived images which depend on outer perception and on whatever is connected with it in the memory remain present. Everything the artist has taken up in his life continues to work in his subconscious. And the more that the experiences deposited in the soul work on in the soul, the richer will the artistic product live in the artistic imagination as a connecting link between the personality and the outer sense impressions, the faculties of thought and of memory. That is not the case with what lives in clairvoyance when a person penetrates into the spiritual world through supra-sensory vision. The essential point is that we penetrate into the spiritual world only if we can silence not only the sensory observations but also the inner pictures that flow over into memory. Recollection, memory, the capacity to perceive outer sense impressions must be utterly silent for suprasensory knowledge. It is indeed difficult to clarify for our contemporaries that something like this is possible, that the human soul with its slumbering powers can really develop such strength that the soul's life can remain fully alert 
while conceptualization and perception are repressed. For that reason, in the striving for suprasensory knowledge, when it is developed methodically, the objection should not be raised that in the case of willful clairvoyance we are dealing with the repository of memories that surge up out of the subconscious. The essential thing is that whoever wants to penetrate the spiritual world as a spiritual researcher must get to know the method that makes it possible to utterly repress the capacity for memories so that his soul lives only in the present impressions without any reminiscences coming up out of the subconscious so that the soul stands with what it conceives and experiences in a world that it consciously seeks to penetrate and that nothing unconscious remains. If we consider that many mystical, so-called theosophical strivings contain the longing for all manner of nebulous blurriness, even those who consider themselves adherents will certainly see that this striving is confused with what is meant here by clairvoyance. But this nebulous blurriness is not what we mean here by clairvoyance. There we can see how basically different this clairvoyance is from artistic creativity. They both rest on different states and moods of soul. But whoever strives for suprasensory knowledge in the way it is meant here will have particular experiences with art. First a cardinal question. One cannot be a spiritual researcher from morning till night. Observation in the spiritual world is bound to certain times. One knows the start and finish of the condition in which the soul penetrates the spiritual world. In this condition the soul is capable, through its own forces, of entirely ignoring outer impressions, so that of everything that the outer senses see as colors or hear as tones, nothing remains. It is by means of this looking at the nothingness that the perception of the spiritual world emerges. I would say, the seer can blot out everything that penetrates him from the outer world, which surges up into soul consciousness from the ordinary trove of memories. But he cannot blot out, even when he transports himself into this condition, certain impressions that come to him from works of art that stem from true artistic imagination. I do not thereby mean that the seer in this condition has the same impressions of a work of art as the non-seer. These the seer has in moments when he is not seeing in the spirit. But in clairvoyant moments he has the possibility of entirely blotting out anything sensory or anything connected with memory as it relates to the outer world. The seer cannot do so, however, with respect to an artwork he encounters. These experiences are specific. It becomes evident that the seer has particular experiences with the individual arts. It is in the details of their effect that such words as art lose their ordinary meaning. The individual arts become richer unto themselves from the perspective of suprasensory knowledge. Architecture becomes different from music, painting, and so forth. But to survey the clairvoyant experience of art, it is necessary to point out that the question must be raised. If the seer must suppress the effects of the outer world and whatever belongs to memory, what does he have left? In the soul there lives of the three soul activities spoken about in the study of the soul, that which is always present in the human soul. Conceptualizing and perception are not present. But feeling and willing are present, though in an entirely different manner than in ordinary life. We really ought not to confuse suprasensory knowledge with the nebulous feeling like losing of oneself in the spiritual world, which must be designated as mysticism. We must be clear that although suprasensory knowledge springs from feeling and willing, it is different from feeling and willing. In addition, we must take into account that for clairvoyant knowledge, feeling and willing must so fill out the soul that the soul grows still and that the entire remaining human being 
finds itself in utter stillness. What must occur is what the human being otherwise does not have in feeling and willing. He must develop feeling and willing completely turned inward. Impulses of will generally develop in outer manifestations. Outer manifestation ought not to occur in clairvoyance. Dervishism and similar practices are in opposition to knowledge of the spiritual world. Insofar as feeling and willing develop inwardly, a light-filled, sharply contoured soul activity springs up, an activity of soul similar to the formation of thoughts. Ordinary thought formations are faded. For the seer, something objective, which, however, is not determined or saturated any less by reality than ordinary thinking, springs up out of feeling and willing. It is precisely through experiences of art that we can characterize in detail what the seer experiences in his soul capacities. By attempting to enter into the architectonic forms and relationships of mass, into what the architect has hidden within his buildings, the seer feels connected to these architectural conditions of mass and harmonies, to what develops in the seer as a very different way of thinking from the shadowy thinking of ordinary life. We might add, the seer develops a new thinking that is related to nothing as much as to the forms in which the architect thinks and which he then fashions. The thinking that holds sway in ordinary life has nothing to do with clairvoyance. The thinking that holds sway for the seer includes space in his creative experience. The seer knows that with these forms, which are living forms of thought, he penetrates into the suprasensory reality beyond the sense world, but that he must develop these into thoughts that come to life spatially. The seer perceives that will and emotional feeling are active in everything that comes to life in harmonies of mass and form. He learns to recognize the forces of the world in the relationships of mass and number that imbue all structure as they live in his thoughts. That is why in his thinking he feels related to what the architect designs. In a certain way, in that a new life of feeling, not ordinary consciousness, arises in him, he feels related to what the architect and sculptor create in forms. For suprasensory knowledge, an objective intellectuality is born, which thinks in spatial forms that curve, that give themselves form through their own lives. These are forms of thought through which the soul of the seer dives down into spiritual reality. One feels these to be related to what lives in the forms of the sculptor. We can characterize the thinking and the new perception of the seer by taking our experiences with architecture and sculpture into account. The seer's experience with music and poetry are very different. Only by penetrating further into the sphere I just described can the seer attain a relationship to music. It is true that at first the new spiritual intellectuality develops out of the inwardly turned feeling and willing. We can penetrate into the spiritual world by having the experience that we penetrate only by means of the soul, which does not make use of the bodily organization. Then the next stage comes. If we did not progress to the next stage, we would penetrate the spiritual world incompletely. It does not consist of developing this intellectual spirituality, but instead of becoming as conscious of spiritual realities outside of the body as one is conscious of standing in the physical world, standing on the ground with one's feet, grasping objects, and so forth. By beginning to know, think, and perceive in the spiritual world in this way, as I have just described it, we develop a new deep feeling and willing, but it is a willing in the spiritual world that does not come to expression in the sense world. Only by experiencing ourselves in this willing can we have certain experiences of music and poetry. This shows that especially the new emotional feeling experienced 
outside of the body is related to the suprasensory knowledge that we experience with music. Music is experienced differently in clairvoyant consciousness than in ordinary consciousness. It is experienced in such a way that we feel ourselves united with every single tone, each melody, in such a way that the soul lives in the surging life of tone. The soul is completely connected to the tones. It is as if the soul has flowed out into the surging tones. I can safely say that there is hardly anything that provides as precise a view, as pictorial a view of Aphrodite rising out of the ocean's foam, as the consideration of the way the human soul lives and rises out of the element of music when it is grasped by clairvoyance. And just as Aphrodite, rising above the surface of the ocean, is surrounded by the fluttering creatures of the air, which approach her as messengers of living space, so for the seer does what is poetic join what is musical. By feeling as if his soul were being lifted out of what is musical, while yet feeling as if he were in it, feeling himself to be identical with what is musical, for the seer the poetic joins what is musical. He experiences this intensively. What he experiences depends on the degree to which he is educated in clairvoyance. Poetry is strange. Through language or by other poetic means, the artist expresses what approaches the clairvoyant capacity out of poetry. For example, a dramatic character presented by a poet who allows him to say few words forms itself, out of these few words, into a self-contained imagination of a human personality. That is why everything in poetry that is unreal, merely rhetorical, that does not emerge out of creativity but is instead manufactured, makes things so uncomfortable for the seer. In something that is not poetry, yet wants to form something rhetorically, a grotesque caricature arises while what is sculptural transforms itself for him into spiritual intellectuality, what is poetic changes into something sculptural and representational, which he must look at. He looks at what is true, what is formed out of the true creative laws out of which nature works, and separates these stringently from what is merely made from human conceits. Because one wants to write poetry, even if one is not connected in imagination to the creative forces of the universe. These are the experiences with regard to poetry and music. Suprasensory knowledge experiences painting in a peculiar way. For suprasensory knowledge, painting stands alone. And because the seer, I will use a trivial comparison, like the geometer, is required to work with lines and with the circle, in order to make visible and bring onto a surface what he can have only as inner picture, in order to make the inner picture sense perceptible, the seer must change what he experiences as formless in the spiritual world into a formed, dense world. This happens when he lives so intensively into what he experiences in this way that he changes it into inner observation filling it out in imagination with, if I may use the expression, soul substance. He does this in such a way that in a manner of speaking, in an inner creative clairvoyant condition, he creates the counterpart to painting. The painter shapes his imagination in such a way that his inner formative powers are dependent on sense perception, which he experiences as he must experience it. He comes in from outside to the place where he transforms what lives in space in such a way that it acts as lines, forms, and colors. He takes this as far as the surface of painterly observation. The seer approaches from the opposite side. He condenses what is in his clairvoyant activity to the point of soul coloration. He imbues what is otherwise colorless as if inwardly illustrated with colors. He develops imaginations. 
We need only imagine in the right way how what the painter accomplishes from the one side is met from the opposite side through what the seer brings about from inside out. In order to imagine this, one ought to read the elementary concepts in the last chapters of Goethe's color theory on the sensory moral effects of color, where he says that every color causes a condition of feeling. This condition of feeling is what the seer receives as the last thing, with which he colors what would otherwise be colorless and formless. When the seer speaks of things like the aura and refers to colors related to what he sees, we should be clear that he colors what he experiences inwardly with this condition of feeling. When the seer says that what he sees is red, he experiences what is otherwise experienced when there is red. The experience is the same as when one sees red, but spiritually. What the clairvoyant sees is the same as what the artist conjures up on the canvas, but seen from a different side. This is how the clairvoyant encounters the painter. This encounter is a notable, meaningful experience. It allows painting to appear as a characteristic feature of suprasensory knowledge. This becomes particularly evident in a phenomenon that must become a problem for every soul, the incarnadine, the color of human flesh, which for anyone wanting to penetrate further into such things has something both mysterious and interesting about it, which allows one to see into the depths of natural and spiritual conditions. The seer experiences this incarnadine in a special way. In relation to this, I would like to point out a few things. In speaking of a seer or of clairvoyance, people think that what is meant is something far removed from life, something that only a few bizarre people have. That is not the case. Earnest clairvoyance is always present in life. We would not be able to stand firmly in practical life if we were not clairvoyant for particular things. Much depends on the fact that the earnest seer is not describing something estranged from life, but something that only elevates life in certain directions. When in ordinary life are we clairvoyant? We are clairvoyant in a situation that is so misunderstood today, because all manner of daydreaming has come about through the materialistic view of how we grasp an unfamiliar I, capital, when we encounter an unfamiliar body. There are already people today who say, only through a subconscious inference do we perceive the soul of another human I. We see the oval of the face, other human features, the color of the face, the form of the eyes. And when we see something bodily like this, we have become used to finding a human being standing in front of us. That is why we conclude with the analogy that such a form harbors a human being. But suprasensory knowledge shows us that this is not the case. What appears to us in the human form and coloration is a type of perception, as is the perception of color and form in a crystal. Color, form and surface in a crystal arise as themselves. Surface and coloration in the human being lift themselves up, make themselves transparent in a spiritual sense. The sensory perception of the other human being extinguishes itself spiritually. We perceive the other soul directly. It is a direct transferring of oneself into the other soul, a mysterious, wonderful process in the soul, when we face the other person out of our own human nature. What happens there is a real stepping forth of the soul, a stepping over toward the other. This is a clairvoyance that is always and everywhere present in life. This type of clairvoyance is intimately connected with the secret of the incarnadine. The seer becomes aware of this when he confronts the most difficult problem of clairvoyance, to perceive the incarnadine clairvoyantly. For ordinary perception... Incarnadine has something calm about it. For the seer it becomes something that actively moves. The seer does not perceive the incarnadine as something finished, 
but as the intermediary condition between two others. If the seer concentrates on the coloration of the human being, then he perceives a continual oscillation, a blanching and a sort of blushing, which is a higher blushing than normal blushing, and which, for the seer, moves into a sort of radiation of warmth. These are the two boundary conditions between which the coloration of the human being swings and in which incarnadine exists. This becomes a vibration back and forth for the seer. Through blanching, the seer understands how the human being inwardly is in his feeling and intellect. Through blushing, he recognizes what the human being is like as will impulse, how he is in relation to the outer world. What vibrates is mostly what is in the inner character of the human being. We ought not to imagine that clairvoyance consists in, in quotes, developing ourselves and then seeing all people and things spiritually. The path into the spiritual world is a polymorphous, complicated path. The experience of incarnadine is the main problem when it comes to arriving at the inner nature of the other human being. So you see that the seer has the most varied experiences in the arts. What is meant here is further nuanced through a phenomenon that is suited to indicate the way clairvoyance stands in life, the relationship between clairvoyance and human speech. Actually, speech is not something unified. Rather, it is something that lives in three different spheres. First, we have a condition of speech that allows it to be viewed as a tool for comprehending people and science. We might call what the seer feels there paradoxical, but it is a real experience. The seer experiences this way of using speech for comprehension and ordinary cognitive science as a sort of dampening of language, even a degradation of language, into something that in its innermost nature speech is not. Clairvoyance arrives at a different understanding. Language is that instrument through which a nationality lives in commonality. When viewed correctly, what lives in speech, in that it is structured into different forms, nuances of speech sounds, and so forth, is something artistic. Language as an expression of the folk soul is art, and the way the language is worked with creatively is a common creative activity of the people who speak this language. By using language as an everyday means of comprehension, one degrades it. Whoever has a perception for what lives in language and reveals itself in our subconscious knows that what is creative in speech is related to poetry, to art in general. Whoever has an artistic nature has an unpleasant feeling when language is unnecessarily degraded in the sphere of ordinary comprehension. Christian Morgenstern had this feeling. He was not afraid of bridging artistry with clairvoyance. He did not harbor the belief that artistic originality would be lost through the penetration into the spiritual world. He felt that what was poetic in himself was related to what is sculptural, architectural, he expressed what he felt in language, characterizing chatter as the misuse of language when he said, quote, the basis of all chatter is ignorance of the meaning and value of the individual word. For the chatterer, language is something obscured, but it gives him a modest return, the obscurer, the obscured, close quote. One has to appreciate what Morgenstern felt as the creativity in language so as to feel, as he did, that when language as prose becomes a means for comprehension, it results in its degradation into mere utilitarianism. The third characteristic of the seer's experience with speech is what is experienced in the spiritual world. What is looked at there is not looked at in words. It does not express itself directly in words. This makes an understanding with the outer world difficult for the seer, because most people think theoretically and in terms of the content of words, and cannot imagine a life of the soul that goes beyond words. 
That is why someone who perceives in the spiritual world feels a certain compulsion to pour into the already formed language what he has experienced. But by silencing what normally lives in language, namely the capacity of ideation and memory, he can activate in himself forces of creative speech, those creative forces which were at work when speech originated. The seer must put himself into the mood of soul from which speech first originated, must develop the dual activity of inwardly forming what he has seen spiritually and of diving into the spirit of creative speech so that he can connect these two with one another. That is why it is important to understand that we must take up the words of a seer differently from other words. Insofar as the seer communicates, he is obliged to use language, but in such a way that he lets what is creative in language arise again through his use of what has pictorial power in language. Thus it becomes important for him to form the spoken word by emphasizing some things more than others, saying some things first and others later, or by setting something aside as an example. A special technique is necessary for someone who wants to recast spiritual truths into language, who wants to bring to expression what lives inwardly in him. That is why it is necessary for the seer to pay attention to the how of what he expresses, not just to what he says. It is important that he first forms what he wants to say. How he says things is important, especially things about the spiritual world, not just what he says. The seer is understood with such difficulty because so little consideration is given to this and because people think of the ordinary meanings of words when they hear them. It is therefore necessary for him, all of this is relative, to develop the capacity for creative speech so that he expresses the supersensory in the very way he expresses himself. It will become ever more necessary to clarify. It is not the content that is important in what is said. What is important is that when the seer expresses himself, we have the living impression that he is speaking out of the spiritual world. In this way, language itself is already an artistic element in ordinary life. The seer has a special relationship to language as well. Now the question arises, what is the basis for this special connection between the seer and the artist? Why is it that the seer basically cannot ignore the impression a work of art makes on him? It is because something arises in the work of art that has a relationship to suprasensory knowledge, but in a different guise. This is because the inner life of the human being is far more complicated than what today's science can imagine. Let me approach this from a different side, in which it may indeed seem as if scientific language is spoken, and which indicates something that must be ever more developed so as to bridge ordinary observation of reality, on the one hand, and the experience of artistic imagination and supersensory knowledge, on the other. Let me ask, how is it possible for the creative musician to produce from within himself what lives in his tones? We must be clear that what is called ordinary self-knowledge here is still abstract. Even what the mystics or the nebulous theosophists imagine in this regard is very abstract. If we believe we experience the divine in our soul, that is completely vague and nebulous in contrast to real concrete clairvoyance. What becomes clear is that the human being has on the one side his inner experiences, his thoughts, feelings and will impulses, he can sink into them and calls this mysticism or philosophy or science. If we learn to recognize what is alive, then we know that all of this is too thin, even if we try to make it denser inwardly. Even with intensive mysticism, we always hover above reality. We do not really get to true reality. We experience only inner copies, effects of reality and we also do not experience reality through ordinary observation of nature, 
which confronts material processes. What Dubois-Raymond says is true. Observation of nature will never grasp what haunts in space. When the natural scientist talks about matter that is out there in space, the reality we try to grasp is not entailed. For ordinary consciousness, what prevails is that, on the one hand, we have the inner life that does not penetrate reality, and on the other hand, the outer reality that does not reveal the inner life. Between these there is an abyss. This abyss, which one must know, is an impediment for human knowledge. It is overcome in no other way than by developing the suprasensory clairvoyance in the soul, a clairvoyance, as I have described it today, in relation to the artistic element. When this clairvoyance develops, we step into an outer relationship to ourselves and the material reality that is present as the body. The body becomes something new, does not remain brittle and inwardly ungiving. What is inner does not continue to hover above reality, but rather it impregnates itself, permeates itself in its own bodily aspect with what has material existence in the body. But all material existence contains spiritual existence, let us try to consider this in conjunction with the art of music. While the human being develops musical or other ideas and perceives in ordinary consciousness, complicated conditions arise in the interior of his body. He is unaware of these, but they take place. Clairvoyant consciousness penetrates to this inner, complicated, wonderful bodily experience. The cerebrospinal fluid in which the brain is embedded, pours itself out into the spinal cord tissue during exhalation, penetrates down, thrusts the blood to the abdominal veins. During inhalation, everything is thrust upward. A wonderful rhythm accompanies everything we think and perceive. This breathing, this rhythmical dynamic, penetrates into and out of the brain. A process takes place that accompanies human experience. It happens in the subconscious and is known to the soul. Current physiology and biology are still almost completely ignorant of these things, but it will become a widespread science. In times different from our own, one had to seek spiritual life in a different manner. But the time for seeking spiritual life in an Eastern Indian way has passed. That can be studied later, but the belief that one must return to Indian methods is completely wrong. That is not for our time. It would mislead humanity. Our methods are much more intellectual. Nevertheless, we may study what it was that ancient India sought. In ancient India, a large part of the schooling to achieve higher knowledge consisted of the rhythmically ordered breathing process. They wanted to regulate the breathing process. If you compare what was sought there with what was just said, you will find that the student of yoga wanted to experience in himself what I just described by inwardly experiencing the stream of the breath. The Indian experienced this by attempting to feel the breathing process that surges up and down. Our methods are different. Whoever follows this with understanding finds that we should no longer live into the organism in this physical way. Instead, we should try to grasp what streams down through a meditative approach of the intellect and what streams up through exercises of the will and in this way try to confront the stream with our soul life and to feel it as it streams up and down particular kind of progress in human development is based on this. This is something about which science and everyday consciousness knows nothing, but the soul in its depths knows it. What the soul there knows and experiences can under special circumstances be raised up by consciousness. It is raised up when a human being has an artistic nature as regards music. By what means does this happen? 
in the ordinary human condition, which one could also call bourgeois, there is a strong connection between the soul spiritual and the physical bodily. The soul spiritual is strongly bound to the aforementioned processes. If the balance is unstable, if the soul spiritual is loosened, then through this construction based on inner destiny, one is musical or musically receptive. This unstable relationship is the basis for special musical talent in other spheres as well. Someone who has this talent is able to bring to the surface what otherwise takes place only in the depths of the soul. For in the depths of the soul we are all musicians. What takes place there cannot be raised to the surface by someone who has a stable balance. He is not an artist. Whoever has an unstable balance, and here one could speak as a scientific philistine of degeneration, whoever has an unstable balance of soul and body brings to the surface more, whether dark or light, of what is active in the rhythm and forms it through tonal matter. If we observe the stream of nerve waves from below upward toward the brain, we first encounter what we characterize as musical. How the optical nerve spreads in the eye, how it is connected to blood vessels, all of this remains subconscious. What happens there is extinguished when the human being faces nature. By facing the outer sense world, the outer impression is extinguished. But what happens between the nerve waves and the sensory processes, that was always a poet there. A poet lives in every human being. And depending on the balance between soul and body, what takes place there either remains below or is raised to the surface to be transformed into poetry. Let us again consider the radiating process, the wave that moves down and collides with the branching of the blood flow. There we have the impression of how our own individual balance impacts the balance of the environment. The subconscious experience is especially strong when the human being rises from being a crawling infant to stepping into upright balance. That is an incredible subconscious experience. That one has what is merely caricatured in the ape, what will become significant for humanity, that the line to the middle of the body coincides with the center of gravity line, this is an incredible inner experience. In this way, one experiences unconsciously the architectural-sculptural relationship. Architecture, sculptural mass, is experienced unconsciously when the nerve wave moving downward encounters the bloodstream. And then it is brought to the surface and brought into form by means of unstable or stable conditions. Painting, and what is brought to expression there, is experienced inwardly, where nerve and blood wave encounter each other. The artistic process is conscious, but the impulses are unconscious. Clairvoyance sinks consciously into what underlies artistic imagination as impulse, as inner experience, which should not be characterized as abstractly as it is today, but instead so concretely that one can find every single phase again in the configuration of one's own body. In the old days, there was a correct perception that with respect to architecture, every form, every mass is present when one places oneself into the outer world. The architecture of antiquity and Gothic architecture stem from different ways of sensing this relationship to mass, but both stem from a sense for the relationship between the conditions of one's own balance and the conditions of the cosmos. Here we recognize that the human being is, in his own structure, a reflection of the macrocosm. That is why one called the body the temple of the soul. A lot of truth is contained in such utterances. So we can say, fundamentally, the artist who is to be taken seriously and who has a relationship to reality creates out of the same sources as those on which the clairvoyant draws. For the clairvoyant, what is to remain as impulse in his working, appears in his consciousness, whereas when the impulse remains subconscious, 
he brings to the surface what the artist makes visible. This shows us that these realms of human experience are strictly separated. That is why the fear of believing that the artist's originality would get lost through clairvoyance is unfounded. Clairvoyance is developed through the same conditions that can be taken from artistic creativity and experience, but the two cannot interfere with each other if they are experienced properly. On the contrary. We stand at a moment in time when humanity must become ever more conscious, ever freer. Therefore that light must be poured out over art by the artist himself, thereby bridging art and clairvoyance, which do not conflict with each other. We can understand that the artist feels disturbed when art theory develops according to patterns of natural science or of the intellectually scientific aesthetic as we know it today. But knowledge that clairvoyantly penetrates real art, such a science, does not yet exist. A time will come when artists will find it not objectionable, but fruitful. Anyone using a microscope knows what needs to be done so that one first learns to see properly, just as one first permeates oneself inwardly with the skill to use a microscope properly, in which case the inner stimulates outer seeing and does not hinder it, so a time will come in which true clairvoyance supportively impregnates, permeates, the artist's basic capacity for production. At times what is meant by clairvoyance is misunderstood, because one thinks of suprasensory science and knowledge too much along the lines of ordinary sensory science and knowledge. People who encounter spiritual science are sometimes disappointed, for they do not find comfortable answers to their homespun questions. Instead, they find other worlds that sometimes contain riddles far deeper than those in the sensory world. An introduction to spiritual science brings up new riddles which cannot be solved theoretically, but promise to be solved only through life processes and thus engender new riddles. If we then live into this higher life, we remain connected with art. Hebel demanded conflicts that had to remain unsolved. He considered Grillparzer a Philistine, in spite of all the beauty, for creating situations in which conflicts are solved if one is only a little smarter than his hero. That is where true clairvoyance leads. It does not create cheap answers, but rather world views in addition to what is given through the senses. Certainly profound artists have already felt this. In his recently published book titled Stufen, Morgenstern says anyone really wanting to approach the spiritual, like the artist, must be willing to take up in himself, to unite with himself, what can already now be grasped of the divine spiritual by penetrating supersensory knowledge. He says, quote, whoever wants merely to immerse himself with feeling into what can presently be experienced of the divine spiritual, without seeking to understand it, is like an illiterate person who all his life sleeps with a primer under his pillow. Close quote. This characterizes the point at which we now stand in our culture. If we can take up what our time needs, we will, like Morgenstern, arrive at the impression that we ought not remain illiterate in the face of clairvoyant knowledge. As artists, we must seek connections to clairvoyant knowledge. Just as it is significant when the clairvoyant element sheds light on artistic creativity, so it is also significant when that which, as clairvoyant Philistinism, possesses no musicality and is in the highest degree unmusical, lets itself be fructified by artistic taste. For the genuine spiritual scientist of the future, bridging art and clairvoyance is more important than all pathological clairvoyance. Whoever understands this knows that the more that spiritual things and spiritual knowledge are sought, the greater will be the healing and flourishing of humanity in the present and the future. The light of clairvoyance must shine in art so that the warmth and greatness of art may work fruitfully 
into the breadth and greatness of the horizon of clairvoyance. This is necessary for art that wants to dive down into true existence, as we need it to, so as to master the great tasks that must approach humanity more and more out of uncertain depths. The end of Lecture 9.5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com As well, you can hear this podcast at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art, translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. This is Lecture 10.6, the tenth part of the book, then the sixth of eight lectures, entitled Sensory Suprasensory, Spiritual Knowledge and Artistic Creativity, given in Vienna on June 1, 1918. Several friends who were present at my Munich lectures about the relationship between spiritual science and art were of the view that I should also speak here in Vienna about the thoughts I expressed there. And in agreeing to this, I ask that what I am about to say this evening be taken entirely as it is meant, that is, in a modest form, with the intention of providing only aphoristic remarks about various things concerning the relationship between what we can call modern clairvoyance, as striven for by anthroposophically oriented spiritual science, and artistic creativity and the essence of art appreciation. First of all, a certain preconception accompanies the kind of consideration about to be made now. Preconceptions are not always without cause. There is a certain basis for the preconception that is founded on the notion that actually artistic creativity, artistic enjoyment, and artistic perception want nothing to do with any sort of view of art, with any sort of knowledge of art. And many who are involved in art are of the opinion that the basis of artistic creativity, as well as the artistic enjoyment that they ought to nurture, will be harmed if they apply too many thoughts, concepts, or ideas to the artist's experience. Mind you, I believe that this preconception about everything that can be called scientific aesthetics in the usual sense is justified. It seems to me that this science is avoided by artistic views somewhat rightfully, because genuine artistic feeling actually atrophies, is impaired by everything that points in any way toward a scientific treatment carried out in the conventional sense. On the other hand, however, we live in an age during which, out of a certain world historical necessity, much of what has until now worked unconsciously in human beings must now become conscious. Just as we are hardly able to place the social and societal relationships between human beings in the light of mythology, as was the case in earlier times, but instead are compelled by the progress of human evolution to seek refuge in the real understanding of what pulses through historical development, if we want to recognize what social structure, societal community, and so forth signifies among people, so also is it necessary to raise up into consciousness much of what was sought, and rightly so, in a more or less conscious or unconscious manner, in the instinctive reign of human imagination and the like. It would be raised up even if we did not want it to be. If, however, it were raised up in a manner contrary to creative progress, then the very thing that is to be avoided would take place, namely an impairment of the intuitively artistic, an impairment that is just what is to be avoided by living artistry. I am not speaking as an aesthetician, nor as an artist. I am speaking as the representative of spiritual scientific research, as the representative of the kind of world view that is permeated by the notion that progressing human development will more and more penetrate knowingly 
into the real spiritual world, which is the foundation of our sense world. I am not talking about some sort of metaphysical speculation. I am not talking about some sort of philosophy. Rather, I am talking about what I might call supra-sensory experience. I think it will not take much longer for people to realize that all mere philosophical speculation and all logical or scientific striving is unsuitable for penetrating spiritual realms. I believe that we are now in an epoch that will take it for granted that there are slumbering forces in the human soul and that these slumbering forces can be brought forth from this soul in a completely systematically regulated way. In several of my books, for example, titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, CW10, titled Riddles of the Soul, CW21, and titled The Riddle of Man, CW20, I have described how these forces slumbering in the human soul can be brought forth. So I understand spiritual knowledge as something that is basically not yet present, that currently can be considered only by a few people, that is not based on a continuation of already existing knowledge, whether mystical or scientific, but rather on the acquisition of a special kind of human knowledge, based on the human being achieving by means of a methodical awakening of certain soul forces slumbering within him, a condition of consciousness that relates to ordinary waking life as this waking life relates to sleeping or dreaming. Presently we know only these two polar conditions of human consciousness, the dull, chaotic sleep consciousness, which only apparently seems to be empty and muted, and day consciousness, from waking to falling asleep. We can connect the images from dream life to physical reality when the will nature of the human being, which brings him into a relationship with the things of the environment, falls asleep. In the same way, by developing further, humanity will achieve an awakening from this day consciousness into what I call a clairvoyant consciousness, in which we do not have outer objects and events before us, but rather a real spiritual world that is the basis of our physical world. Philosophers want to deduce it, but one cannot deduce it. One can only experience it. And one cannot experience spiritual surroundings while awake, just as one cannot experience physical surroundings while dreaming, not through mysticism, not through abstract philosophy, but only by bringing one's soul state into a different condition, by going from dream life into ordinary waking consciousness. Thus we speak of a spiritual world from which the soul spiritual proceeds, just as the physical bodily proceeds from the sense world. Naturally, such spiritual research, with its idiosyncrasies, is presently unrecognized. After all, people are such that they judge what appears before them according to the ideas they already have, some even according to the words they already have. They want to connect to something familiar. That is not the case as regards the results of clairvoyant consciousness, for it is not what is familiar. Clairvoyant consciousness could also be called spiritual sight or visionary consciousness, if the word were not so misunderstood. And I do not mean anything like superstition. What comes from clairvoyance is judged by what people already know. All sorts of dubious things have been attributed to it, like hallucinations, mediums, and so forth. What I mean here has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. These things I just mentioned are the products of a sick soul life, a soul life that is too deeply anchored in the body and leads any old picture from the physical body into the soul. What I call clairvoyant consciousness takes precisely the opposite path. Hallucinatory consciousness goes down from the ordinary soul state into the body. Clairvoyance goes up over the ordinary soul state, lives and weaves only in the soul spiritual, makes the soul entirely free of the life of the body. In our ordinary consciousness, only thinking is free of the life of the body, 
Many philosophers deny this because they do not believe that the human being can develop an activity free of the body. That is the point of departure, clairvoyant consciousness, which develops upward into the spiritual world where there is nothing physical, can be cultivated. This clairvoyant consciousness is in no way related to anything of the nature of a medium or visionary. Instead, it is strongly related to real, genuine, artistic understanding of the world. This is what I would hope and yearn for, that these two paths of human understanding, real, genuine clairvoyance and artistic experience, could be bridged in an unpedantic, artistic way, whether in the creative production or the appreciation of art. For someone living within clairvoyance, The experience is absolutely that the source, the real source out of which the artist creates, is exactly the same as that from which the clairvoyant, the observer of the spiritual world, draws his experiences. It is only that the manner in which the clairvoyant tries to shape his experiences in concepts and thoughts is different from the creativity of the artist, a considerable difference about which we may still speak today. But the source, this has to be emphasized, from which artist and clairvoyant draw, is in reality one and the same. Before taking up this fundamental question, I would like to make some preliminary remarks that might seem trivial, but that have no other claim than to show that an artistic worldview is not something that contributes to life merely arbitrarily. For the person who strives for a certain totality in life. The artistic worldview is like something that belongs to life, just as much as outer Philistine activity. A worthy human existence is unthinkable without the introduction of artistic feeling into our cultural life. It is a matter of really acknowledging that wherever we go in life, there is the latent urge to grasp the world aesthetically, artistically, Admittedly, we often do not bring to consciousness the artistic experience that subtly accompanies our existence. It lives rather under the threshold of consciousness. If I am to visit someone and I come into his room and the room has red walls, red wallpaper, and he comes and talks to me about the silliest things, or perhaps he does not talk at all or is utterly boring, then I feel that an untruth exists. It remains entirely in the feeling It does not become a thought, but I feel that there is an untruth. As odd and paradoxical as it may sound, if someone wallpapers his room in red, he will disappoint me if he does not put forward some meaningful thoughts in the red room where he receives me. Naturally, this does not have to happen in reality. It does not have to happen, but it accompanies our soul life. If, on the other hand, we enter a room full of blue and someone bubbles over with words, not letting us get a word in edgewise, and considers himself alone to be of importance, we again take it as a contradiction to the blue and or violet walls of his room. Outer prosaic reality need not be like this, but there is a special aesthetic truth that is as I have described it. If I am snowed in somewhere, or rather not snowed in, but properly invited to a dinner, and I see that the table is laid with red table settings, is painted red, then I have the feeling that these are gourmands who eat for the sake of eating, who enjoy their food. If I find a blue table setting, I have the feeling they are not eating for the sake of eating, but want to converse while they are eating and to allow the conversation and the rest of the social gathering to be accompanied by the food. These are real feelings that always live in the subconscious. If I meet a lady on the street wearing a blue dress and she lets loose and behaves aggressively instead of being reserved, then I find this to be in contradiction to the blue dress, whereas I would find it natural if I were to meet such a lady dressed in red. I would also find it natural if a lady with curly hair were cheeky. There is something that lives in the soul as a basic tone. What I want to say with these trivial examples is only that an aesthetic feeling which we cannot eliminate exists, even if we do not perceive it. 
Our mood depends on it. We are in a good or bad mood. We know about this good or bad mood, but the reasons for it can only be brought to consciousness by someone who examines things more closely. Therein, actually, is contained what one might call the necessity of going from a natural aesthetic feeling to a life of art. Art simply approaches natural life, just like any other human mode of observation. The clairvoyant, who has developed the strengths of which I spoke, has a special way of experiencing art, and I believe that something can follow from this special experience the clairvoyant has with respect to art, even if it is not artistic, but rather elevated to the evaluation and understanding of art. The clairvoyant, who has awakened his soul so that he is surrounded by the spiritual world, is able to divert, to distract his soul life from all that is merely outer sensory reality. Speaking generally rather than individually, if I have a part of an outer physical object or activity before me, I am able to exclude the perception of the space and place where the object is, so that I see nothing physical in that space. This is the real abstraction that is entirely possible for the clairvoyant. But this can be done only with natural objects, not with what has been truly created artistically, and I consider this to be significant. As regards a work of art, the clairvoyant is unable entirely to shut out the object, the artistic activity, as he can shut out an outer activity. True artistic creation, permeated by spirit, remains in the consciousness of the clairvoyant spiritually. This is the first thing that can convince us that true artistic creativity and clairvoyant perception come from the same source. But there is much more that is significant in this direction. You see, if the clairvoyant applies the means that develop his soul, he will arrive at an entirely different mode of thinking and willing. Using ordinary expressions, one can, of course, say that thinking and willing become inward, but this, in quotes, inward, is actually not correct, because one is really outside. One spreads one's entire observation out over a truly spiritual world. A different thinking and a different willing occur in clairvoyance. Thinking does not proceed in abstract thoughts. Abstract thoughts are something suitable for the physical world, used to register its phenomena, to find its scientific laws, and so forth. The clairvoyant does not think in such thoughts, in abstractions. He thinks in thoughts that are actually weaving pictures. This is at present hard to understand, because people still do not really know what is meant by a thinking that does not think any abstract thoughts, but instead follows the nature of the things, lives in the forms and configurations of the things. We can compare this thinking with the forming of surfaces and curves as a mathematician, but one who becomes inwardly alive, as in the elemental condition that Goethe attempted to achieve in his theory of metamorphosis. Today this inner clairvoyant thinking can become far livelier. This clairvoyant thinking is extraordinarily related to what underlies certain realms of creative art, namely sculpture and architecture. Remarkably, as regards this new thinking, this new conceptualizing that the clairvoyant acquires for himself, he feels himself to be related to nothing as much as to the forms that the truly artistic architect develops and to the forms that the sculptor must take as the basis of his creative work. Something like an architectural conceptualizing or a conceptualizing in sculptural forms is really suited to grasp the world clairvoyantly and follow the things in such a way that one learns to understand them in their spiritual inwardness, learns to overcome oneself, learns to raise oneself purely into the spiritual world. With abstract thoughts we cannot discover anything about the inner nature of things. With respect to his new thinking, the clairvoyant feels related to the architect and sculptor. He must think the world 
in the kind of spirit forming that is the unconscious or subconscious basis of the sculptor's or architect's creative work. This then prompts research about where this actually comes from. We ask ourselves, what does the clairvoyant actually make use of there? He uses certain latent senses, senses that are present in ordinary life, but faintly, without functioning in a fully pronounced way. For example, we have a sense we could call the sense of balance. We live in it, but only in faint consciousness, not in full consciousness. When we take a step, or bend, or stretch a hand, connected to this taking of a step, to everything that somehow brings us into relationship with space, a faint, not quite conscious perception arises, as is the case with seeing and hearing. It is only that these senses are much louder and more distinctly perceptible. But the sense of balance and the sense of movement related to it are faint, because they are not specific to our inner life, but instead mediate our placement in the cosmos. How I stand in the cosmos, whether I am approaching the sun or going away from it, whether I perceive myself approaching the light or distancing myself, feel the light somehow muted, this feeling oneself to be part of the whole world can only be described like this. The human being in his movement is formed as a microcosm out of the macrocosm, and as microcosm experiences his placement into the macrocosm through such a sense. Working in sculpture is nothing other than transforming the perceptions of an ordinarily latent sense into outer surface forms and the like. That which we human beings always carry with us in our feeling for the world is unconsciously fashioned in architecture and sculpture. As strange as such a remark appears at first, anyone who can really research the relationship between individual architectural shapes, what lives in the imagination of the sculptor when he forms surfaces, whoever can research this knows that what I have just indicated is mysteriously involved in this creative work. The clairvoyant does nothing more than make fully conscious this sense of placing oneself into the world. He develops it just as the architect or the sculptor is artistically inclined to shape outer materials into forms by means of what he feels in his body. Let me say that from this vantage point we recognize certain things. In this regard I could speak not just for many hours, but could go on speaking for days. Whoever acquires a feeling for sculptural art knows that everything that is copied outwardly is actually not really sculptural. If we try, not abstractly but feelingly, to answer the question of what actually lies in sculptural activity, we cannot say there is much meaning in a surface that replicates a surface as it exists in external nature, in the human body, and so forth. That is not the case. What is experienced in the sculptural activity is the life of the surface itself. Once we have recognized the difference between a surface that has been curved only once and one that is curved a second time, we know that no surface that is curved only once can have any sort of sculptural life within it. Only one in which the curved surface is curved a second time can express the life of the surface. This inner expression, not symbolically but artistically, this inner expression that does not copy or stick to the model is what forms the basis of the secret of the surface itself. This raises a question that at the present time is as unclear as possible. Today we see countless people not just appreciating art, which is altogether right, but we see countless people judging art almost professionally. Now, I believe, based on the conditions underlying today's considerations, that I really will not need to express a critical opinion, but instead must simply express what comes ever more into consciousness. I do not believe that someone who needed clay once, who is merely a critic, can ever get any sort of idea about the essence of sculpture. Although I do believe that anyone can appreciate art, I do not believe that anyone can judge art 
unless they have made investigations that have revealed the artistic forms inherent in the material. For in reality what is realized through the substance is very different from the mere copying of a model or the like. The mere copying of a model is, therefore, worth no more than the imitation of a nightingale song through some sort of tones. True art begins where, instead of imitation, there is activity that comes from new creativity. In architecture, not in music, but very much in sculpture, we depend on the model. But whatever is related to the model by imitation is something other than art. Art only begins where there can be no more talk of imitation, and spiritual working and weaving, grasped unconsciously by the artist and consciously by the clairvoyant, is the common element bridging the clairvoyant grasp of the world and artistic creation, the only difference being that it can also be expressed spiritually by the clairvoyant, whereas the artist who cannot express it verbally but instead has it unconsciously in his hands and in his imagination, incorporates it into matter. Very different is the clairvoyant's relationship to the arts of poetry and music. It is interesting that especially as regards the art of music, when the clairvoyant enters the realm of art clairvoyantly, his experiences take on a very different form. I need to insert a remark here about this clairvoyant experience, namely that I do not mean continually, but only in those moments when one puts oneself into this clairvoyant condition. That is why it does not hold that the clairvoyant can experience music in this way at all times, but only when he wants to. At other times he experiences music as any other person would. He can compare what he experiences musically in the ordinary way with what he perceives when he experiences the musical work of art clairvoyantly. It should be noted that, as regards musical works of art, the clairvoyant understands that music is to be experienced entirely as a matter of soul, indeed in such a way that the concrete soul nature feels itself connected with the music. Earlier I said that the clairvoyant develops a new capacity for thinking, He thinks in such a way that he feels himself to be at home in architectural and sculptural creation. Insofar as the clairvoyant does not only think but also develops feeling and formative forces in such a way that they become interconnected, we cannot speak of a separation of feeling and willing. As regards the clairvoyant, we must speak of a feeling willing and a willing feeling, of a soul experience that combines these two, which go side by side in ordinary consciousness, into a totality of feeling willing. Sometimes this feeling is developed with greater nuance toward willing, at other times with more nuance toward feeling. When the clairvoyant, having raised his soul into the spiritual world, places himself into the musical element, he experiences everything that arises with the nuance of feeling in what is truly musical, genuinely musical. He experiences it in such a way that he does not separate the objective tone from the subjective experience of the tone, but rather that these are united in the clairvoyant experience, that the soul streams as the intermingling tones do, only everything is spiritualized. He experiences his soul poured out into the musical element, He knows that what he experiences through the newly developed feeling willing comes from the same source from which the musician draws what he enchants in the substance of the tone. It is interesting, particularly in regard to music, to research the reason why the creative musician unconsciously places the spiritual into his material. In music, the underlying element is revealed. Everything that arises unconsciously in the life of the soul joins very differently into the wonderful totality of our organism. We are realizing more and more that our organism ought not to be regarded as conventional biology and physiology regard it. Instead, it must be regarded as a reflection of a spiritual archetype. 
The human being steps into existence through birth, through conception, and makes use of that which he receives through hereditary laws and of that which descends from the spiritual world and relates to the physical in such a way that the physical really becomes a reflection of the spiritual. How this happens I cannot explain today. It is, however, a very objective fact that in our organism such an event takes place, an event that proceeds according to laws that reflect the spiritual. This is very particularly notable as regards music. We believe that the ear is involved in the appreciation of music and possibly the nervous system of our brain, but only in a very external view. In this realm, physiology is absolutely at the beginning. It will first reach a certain height when artistic thoughts flow into these realms of physiology and biology. The basis is something quite different from the process of hearing or from what happens in the nervous system of the brain. The basis of musical feeling can be described like this. Every time we breathe out, the brain, the space of the head, the inner space of the head is obliged through the breathing to let its cerebrospinal fluid descend through the spinal cord tissue down to the region of the diaphragm. A descent is caused. Conversely, breathing in causes the opposite to happen. Cerebrospinal fluid is driven toward the brain. A continually rhythmic rising and falling of the cerebrospinal fluid takes place. If this were not happening, the brain would not lose as much of its weight as is necessary for it to avoid crushing the blood vessels beneath it. If it did not lose so much of its weight, it would crush our blood vessels. The cerebrospinal fluid flows up and down in the area of the arachnoid membrane in expansions that are elastic or less elastic, so that while rising and falling the cerebrospinal fluid flows across the less elastic expansions, the more or less elastic expansions. This enables a quite marvelous rhythmic activity. The entire human organism, apart from the head and the limbs, expresses itself in this inner rhythm. Whatever streams into the ear as tone, whatever lives in us as the thought of tone, becomes music by encountering the inner music that is activated because the entire organism is a remarkable musical instrument, as I have just described it. If I were to describe everything to you, I would describe a wonderful inner human music that, though it is not heard, is experienced inwardly. What we experience as music is fundamentally nothing but the approach of an inner singing of the human organism. This human organism is, as regards what I have just described, an image of the macrocosm. We bear within ourselves, in the most concrete laws that are stricter than the laws of nature, this lyre of Apollo on which the cosmos plays in us. Our organism is not alone what biologists acknowledge, but is the most wonderful musical instrument. All sorts of crude things can be cited to show that the human being is constructed according to remarkable cosmic lawfulness. I will cite the most trivial. In one minute, we average 18 breaths. Let us calculate how much that is in a 24-hour day. That is 25,920 breaths, that many breaths in an entire day. Let us calculate a human day, a lifespan. Is it not so that although many people surpass this age, we can figure that a human day is 70 to 71 years? That is the cosmic day of the human being. Now try to calculate how many 24-hour days that gives us. 25,920. As many as the number of breaths you draw in a day. The world breathes us out and in, when we are born and when we die. The world takes just as many breaths during a human day as we do during our 24-hour day. Take the Platonic year. The sun rises in a particular sign of the zodiac. The vernal equinox advances. In ancient days, the sun rose in the sign of the bull, then in Aries, now in Pisces. Modern astronomy makes schemes. This vernal equinox 
seems, admittedly it only seems so, but that is not the point, to go around the entire sky. It moves around. Then, after a substantial number of years, it arrives back at the same point, that is, after 25,920 years. The Platonic year is reckoned as 25,920 years. Take a human day of 71 years, it numbers 25,920 individual days. Take a single 24-hour day in the life of a human being, it numbers 25,920 breaths. You see that we are incorporated into the cosmic rhythm. I believe, and from this point of view, many observations of this sort could be made, that there is no abstract religious idea that could evoke as much fervor as the consciousness of having one's own outer physical organism placed in such a way into the macrocosm, into the cosmic structure. The clairvoyant tries, spiritually, to penetrate this being placed into the cosmos. It works itself out in our inner music. What emerges from the organism there, what surges up into the soul, the resonance of the soul, the resonating with the cosmos, is the unconscious element of artistic creation. The whole world resonates when we create in a truly artistic way. There you have the common source of art and clairvoyance. In the artist it is unconscious as he works cosmic lawfulness into the material. In the clairvoyant it is conscious as he tries to see what is purely spiritual through clairvoyant consciousness. By studying these things in this way, we learn to recognize why what is inherent in the artist's material enters unconsciously into artistic creation. Just as inner music lives in the organism of our breathing and becomes outer music in art, so also with poetry. Their contemporary physiology is very, very far behind. For what ought to be studied so as to gain clarity is not the physiology of the senses, not the physiology of the nerves, but the realm of the border where brain and nervous system meet. There, just at the boundary, is that physiological realm where, if the human being is disposed, one always needs a disposition for art, the source of poetic creation lies. And the clairvoyant finds the realm of poetic creation in particular when he enters that realm of his inner experience, where the feeling willing leans more toward the side of the will. Usually the will expresses itself in the entire physical body. As regards imagination, the will lives where brain and nerves and sense organs collide. This is where the poetic images are conceived. When that is loosened from the body, it is through feeling willing that the clairvoyant enters the realm that harbors the same source from which the poet also creates. That is why the clairvoyant, through this feeling willing, sense of his, if he has acquired the sole condition necessary to enjoy poetry, feels himself to be in a curious state in the presence of poetry. He must see what the poet has formed. This leads to the fact that at the moment when the poet puts down one thing or another and does not create out of reality, putting down instead something that is merely thought up, assembled, unreal, inartistic, in that moment the clairvoyant sees in shapes and figures what is put down. If one is not clairvoyant, one does not perceive it so coarsely when the dramatist presents an unreal figure. For example, the clairvoyant can perceive Tekla in the title Wallenstein trilogy in no other way than as if made of paper mache, so that when he looks at her he continually sees her folding at the knees. And this is with a great poet. Every divergence from reality, every not showing of reality, is perceived, so that the clairvoyant has to recreate in sculptural form what the poet creates and has to remove his thinking from the sculpture. As regards the poet, the clairvoyant dives down into an inner sculpture. That is the oddity, that here, as regards poetry, the clairvoyant consciousness creates sculptures, so that the clairvoyant sees caricatures in what often becomes very famous. 
in this or that dramatic achievement, where it is not noticed that the figures are merely puppets stuffed with straw, the clairvoyant can do nothing other than see puppets stuffed with straw marching across the stage or appearing before him when he reads the play. Thus the clairvoyant has to endure pain on account of what is otherwise praised as a fad, for he sees what is created without true sculptural form in poetry. Christian Morgenstern, who strove for clairvoyance, uttered a fine remark. It is in the last volume of his posthumous work titled Stufen. There he says, when he wants to characterize his own soul, that he feels related to the architect, the sculptor. The feeling is that if we strive for clairvoyance, poetry is transformed into sculpture. If we see things in this way, we will never be able to believe that clairvoyance, with its inner mobility and receptivity for spiritual beings, could affect the artist harmfully and debilitatingly, but only as a good friend and patron. They cannot disturb each other. Only things that flow into one another can disturb each other. But the clairvoyant can never let his clairvoyance flow disturbingly into his artistry. He can only penetrate it clairvoyantly. They are entirely separated from one another. Flowing from the same source, they can never disturb each other in life. This is not appreciated enough today. It is difficult for the clairvoyant to make himself understood. He must use language. But with language we have something very strange. It only seems to be a unity. In reality it is a threefold entity. For we experience it on three levels. First of all, we have language that we use to make ourselves understood, one person to the next, in our Philistine life. And to say the words that must flow from person to person for the sake of this Philistine life. Anyone with a living feeling for language, anyone who can experience language from the perspective of clairvoyance, has no choice but to experience this as a repression of language. We might say, that person rants about life. He merely acknowledges that not everything can be perfect and thus fails to achieve perfection in a realm where imperfection must necessarily prevail. In outer physical life, it is definitely the case that there must be imperfections. Trees must not only grow, but also die. In life, imperfection must always be present so that perfection can arise. Language has been pushed down from its original level, has been pushed down to a subordinate stage. And with the way we use language in life, we could only become a schoolteacher who makes a straw-like being out of a withered, desiccated Philistine condition. Beyond that, we would achieve nothing. Words cannot have the value they have through their own nature, for that which language is as the property of a folk lives on its own level, and on its own level is a work of art, not a prosaic creation. It does not exist so as to provide understanding in daily life. As expression of the spirit of a folk, it is a work of art. We degrade it, and must do so, when we push something that is actually an artistic creation down into the prosaic aspect of life. It only achieves its being in the poetic creations of a folk when the spirit of the language truly reigns. That is the second way that language really lives. The third way can be experienced only at the level of clairvoyance. A clairvoyant is in an unusual situation, for he would like to express what is seen, but has no words to do so. In reality, the words do not exist. We cannot express what we see clairvoyantly in the same way as we learn to speak a language and to use words to express our intended meaning. Ordinary words are not made for expressing what we see clairvoyantly. That is why the clairvoyant must necessarily express some things very differently. He always grapples with language in order to say what he wants to say. He must choose the path so that he can clothe things in a sentence that approaches the expression of what he wants to say. He must 
utter a second sentence that brings something similar. He must reckon with the good will of his audience if the one sentence is to illuminate the other. If this good will is missing, then people want to reproach him with various contradictions. Someone who has to express something truly clairvoyant must speak in contradictions, and one contradiction must illuminate the other, for the truth lies in the middle. By entering into this, we come linguistically to something that also expresses in this realm the relationship between artistry and clairvoyance. The clairvoyant must indeed reckon with the goodwill that seeks to penetrate further into how he says things rather than what he says. He makes an effort to say much more in the way he speaks about something than in what he says about it. Eventually he manages to return to the creative spirit of language that reigned before there was any sort of language, to live once more into the sounds, into the genius of the sounds, to dive down into them. He sees how a vowel encloses itself, how a vowel soon flows into this or that language. The seer is obliged, in order to return to the creative condition of the language of a folk, to express himself more in the how than the what. Thereby it is possible to distinguish clairvoyantly and artistically the levels that stand side by side in language. Because clairvoyance and artistry are experienced separately, they cannot disturb one another. Instead, they can promote one another because they live side by side, illuminating one another reciprocally. A time will come in which art will no longer bear enmity toward clairvoyance, and neither will clairvoyance bear enmity toward art. For everything that is false clairvoyance, unfortunately, leans too much toward a suprasensory philistinism. To take everything not seen outwardly through the senses and clothe it in visionary clairvoyance, that is the enemy of art. But whatever is truly comprehended of the spiritual world through clairvoyant consciousness is indeed the same as what lives in artistic creativity and aesthetic feeling. One generally believes that the clairvoyance meant here is something alien to the human being. It stands in the midst of human life, but in a realm where it is not noticed. There is a big difference between observing a plant, a mineral, an animal, or another human being. Outer things affect us by means of what they are with the help of our sense organs. When one human being faces another human being, the senses work quite differently. In our time, people are completely averse to the spiritual. They say that some realms have overcome materialism. Yes, people speak of this today. You can easily find such analyses, but they say, when I am facing a human being, I see how his nose is formed, and according to a nose formed like this, I conclude that he is a human being, a conclusion based on analogy. In reality, there is no such thing. Someone with clairvoyant perception knows where the conclusions lie. Such conclusions, by means of analogies, do not exist. The soul of a human being is perceived directly. The outer sensory element is such that it cancels itself out. It is very important to apply this to art, because it illustrates the juxtaposition of clairvoyance and art. When we face a human being, we look at him and do not know that what appears of him appears in such a way that he cancels himself out, that he makes himself spiritually transparent. Every time I stand face to face with a human being, I see him clairvoyantly. For the clairvoyant, there is a particular problem when being approached by a human being, namely the mysterious incarnadine. When a human being steps toward him, the clairvoyant sees this incarnadine not at rest, but in oscillating motion. When facing someone, he sees a condition in which what usually appears in a person fades away, in which the person becomes warmer and redder than he is when moving back and forth in his physical form, so that it appears to the clairvoyant as if the human form changes, reddening with shame, becoming pale with fear, as if he continually establishes his normal condition between fear and shame, just as the pendulum has its point of stability 
between its upswing and its downswing. In Carnadine, as it appears outwardly, is merely a middle stage. The visible in Carnadine is bound to something of which the human being is unconscious. It enables a first unconscious seeing behind the scenes. Just as in the human in Carnadine, the clairvoyant sees something soulful in the sensory, a sensory suprasensory is what the clairvoyant sees in the incarnadine, so all color and form is transformed bit by bit so that he sees it spiritually. He sees it in such a way that in everything that is otherwise color or makes an impression of form, he perceives something inward. The most elementary aspect is found in the sensory moral part of Goethe's theory of color. The entire theory of color becomes an experience in which the clairvoyant perceives what is spiritual. He also experiences the rest of the spiritual world in such a way that he has the same experiences that he otherwise has with colors. In my title Theosophy, CW9, you will find that one sees what is spiritual in the form of a kind of aura. It is described in colors. Crude, clumsy people, without further knowledge of things, preferring to write books themselves, believe that the clairvoyant depicts the aura, depicts it by thinking there really is such a misty fog before him. What the clairvoyant has before himself is a spiritual experience. When he says the aura is blue, he says he has a soul spiritual experience that is like seeing blue. He depicts, at any rate, everything he experiences in the spiritual world that is analogous to what can be experienced in the sensory world by way of color. This gives an indication of how the clairvoyant experiences painting. It is unlike the experience of any other art. In the presence of every other art, he has the feeling that he is dipping down into the artistic element itself. He has the element, proceeds to a certain limit, and there clairvoyance ends. Were the clairvoyant to continue, he would have to place this color here, that color there. He would have to tint what he experiences entirely in colors if he were to proceed. When he experiences painting, this approaches him from the other side. By painting what is formed out of light and dark, the painter, when he creates in a truly painterly way, brings his artistic working to exactly that point where painting and clairvoyance meet, where clairvoyance begins. And clairvoyance extends exactly to where we would begin to paint if we proceeded outwardly. When we have a concrete clairvoyant idea, we know. There we would have to paint this color with a brush next to it another. Then we begin to grasp the mystery of color, to grasp what is in my mystery drama titled The Portal of Initiation, CW14, namely that the form of, is the work of color, that drawing lines is actually an artistic lie. There is no line. The ocean does not border the sky in a line where the colors meet each other. That is the border. I can get help from a line but it is only the result of how the colors meet. The secrets of colors are revealed. We discover that we complete an inner movement. That movement lives in what we paint. We know you can do this in no other way than by handling the blue in a particular way. We live with the inner nature of the color. That is what is special about painting, that clairvoyance and art and creativity touch one another. When we understand what this realm is about, we will see that what is meant by clairvoyance can be a close companion of artistic creativity, that they stimulate and fructify one another. Mind you, it will become ever more evident that someone who has never held a brush in his hand and does not know what to do with it ought not to pass judgment on the basis of abstractions. Criticism, apart from art, critical criticism, will have to move into the background when the friendship between art and clairvoyance steps forward. But the very thing that is here meant by spiritual science is very different from what one used to and still does call aesthetics. Artists have told me that such people are called, quote, aesthetic spoilsports, close quote. 
That is not what is meant here. What is meant here is living in the same element as the artist. Only that the clairvoyant has experiences in pure spirit of what the artist shapes. I must say this seems to be one of the many challenges facing humanity. I believe that the time in which one assumed that what is elemental and original is diminished by spiritual research will end. Christian Morgenstern said, quote, Whoever wants merely to immerse himself with feeling into what can presently be experienced of the divine spiritual, without seeking to understand it, is like an illiterate person who all his life sleeps with a primer under his pillow. Close quote. We live in a time in which much that is unconscious must be raised into consciousness. Clairvoyance will stand on solid ground only when it surpasses all philosophy and feels itself to be related to art. I believe that also in this realm there is something connected to the significant questions of human evolution. We will realize more and more that a suprasensory world is the foundation of the sensory world. Whatever is recognized through suprasensory clairvoyance cannot be an arbitrary addition to life. Instead, Goethe's utterance based on his life experience is the truth. Quote, when nature begins to disclose her revealed secret, we experience an irresistible yearning for its worthiest interpreter, art. Close quote. Whoever wants to understand how art is part of all life, of all future evolution, whoever understands art feelingly, according to its true being, must admit that clairvoyance will in the future stand hand in hand with artists, newly inspiring and supporting them. The end of Lecture 10.6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com as well, these podcasts are at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art, translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno, composed of essays and lectures. I am on section 11.7, which is the seventh of eight lectures and the eleventh section in the book. The title of this lecture is The Suprasensory Origin of Art, given in Dornach on September 12, 1920. What humanity needs to acquire as regards the necessities of evolution is a broadening of consciousness in all spheres of life. Today, humanity lives in such a way that whatever it carries out, whatever it does, actually merely connects to events between birth and death. Concerning everything that takes place in existence, one only asks about what happens between birth and death. To restore health to our lives, it will be essential that more is considered than this span of time in life, which we spend in very special circumstances. Our life includes what we are between birth and death, and also what we are and what we do between death and a new birth. Today, in our materialistic age, one has little consciousness of the life we have had between death and birth before we descended into this life through birth or conception. And in turn, one is not conscious of how, in this life, here in the physical body, things take place that play into the life we lead after death. Today we would like to point out certain things that will be able to show how certain cultural realms will take on a different relationship to human life because human consciousness will and must expand into life in supersensory worlds. I believe a certain question arises when we consider the entire scope of our artistic life. Today, let us look at suprasensory life from this perspective. Something will become evident that later on will also be valuable in examining social life. We know that essentially the actual high arts are sculpture, architecture, painting, poetry, music, and let us add something like eurythmy to these arts, 
simply out of certain foundations of anthroposophical life and knowledge. The question I mean, which might arise for someone who contemplates the artistic life, is what is the positive, the actual reason why we bring the arts into life? Only in a materialistic age is art actually related to the immediate reality of what proceeds between birth and death. In this materialistic age, however, we have forgotten the suprasensory origin of art and consider more or less only what can be copied in outer sensory nature. Only someone who truly has a deeper feeling for nature on the one hand and art on the other will take issue with this copying of nature in art. For the question must indeed arise ever and again. Can, for example, the best landscape painter somehow conjure up a natural landscape on his canvas? Whoever is not ignorant will, even in the presence of a really well-conceived, naturalistic landscape, have to feel what I expressed in the prologue to my first mystery drama titled Portal of Initiation, CW14. Namely, that we will never attain to nature by copying nature. For someone with superior feeling, naturalism will prove to be displeasing. Such a person will most certainly be able to consider as justified only that element in art which in some way goes beyond naturalism, which attempts, at least in the manner of its portrayal, to provide something more than what nature alone can present to us. But how do we, as human beings, manage even to cultivate art? Why is it that in sculpture and poetry we go beyond nature? Whoever gains a sense for cosmic connections will see how, for example, sculpture attempts, in its own particular way, to capture the human form, how the attempt is made to bring what is human to expression in the shaping of the form, how we cannot simply embody the human form as it appears to us in the natural human being, infused with inner ensoulment, with the incarnadine, with what we see in the natural human being apart from the form, when we work on a sculptural work of art to form a human being. But I believe that the sculptor who sculpts human beings will eventually rise to a very particular feeling, and I have no doubt that the Greek sculptor had the feeling of which I am now speaking, and that it was only in the naturalistic era that this feeling was lost. It seems to me that a sculptor has a very different kind of feeling when he forms a head than when he forms the rest of the body. These two things are actually fundamentally different from one another when they are worked on, forming the head sculpturally and forming the rest of the body sculpturally. If I may be allowed to express myself somewhat drastically, I might say, when we work on forming the human head sculpturally, we have the feeling that we are continually being absorbed by the material, that the material wants to pull us in. But when we work sculpturally on the rest of the human body, then we feel we are unjustifiably poking into the body all over, pressing into it, that we push from the outside in. We have the feeling that we form the rest of the body from the outside, shape the forms from the outside. When forming the body, we feel we are working inward. When forming the head, we feel we are working outward. It seems to me that this feeling is particular to sculptural formation, that it certainly still belonged to the Greek artist, and that it was lost only in the naturalistic era in which we have begun to be slaves to the model. We might ask ourselves, what is the source of just such a feeling when we intend to fashion the human form out of a suprasensory orientation? All of this is connected to much deeper questions, and there is one more thing I would like to mention before moving on. Just think of how, as regards sculpture and architecture, we have the feeling of a particular inner experience, even though sculpture and architecture seem to shape outer material outwardly. As regards architecture, we experience the dynamic inwardly. We experience inwardly how the column creates the beam, how the column develops into the capital. 
we experience inwardly what is outwardly formed. And the case is similar as regards sculpture. This is not the case with music, and certainly not with poetry. It seems to me that in the case of poetry it is obvious that in forming the poetic material, it is like this, let me express it drastically again, it is as if when we begin to form the words, which we must retain in our larynx when speaking prose, into iams or trochees, when we rhyme with these, they would run away and we would have to run after them. They populate the atmosphere surrounding us more than what is inward. We experience poetry as much more outward than, for example, architecture and sculpture. And this is no doubt how it is with music when we direct our feelings toward it. Musical tones also enliven the entire surroundings. We actually forget space and time, or at least space, and we live outside of ourselves in moral experience. We do not have the feeling, as we do with poetry, that we must run after the forms we create, but we have the feeling that we must swim into a vague element that spreads itself out everywhere and that we dissolve in this swimming. There, you see, we begin to perceive nuances in the entire being of art. We ascribe very particular characteristics to these perceptions. What I have just described for you, which is something that I believe a subtle artistic feeling can sympathize with, cannot be believed when we look at a crystal or some other mineral product of nature or a plant or an animal or a real physical human being. We perceive and feel all of outer physical sensory nature differently than the perception and feeling that I have just now described in relation to individual branches of artistic experience. We can speak of suprasensory knowledge as a transformation of ordinary abstract knowledge into a clairvoyant knowing and can direct attention to an experiential knowing. It is absurd to demand that we prove things in higher realms in the same logical, pedantic, philistine manner that we prove things in natural science or mathematics, and so forth. If we live into the perceptions and feelings that arise when we enter artistic realms, then eventually we enter into strange inner soul conditions. Very definitely, nuanced soul conditions arise when we really experience sculpture or architecture inwardly. When we accompany the dynamic, the mechanics, and so forth of architecture, when we accompany the curvature of form in sculpture, a remarkable path comes about there for the inner world of feelings. Here we move in response to a soul experience in a way that is very similar to memory. Whoever experiences remembering, whoever has the experience of memory, notices how the perception of the architecture and sculpture becomes similar to the inner process of remembering. But, yet again, the remembering is on a higher level. In other words, we gradually approach, along the paths of architectural and sculptural feeling, that soul perception which the spiritual researcher knows as the recollection of pre-birth conditions. And indeed, the way we live between death and a new birth in relationship to the whole cosmos, and so far as we feel how we move as a soul spirit or spirit soul in many directions, how we interact with beings, how we attain balance in the presence of other beings, everything we thus experience and perceive between death and a new birth, this is in fact unconsciously remembered and then reproduced in the art of architecture and sculpture. And if we inwardly accompany this peculiarity as regards sculpture and architecture, then we discover that we actually want nothing other in this sculpture and architecture than to conjure into the physical sense world the experiences we had in the spiritual world before our birth, before our conception. If we do not build houses strictly according to the principle of utility and instead build houses that are architecturally beautiful, then we shape the dynamic conditions as they arise in our memory of experiences, experiences of balance, of oscillation and so forth that we had in the time between death and this birth. And we thereby discover 
how the human being actually came to develop architecture and sculpture into art forms. The experience between death and a new birth stirred in his soul. He wanted to bring it out and place it before himself somehow. And so he created architecture and he created sculpture. That humanity brought forth architecture and sculptures, part of its cultural development, is essentially the result of the after-effects of life between death and birth, which the human being wants to put forward out of his inner life. Just as the spider spins its web, so does the human being produce and shape what he experiences between death and rebirth. He carries these pre-birth experiences into physical sensory life. And what we see before us when we survey the architectural and sculptural artworks of humanity is nothing other than the realization of unconscious memories of life between death and a new birth. Now we have a real answer to the question, why does the human being create form? If the human being were not a suprasensory being who comes into this life through conception, through birth, he would most certainly not pursue sculpture and he would most certainly not pursue architecture. And we know what sort of curious connections exist between two, or let us say three, successive earth lives. The head you have today is, in the forces of its form, the remodeled headless body of the former incarnation. And the body you have today will remodel itself into your head before your next incarnation. The head of the human being has a very different meaning. It is old. It is the transformed previous life. The forces we experienced between the previous death and this birth formed the outer shape of the head. The body carries, in germinal state, the forces that in the next earth life will come into form. There you have the reason why the sculptor experiences the head differently from the rest of the body. As regards the body, he feels something like this. The head wants to absorb him because the head is formed through forces from the previous incarnation that rest in his current form. As regards the rest of the body, he feels something like this. He wants to go into it, press into it, and so forth by sculpturally forming it, because in it rest the spiritual forces that lead through death and over into the next incarnation. This radical difference between the past and future in the human body is what the sculptor senses especially clearly. Whatever consists of the formative forces of the physical body, what they carry over from incarnation to incarnation, is what comes to expression in sculpture. Whatever sits more deeply in the etheric body which bears our sense of balance, is the carrier of our dynamic. This comes to expression more in the art of architecture. You see, we can hardly grasp human life in its entirety if we do not look at the suprasensory life, if we do not earnestly consider the question, how do we come to form architecture and sculpture? People do not want to look at the suprasensory world because they do not want to look at the things of this world in the proper way. How do most people, in essence, face the arts that reveal a spiritual world, in fact, like a dog in the presence of human language? The dog hears the human language and presumably takes it to be barking. He does not hear what is in the sounds as meaning, unless he happens to be Mannheim or Hof. This was a docile dog who caused a sensation some time ago among people who concern themselves with such useless arts. That is how a human being faces the arts that actually speak of the supersensory world we have experienced. Namely, he does not see in these arts what these arts actually reveal. Let us look, for example, at the art of poetry. For someone who can feel what poetry is, it becomes clear that poetry really stems from the entire human being. Only we must keep in mind when characterizing such things that with some variation Lichtenberg's words apply, namely that 99% 
more poetry is written than humanity needs for its fortunes, and none of it is actually real art. And what does real poetry do? It does not stick with prose, but forms prose, brings pacing and rhythm into prose. It fashions something that the prosaic pedant simply finds superfluous for life. It further forms something that even unformed would provide the meaning we would connect with it. If in listening to a truly artistic recitation, we obtain a feeling for what the poet has extracted from the prose content, then we arrive again at the unique character of the feelings. After all, we cannot perceive only the content, the prosaic content of a poem, as the poem. Rather, we perceive the way the words roll along in iams and trochees or anapests, how the sounds are repeated through alliteration, assonance, or rhyme. We perceive much more that lies in the how of the structure of the prosaic material. That, after all, is what must go into the recitation. If in recitation we merely emphasize the prose content, even if ever so seemingly profoundly, then we think we are reciting artistically, in quotes. But if we can really retain these peculiarities of nuanced feeling, which include the feeling for what is poetic, then we conclude for ourselves that this actually goes beyond ordinary perception. For ordinary perception clings to sense-perceptible things. Poetic composition does not cling to the things of sensory existence. Earlier on I expressed it by saying, what is composed poetically then lives more in the atmosphere that surrounds us. We are inclined to rush out of ourselves so as to actually experience the words of the poet properly outside of ourselves. That is because we compose something out of ourselves that we cannot experience at all between birth and death. We compose something out of the soul substance that if we want merely to live between birth and death, we can just as easily avoid. We can quite easily live and die without doing anything other than making dry prosaic content the content of our life. But why do we experience the desire to add extra rhythm and assonance and alliteration and rhyme to this dry prosaic content? Well, because we have more in ourselves than is needed in life before death, because we want already during life to give shape to what is more than is needed in life before birth. It is anticipation of the life that follows death. We are pressed not just to talk, but to talk poetically, because we already carry what follows after death within ourselves. And just as sculpture and architecture are related to life before birth, with the forces that are in us from before birth, so poetry is connected with life as it unfolds after death, or rather, with the forces that are already in us for life after death. And it is more the I capital, as it lives here between birth and death, as it goes to the portal of death and then lives on, that already carries in itself the forces expressed in poetry. And it is the astral body, which already lives here in the world of tone, which forms melody and harmony out of this world of tone, that we do not find in the outer physical world, For what the astral body experiences after death is already carried in the astral body. You know that this astral body that we carry in ourselves continues to live for only a while after death, then we put it aside. Nevertheless, this astral body actually contains a musical element, but it contains it in the same way that it experiences it it here between birth and death in its life element, the air. We need the air if we want to have a medium for musical experience. When we have reached the stage after death in which we discard our astral body, then we also discard everything of a musical nature that reminds us of this earth life. But in this cosmic moment, musicality is transformed into the music of the spheres. 
we become independent of what we experience musically in the air and raise ourselves up to live a musicality that is the music of the spheres. For what is experienced here as music in the air is the music of the spheres above. And now the reflection works its way into the element of the air, becomes denser, becomes that which we experience as earthly music, which we imprint into our astral body, which we shape, which we relive as long as we still have our astral body. After death we put aside our astral body. Then, forgive the banal expression, what is musical in us jumps up into the music of the spheres. Thus, in music and poetry, we have a preview of what our world is after death, what our existence is. We experience what is suprasensory in two directions. In this way do these four arts stand before us. And, painting, there is another spiritual world that lies beyond our sense world. The crudely materialistic physicist or biologist speaks of atoms and molecules underlying the sense world. There are no molecules and atoms. There are spiritual beings underlying them. A world of spirit is there, the world in which we live between going to sleep and waking up. This world which we bring back out of sleep is the one that actually fuels us when we paint so that we are at all able to bring the spatial world surrounding us onto the canvas or the wall. Therefore, when painting, we must be very mindful of painting out of the color and not out of the line. For in painting, the line deceives. The line is always something of the memory of pre-earthly life. To paint in a consciousness broadened, to include the spiritual world, we must paint what comes out of the color. And we know that color is experienced in the astral world. When we enter the world in which we live, between going to sleep and waking up, we experience this realm of color. And how we want to create a harmony of colors, how we bring the colors onto the canvas, this is nothing other than what presses us. Thus we press, we let flow into our body what we experience between going to sleep and waking up. That is within us. And that is what we want to bring onto the canvas in painting. What we encounter through painting is a reproduction of the suprasensory. The arts actually indicate the suprasensory everywhere. For someone who can perceive painting in the right way, it becomes a revelation of the spiritual world that surrounds us in space and penetrates us from space. The world in which we find ourselves between going to sleep and awakening. Sculpture and architecture become witnesses for the spiritual world we live in between death and a new birth, before conception, before birth. Music and poetry are witnesses of how we live post-mortem, after death. In this way, what constitutes our portion of the spiritual world penetrates into our ordinary physical earth life. And if we look at what the human being places into life through the arts in a banal way, as related only to what happens between birth and death, then we actually rob artistic creativity of all meaning. For artistic creativity is definitely a matter of carrying spiritual suprasensory worlds into the physical sensory world. And only because the human being is pressed by what he carries within himself out of his pre-earthly life, because he is pressed when awake by what he carries out of his suprasensory life when he sleeps, because he is pressed by what is already in him and wants to shape him after death, does he place architecture, sculpture, painting, music, and poetry into the world of sensory experience. The reason people do not usually speak about supersensory worlds is simply because they do not understand the sensory, and above all, because they do not even understand what once was known by spiritual human culture, but has since been lost and has become outer convention, art. Once we learn to understand art, 
we have real proof for human immortality and for the human being's unbornness. And this is what we need so that consciousness broadens beyond the horizon that is limited by birth and death, so that we relate what we have within ourselves in our physical earth life with the supra-physical life. If we work to recognize the spiritual world, to imagine the spiritual world, to take it up into thinking, into feeling, into perception, and into willing, out of a knowledge that addresses it directly as spiritual science does, then there will be fertile ground for an art that combines, so to speak, what comes from pre-birth with what comes after death. Let us therefore consider you with me. The human body itself is brought into movement. What is brought into movement? We bring the human organism into movement so that the limbs move. The extremities are what mainly continue to live in the following earth life, which points toward the future, the after death. But how then do we form what we present as movement of the limbs in eurythmy? We study, in a sensory, supersensory manner, how, out of the head, through intellectual capacities and through the tendencies of feeling in the chest, the larynx and the entire speech organ has been formed out of the previous life. We connect pre-birth existence directly with after-death existence. We take, so to speak, from earthly life only that which is physical material namely the human being himself, who is the tool, the instrument for eurythmy. In eurythmy we furnish a form and movement of the human organism, such that it is the immediate outer proof of the human being's presence in the supersensory world. When we let the human being do eurythmy, we connect him directly to the suprasensory world. Wherever art is shaped out of a truly artistic attitude, It is the witness for the connection between the human being and the suprasensory world. And when the human being of the present day is called upon to take the gods into his own soul forces, so to speak, so that he does not merely wait devoutly for the gods to bring him this or that, but instead wants to act as if the gods lived in his active will, then the moment has come, if human beings want to experience it, in which the human being must proceed from the objectively shaped arts to an art which will take on quite different dimensions and forms in the future, to an art that represents the suprasensory directly. How can it be any other way? Spiritual science also wants to represent the suprasensory directly, so it must, in a manner of speaking, also create such an art out of itself and the application of pedagogy will bit by bit educate human beings who through this education find their way toward taking for granted that they are supersensory beings because they move their hands, their arms, their legs in such a way that forces of the supersensory world are active within them. It is, after all, the soul of the human being, the suprasensory soul, that goes over into movement in eurythmy. Everything that is brought through spiritual science really is in agreement inwardly. On the one hand, it is brought so that the life within which we stand can be penetrated more deeply, more intensively, so that we can learn to direct our gaze to the living proofs that exist for being unborn and for being immortal. And on the other hand, the supersensory element of the human being is placed into the human being. That is the inner consequence that underlies spiritual scientific striving when it has an anthroposophical orientation. Spiritual science will thereby broaden human consciousness. A human being will no longer be able to go through the world as he did in the materialistic age, having actually only an overview of what happens between birth and death having perhaps a belief in something or the other that exists apart from his life, something that blesses him, redeems him, but that he cannot picture at all, that he always accepts as sentimental preaching, 
and of which he actually retains merely empty content. Spiritual science is to provide the human being once again with true content of the spiritual world. People are to be redeemed from living in abstraction, from that life which merely wants to remain stalled at perception, at thinking between birth and death, and which at most takes up in words some sort of nebulous indication of a suprasensory world. Spiritual science will bring a consciousness into the human being that will widen his horizon and through which, as he lives and acts here in the physical world, he will perceive the suprasensory world. It is true that today we go through the world when we are thirty years old and know that what we are at thirty was instilled in us at age ten or fifteen. We remember that. We remember when we read a book at age thirty that the fact that we learned to read twenty-two or twenty-three years ago is connected with the current moment. But we do not pay attention to the fact that at every moment between birth and death, what we live through between the last death and this birth vibrates in us, pulses in us. Let us look at what is born in architecture and sculpture from out of these forces. If we understand this in the right way, then we will also be able to carry it over into life in the right way. And we will also achieve once again a feeling for what is superfluous, for Philistine prosaic life. Namely, the shaping of prose into rhythm and meter and rhyme, into alliteration and assonance in poetry. Then we will relate these nuances of feeling with the immortal kernel of our being that we carry through death. We will say no human being could become a poet were it not for the fact that every human being harbors what actually creates within the poet, namely the force that only becomes outwardly alive after death, but that is already in us. This is the integration of the suprasensory into ordinary consciousness, which must expand once more if humanity does not wish to sink more deeply into the realm into which it has been brought through the fact that consciousness has so greatly condensed and actually only lives in what plays itself out between birth and death and at best only preaches empty words about what is present in the supersensory world. You see, we arrive everywhere at spiritual science when we speak of the most important cultural needs of the present. The end of lecture 11.7 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com As well, you can hear the podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, standardbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 271, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Art and Theory of Art, Foundations of a New Aesthetics. This is the last lecture. It is the twelfth part of the book, but the eighth of these eight lectures at the end, the end of the whole book. So it's numbered uh, part 12.8. It's entitled The Psychology of the Arts, and it was given in Dornach on April 9, 1921, and this whole series was translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. How should we speak about the arts? This is a question, I may as well say, with which I have been wrestling all my life and I will allow myself to take my point of departure from two areas within which I made the attempt to pause in this wrestling. The first time was when, at the end of the 1880s, I had to deliver my lecture at the Goethe Society of Vienna, entitled Goethe as Father of a New Aesthetics. As regards what I wanted to say about the being of the arts, I felt at the time like someone who wants to speak but is mute, and must therefore express what he means through gestures. The reason was that at the time, due to certain life circumstances, it was suggested that I speak philosophically about the essence of the arts. I had worked my way through from the philosophy of Kant to that of Herbart, and I encountered this Herbartian philosophy in Vienna through a representative, the aesthetician Robert Zimmermann. 
Zimmermann had completed his title History of Aesthetics as Philosophical Science quite some time earlier. He had also already presented his systematic treatise on title General Aesthetics as a Science of Form to the World, and I had faithfully worked my way through what Robert Zimmermann, the Herbartian aesthetician, had to convey in this realm. And then during the lecture at the University of Vienna, this representative of Herbartianism was present. When I got to know Robert Zimmermann personally, I was entirely satisfied by the deep, soulful, excellent personality of this man. What lived in this human being, Robert Zimmermann, could only make an extraordinary and deeply sympathetic impression. I have to say that although Robert Zimmermann's entire bearing had something exceptionally stiff about it, I liked much that was in his stiffness, because the manner in which he spoke, out of the particular coloration that the German language takes on among those who speak with a Bohemian accent, using Prague German, using this particular nuance of German, was especially sympathetic to me. This Prague German of Robert Zimmermann made it possible for me to be extraordinarily sympathetic when he said to me, who had at that time already been intensively occupied with Goethe's theory of color, quote, Oh, Goethe is not to be taken seriously as a physicist. A man who could not even understand Newton is not to be taken seriously as a physicist. Close quote. And I have to say that the content of this sentence was entirely wiped out by the completely coquettishly gracious manner with which something like this could be conveyed by Robert Zimmermann. I really liked such opposition very much. But then, or perhaps it was already earlier, I got to know Robert Zimmermann when he lectured from the lectern as a Herbartian. And I must say that then the amiable, sympathetic man ceased to exist aesthetically, and a Herbartian at that. At first I did not know what to make of how this man stepped through the door, stepped up to the podium, laid aside his fine walking stick, took off his coat in a peculiar way, stepped in a peculiar way toward the chair, sat down in a peculiar way, took his glasses in a peculiar way, stayed silent for a while in a peculiar way, in a peculiar way looked out with his soulful eyes, once he had removed the glasses, to the left, to the right, into the distance over the modest number in the audience, there was something striking in it. But since I had intensively occupied myself for some time already with Herbartian works, it dawned on me immediately after the first impression, so that I said to myself, Oh, yes, there an entrance is made Herbartianly. There the fine walking stick is laid aside Herbartianly. There the coat is taken off, Herbartianly. There is one who gazes in an Herbartian manner at the audience without glasses. And now Robert Zimmermann began to speak in his extraordinarily sympathetic dialect, imbued with its Prague characteristics about practical philosophy. And lo and behold, this Prague German clothed itself into the form of Herbartian aesthetics. I had this experience And then I understood well from the subjective standpoint of Zimmermann what it actually meant that as the motto of Zimmermannian aesthetics on the very first page stood Schiller's saying, admittedly transplanted into Herbartianism by Robert Zimmermann, the true secret of art for the master lies in the eradication of matter through form. For I had seen how this amiable, sympathetic, thoroughly gracious man seemed to have eradicated himself as content in order to reappear in Herbartian form at the lectern. For the psychology of the arts it was an exceptionally significant impression. And if you acknowledge that one can make such a characterization, even when one is fond of a person, then you will not misunderstand my words here. Robert Zimmermann, whom I greatly honored, might forgive me for using the word anthroposophy, which he used in a book to designate a cardboard figure assembled of logical, aesthetic, and ethical abstractions. For using this word in order to consider the spiritualized 
and ensouled human being scientifically. Robert Zimmermann called his book, in which he carried out the procedure I have just described, titled Anthroposophy. When I delivered my lecture on titled Goethe as Father of a New Aesthetics, I had to free myself of this experience in which the so-called artistic element appeared to have been cast into a contentless form. I was able to take up Zimmermann's fully justified view that in art one is dealing not with content, not with the what, but rather with what is created from out of the observed content by human imagination and creativity. And we also saw how Herbart took this form from Schiller. I was completely able to accept what was thoroughly justified in this tendency, but I could not prevent myself from opposing it by arguing that that which can be achieved as form by real imagination must be raised up and must appear in the work of art in such a way that we derive from the work of art an impression similar to the one we otherwise get only from the world of ideas. Spiritualizing what the human being can perceive, carrying the sensory up into the sphere of the spirit, not destroying the material through the form. This was how I tried at the time to free myself from what I had taken up from the Herbartian aesthetics I had faithfully studied. Mind you, other elements also played a role. A philosopher of that day, whom I liked as much as I liked Robert Zimmermann, whom I valued extraordinarily as a human being, Edward von Hartmann, had written in all areas of philosophy, and it was just at that time that he also wrote on aesthetics, partly in a similar vein and partly out of a different spirit than Robert Zimmermann. And again, you will not interpret the objectivity I am striving for as if I intend to be unkind. The aesthetics of Edward von Hartmann can be characterized by indicating that he peeled something away from the arts, which actually were rather remote for him, that he then called the aesthetic illusion. He peeled away this so-called aesthetic illusion from the arts in a manner approximately resembling the flaying of a living human being. And then, after this procedure, after having, so to speak, flayed the arts, the living arts, Edward von Hartmann made this the basis for his aesthetics. And is it surprising that this peeled-off skin became leather under the hard use that it suffered through the aestheticians who stand so removed from art? That was the second thing from which I had to free myself at the time. And I tried to incorporate into my lecture something that I might describe thus. If a philosopher wants to talk about the arts he must be able to have the capacity for renunciation, to become mute to some extent, and to indicate only through chaste gestures what can never really be penetrated by philosophical language, before which it must come to a standstill and indicate the essentials like a mute observer. That was the mood, characterized psychologically, in which I gave my lecture on titled Goethe as Father of a New Aesthetics. Then later the task came to me to consider for a second time the question I characterized initially today. It was while I gave a talk to anthroposophists on titled The Being of the Arts, and now, given the mood of the entire milieu at the time, I could not speak in the same manner. Now I wanted to speak in such a way that I myself could remain within the artistic experience. I now wanted to speak about art in an artistic way and I knew again that I was on the opposite shore from the one I had been on at the time I delivered my lecture on Goethe as father of the new aesthetics. And I now spoke in such a way that I carefully avoided sliding into philosophical formulations. For I experienced how the actual being of art grows removed from the words when one slides into philosophical characterizations. At the time, the inartistic aspect of mere concept ransacked the forces out of which the talk emanated, and out of that mood I attempted to speak more psychologically about the arts, thus avoiding in the strictest sense sliding into philosophical formulations. 
Today I am supposed to speak again about the psychology of the arts. It is actually not especially easy to pause at any other point after one has inwardly experienced both of the other phases. I saw no other way forward than to turn my attention to life. I looked for some sort of point by means of which I could enter into life with my considerations of art. And lo and behold, I discovered, as if it were obvious, the delightful romantic poet Novalis. And if, after this encounter with Novalis, I then raised the question, quote, what is poetic? What is actually contained in this particular form of the artistic experience of poetic life? Close quote. Then the living figure of Novalis stood before me. Remarkably, Novalis was born into this world with a particular basic feeling that lifted him above outer prosaic reality for the entire duration of his physical life. There is something in this personality that seems gifted with wings to soar poetically above the prose of life, something that lived among us human beings as if it wanted to express once in the history of the world. This is how the outer sense reality relates to the truly poetical. And this personality of Novalis finds its way into life and develops a spiritual, utterly real love for the twelve-year-old Sophie von Kuhn. And all of this love for this sexually immature girl is clothed in the most wonderful poetry, clothed in such poetry that in considering this relationship one is never tempted to think of anything sensually real. But the uttermost ardor of human feeling that can be experienced when the human soul soars as though in poetic spheres above prosaic reality, the uttermost ardor of this feeling lives in this love of Novalis for Sophie von Kuhn. And this girl dies two days after the completion of her fourteenth year, at a time when other people are so strongly affected by the reality of the physical body that they descend into the sexuality of the physical body. But before this could happen for Sophie von Kuhn, she is taken up into the spiritual world. And Novalis decides out of a consciousness that is stronger than the instinctive poetical consciousness he had previously experienced, to follow Sophie von Kuhn into death in his living soul experience. He lives with Sophie, who is no longer in the physical world. And those who, with the deepest feeling for human nature, encountered Novalis after this time, said that he wandered about on the earth, alive but like someone taken up into spiritual worlds, who speaks to something that is not on the earth, and does not really belong to the earth in reality. And he himself thinks of himself within this poetic, non-prosaic reality, in such a way that what others can see only by overcoming outer forces, the fullest expression of will reaching into reality, already appears within the poetically ideal world, and he speaks of, quote, magical idealism, close quote, when designating his life's direction. If we then try to understand everything that this wonderfully constituted soul could love without outer reality, without touching outer reality, the soul that could, in other words, live with what was really torn from it before a certain phase of outer reality had been attained, and if we engage with all that then flowed out of this soul, we receive the purest expression of what is poetical. And a psychological question is solved simply by entering more deeply into the stream of poetry that flows out of Novalis's poetry and prose. Then, however, we have a remarkable impression. We have the impression, if in this way we penetrate psychologically more deeply into the essence of the poetical, through the reality of a life, through the life of Novalis, so that we arrive at something behind the poetical, something that resounds through all that is poetical. We then have the impression as though this Novalis were emerging out of spiritual soul spheres, as though he brought with him something that overshadowed outer prosaic life with poetic radiance. We get the impression that there a soul which bore its spiritual soul aspect in purest form entered the world 
so that it ensouled and spiritualized the entire body and absorbed space and time into its soul constitution, which was spiritual and ensouled, in such a way that space and time, thus casting off their outer nature, reappeared poetically in the soul of Novalis. In Novalis's poetry, it is like a devouring of space and time. We see how his poetry enters into the world with strength of soul and strength of spirit, and out of this strength it arranges itself into space and time. But it overpowers space and time. Space and time melt because of the strength of the human soul. And in this melting of space and time, through the strength of the human soul, lies the psychology of poetry. But something like a deep foundation resounds through this melting of space and time in Novalis. We can hear it everywhere through what Novalis revealed to the world, and then we can do nothing but say to ourselves, whatever soul is, whatever spirit is, there it came to light in order to remain poetical, in order by acquiring space and time to melt space and time poetically. But for the time being, something remained as the foundation of this soul, something lay most deeply within the human soul, lay so deeply within it that it could be discovered as a sculpting force because it shapes the deepest relationships within the human organism, because it lives as creative soul within the innermost region of the human being. In all of Novalis' poetry, music lives as a foundational element, musicality, the resounding artistic world that reveals itself out of the harmony of the world, and that is also the element that creates artistically from out of the cosmos within the most intimate aspect of the being of man. If we attempt to enter into the sphere where the most intimate aspect of spirit soul is creative within the human being, then we reach a musical shaping in the human being, and then we say to ourselves, before the musician sounds his tones into the world, the musical being itself has gripped the being of the musician and incorporated musicality, built musicality into his human nature. And the musician reveals what the world harmony laid into the foundations of his soul unconsciously. And that is the reason for the mysterious effect of music. Thereupon also rests the fact that as regards a comparison of what is musical with what is involved in speech, we can really only say, music expresses the innermost human feeling. And by entering into this poetry of Novalis, after having first prepared ourselves for it, through the appropriate experiences, we grasp something I might call the psychology of music. And then we consider the end of Novalis's life, which took place in his twenty-ninth year. Novalis departed life without pain, but in devotion to the element that had resounded through his poetry during his entire lifetime. His brother had to play the piano as he lay dying, and the element he had brought with him so as to let it resound in his poetry. This was now to take him up as he died, out of the prosaic reality into the spiritual world. Novalis, at age 29, died as the piano resounded. He sought that musical homeland, which, in the full sense of the word, he had left behind when he was born, so that he might extract from it the musicality of poetry. This, I would say, is how we move from reality into the psychology of the arts. It must be a tender path, an inner path, and it must not be made skeletal by abstract philosophical forms, neither those derived in the sense of Herbart from rational thinking, nor those that, in the sense of Gustav Fechner, are the bones of the external observation of nature. And Novalis thus stands before us, released by music, allowing music to resound in his poetry, melting space and time in his poetry, without touching the external prosaic reality of space and time in his magical idealism, and then entering into musical spirituality once more. And the question may arise, if Novalis had been organized in such a way that he could have lived longer, if what spoke, suffused with musicality and poetry, through his poetry, 
in an inwardly effective psychology of the human soul and spirit. If this had not again returned to its musical homeland at age 29, but instead had lived on in a more robust physical organization, into what would this soul have found its way? Into what would this soul have found its way if it had had to remain longer in the prosaic reality it had left during the time when there was still time to return into the spaceless world of music without touching external space and external time? I am not interested in providing a theoretical answer to this question. Here, too, I would like to consider reality, and the answer is there. The answer has played itself out in further stages of development. When Goethe reached the age at which Novalis, in his musical, poetic mood, departed the physical world, there arose in Goethe's soul the deepest longing to penetrate into that artistic world, which had achieved the most in the shaping of that being which can express itself in space and time. At that time in his life a burning desire arose in Goethe, to travel south, to experience in Italy's art something of the space and time that had given rise to an art which had understood how to carry what was authentically artistic into forms of space and time, above all into forms of space. And when Goethe stood before the Italian works of art that spoke out of space, not only to the senses but also to the soul, a thought arose in his soul. Namely, he realized how the Greeks whose creations he thought he recognized in these works of art, had created as nature itself creates, and he believed he was on course to find their natural creative laws. And out of his soul and spirit there escaped the thought that there in the forms of space a religious feeling presented itself to him. Quote, there is necessity, there is God. Close quote. Before he went south, he and Herder had sought God in Spinoza, in the spiritual soul expression of the supersensory, in the external sense world. This mood which had urged him, along with Herder, to find his God in Spinoza's God, had remained. But he was not satisfied. The God he had sought in Spinoza's philosophy came alive in his soul as he stood before the artworks in which he believed he divined the Greek spatial art, and the feeling overcame him. Quote, there is necessity, there is God. Close quote. What did he sense? He evidently sensed how the creative impulse in the Greek arts of architecture and sculpture was what lived in the sole spiritual element of the human being, that which wants to emerge creatively into space, which gives itself over to space, and when it becomes a matter of painting, also spatially gives itself over to time. And Goethe's psychological experience was the polarity of what Novalis had experienced. Novalis experienced how, when the human being penetrates his innermost self in space and time and wants to remain poetical, musical, space and time melt in the human grasp. Goethe experienced how, when the human being works, chisels his spirit-soul aspect into space. This spirit-soul aspect does not melt what is spatial and temporal, but lovingly surrenders to the spatial and temporal, so that the spiritual soul aspect reappears, objectified, out of the spatial and temporal. How the human spirit and soul emerge without standing still at the sensory perception, without getting stuck in the eye, E-Y-E, so as to penetrate beneath the surface of things, and create the architecture and form the sculpture out of the forces that hold sway beneath the surface of things. This is what Goethe experienced in the moment that led him to remark, quote, There is necessity, there is God. Close quote. Therein lies everything that rests in the human unconscious out of divine spiritual existence that the human being conveys to the world without halting at the abyss that his senses create between him and the world. This is what the human being experiences artistically when he is able to push, chisel, force the spirit-soul aspects into the powers that lie beneath the surface of physical existence. What is it in Novalis 
that enables him psychologically to be musically, poetically creative? What is it in Goethe that drives him to perceive the greatest necessity of nature's creativity in the visual arts, to perceive the utterly unfree necessity of natural creation in the spatial, in the material artworks? What is it that drives him to say, quote, there is God, close quote, in spite of perceiving this necessity? At both poles, that of Novalis and that of Goethe, where one pole has the goal that must be adopted by the path that leads into the psychological understanding of poetry and music, and where the other pole has the goal that must be adopted by psychological understanding, if it wants to grasp the sculptural, architectural element, at both poles there is an experience, an experience that in the realm of art is undergone inwardly, and it is art's greatest real-life task to also carry the following experience externally into the world, the experience of human freedom. In ordinary spiritual, physical, sensory experience, the spiritual soul aspect penetrates formatively as far as the organism of the senses. Then it lets the external, physical, material reality shine into the senses. And in the senses, external, physical, material reality encounters inner, spiritual existence and undertakes that mysterious connection which in physiology and psychology causes so much concern. Then if someone is born into life with an archetypal, poetic, musical disposition, which is constituted in such a way that it wants to seek a dying into the spirit under the influence of musical tones, then this spiritual soul aspect does not penetrate to the abyss of the senses, but rather ensouls and spiritualizes the entire organism, forming it into a complete sense organ. Then it places the whole human being into the world in the way that otherwise only happens when a single eye, E-Y-E, or a single ear is placed into the world. The spirit soul halts in the inner human being. And then, if this soul element confronts the material world externally, it is not taken up as prosaic reality of space and time, then space and time melt in human perception. This is the one pole. There, the soul lives in freedom without touching the ground of physical prosaic existence. Admittedly, it is a freedom that cannot penetrate down into this prosaic reality. And at the other pole lives the soul, the spiritual part of the human being, as it lived in Goethe. This soul and spirit aspect is indeed so strong that it does not only penetrate into the bodily, physical part of the human being, to the point of the abyss of the senses, but penetrates these senses and even stretches beyond them. In Ovalis, I might say, there is a soul spirituality of such delicacy that it does not penetrate the entire sensory organization. In Goethe, the soul spirituality is so strong that it breaks into the entire sensory organization and extends beyond the boundaries of the human skin to insert itself out into the cosmos, and it therefore has, above all, a longing for an understanding of those realms of art which bear the element of space and time into the spirit-soul realm. That is why this spirituality is organized in such a way that it wants to descend beyond the boundaries of the human skin, into the ensouled space of sculpture, into the spiritualized spatial force of architecture, into the meaning of those forces which have already internalized themselves as forces of space and time, but which in this form can be grasped externally in painting. So here, too, it is a freeing from necessity, a freeing of what the human being is when his spirit and soul halt at the abyss of the sphere of the senses. Freedom in the poetic musical is freedom that lives in such a way that it does not touch the ground of the senses. The experience of freedom in sculpture, in architecture, in painting, is freedom, but through such strength that if it were to express itself in ways other than artistic, it would shatter the external physical sensory existence, because it would descend beyond its surface. 
That is what we perceive if, with proper understanding, we enter into what Goethe so urgently said about social ideas, for example, entitled Wilhelm Meister's Journeyman Years. Whatever we cannot entrust to outer reality, if it is to be shaped in freedom, becomes musical poetic. Whatever may not be developed through observation, up to the reality of the sensory physical idea, if it is not to disturb external reality, whatever must be left in the form it has been given by the forces of space and time, whatever has to be left in the mere reproduction of a block of wood because it would otherwise disturb what is organic, for which it signifies death, this becomes sculpture, becomes architecture. No one can understand the psychology of the arts who does not understand how more of the soul must live in the sculptor, in the architect, than lives in normal life. No one can understand the poetic musical without penetrating this more that lives in the spirit soul of a person who cannot allow this spiritual more, this spiritual overpowering of the physical organization, to arrive at the point of physical sensory, but instead must hold it back in freedom. Liberation, that is the experience present when art is truly grasped the experience of freedom and its polar opposites. Within the human being lies his form. This form is suffused in human reality with what turns into his movement. In the human form, will penetrates from within, perception from without. And the human form is, first of all, the external expression for this interpenetration. The human being lives bounded, if his will, his inwardly developed will, which wants to turn into movement, has to halt at the sphere in which perception is taken up. And as soon as the human being can become aware of himself in his entirety, the feeling will become alive in him. More lives in you than you, with your nerve sense organization in interaction with the world, can bring to life within you. Then there arises the necessity of leading this resting human form, which is the expression of this normal relationship, into the type of movements that bear the form of the human figure out into space and time. If we attempt to hold this fast artistically, then between the musical poetic and the sculptural architectural painterly, eurythmy arises. I believe that in a certain way we would have to come to a halt in the arts, if we were to attempt, in what yet remains a stammer, to speak about the arts and about what is artistic. I believe that not only are there more external things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in philosophy, as it is usually practiced, but that in the inner human being lies what brings about the liberation, at first within the artistic element, in the direction of the two poles, by entering into relationships with the physical bodily. And I believe that we cannot understand art psychologically by seeking to grasp it with the normal soul nature, but that we can grasp it only in the higher spiritual soul nature of the human being, which extends beyond the normal soul nature and is inclined toward suprasensory worlds. And if we look at two such eminent artistic natures as Novalis and Goethe, then the secrets of the psychology of the arts are revealed to us phenomenologically as I do believe they are, from out of reality. Schiller once experienced this with special depth when in reference to Goethe he said, Only through the dawn of beauty do you press on into the land of knowledge. In other words, only through living artistically into the full human soul do you struggle upward into the regions of the sphere toward which knowledge strives. There is a beautiful phrase, I believe it is an artist's phrase, quote, create artist, do not speak, close quote. And yet it is a phrase against which we must sin, because the human being is, after all, a speaking being. But as true as it is that we must sin when using such a phrase, quote, create artist, do not speak, close quote, so it is equally true, I believe, that we always have to atone for such a sin, that we must always try when talking about the arts to create in speaking. Create, artist, do not speak. 
And if, as a human being, you are required to speak about the arts, then try to speak creatively, to create in your speaking. The end of the last lecture, 12.8, and that is the end of the book, Art and Theory of Art, Foundations of a New Aesthetics, by Rudolf Steiner, which contains an artist summary from 1888, four essays written between 1890 and 1898, and eight lectures held between 1909 and 1921, Translated by Dorrit Winter and Clifford Venno. Collected Works, Volume 271.